chapter one of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter one crossing the channel what do you do for mines i put the question to the dear old salt at folkestone quay as i am waiting to go on board the boat for belgium this burning august night the dear old salt thinks hard for an answer very hard indeed then he scratches his head there ain't none he makes reply all the same in spite of the dear old salt i feel rather creepy as the boat starts off that hot summer night and through the pitch-black darkness we begin to plough our way to ostend over the dark waters the old english battleships send their vivid flashes unceasingly but it is not a comfortable feeling to think you may be blown up at any minute and i spend the hours on deck i notice our little fair-bearded belgian captain is looking very sad and dejected they're saying in belgium now that our poor soldiers are getting all the brunt of it he says despondently to a group of sympathetic war correspondents gathered round him on the deck chattering and trying to pick up bits of news but that will all be made up says mr martin donahue the australian war correspondent who is among the crowd all that you lose will be given back to belgium before long but they cannot give us back our dead the little captain answers dully and no one makes reply to that there is no reply to make it is four o'clock in the morning instead of nine at night when we get to ostend at last and the first red gleams of sunrise are already flashing in the east we leave the boat cross the customs and after much ringing wake up the belgian page-boy at the hotel in we troop two english nurses twenty war correspondents and an australian girl in belgium rooms are distributed to us great white lofty rooms with private bathrooms attached very magnificent indeed then for a few hours we sleep to be awakened by a gorgeous morning golden and glittering that shows the sea a lovely blue but a very sad deserted town poor ostend once she had been the very gayest of birds but now her feathers are stripped she is bare and shivery her big white beautiful hotels have dark blinds over all their windows her long line of blank closed fronts of houses and hotels seems to go on for miles just here and there one is open but for the most everything is dead and indeed it is almost impossible to recognize in this haunted place the most brilliant seaside city in europe it is only half-past seven but all ostend seems up and about as i enter the big salon and order coffee and rolls suddenly a noise is heard shouts wheels something indescribable everyone jumps up and runs down the long white restaurant out on the station we run and just then a motor dashes past us coming right inside under the station roof it is full of men and one is wounded my blood turns suddenly cold i have never seen a wounded soldier before i remember quite well i said to myself then it is true i had never really believed before now they are lifting him out oh so tenderly these four other big burly belgians and they have laid him on a stretcher he lies there on his back his face is quite red he has a bald head he doesn't look a bit like my idea of a wounded soldier and his expression remains unchanged it is still the quiet stolid patient belgian look that one sees in scores and hundreds all around and now they are carrying him tenderly on to the red cross ship drawn up at the station pier and after a while we all go back and try and finish our coffee barely have we sat down again before more shouts are heard immediately everybody is up and out onto the station and another motor-car full of soldiers comes dashing in under the great glass roofs excitement rises to fever heat now out of the car is dragged a german and one can never forget one's first german never shall i forget that wounded uhlan one of his hands is shot off his face is black with smoke and dirt and powder across his cheek is a dark heavy mark where a belgian had struck him for trying to throttle one of his captors in the car he is a wretch a brute he has been caught with a red cross on one arm and a revolver in one pocket 
but there is yet something cruelly magnificent about the fellow as he puts on that tremendous swagger and marches down the long platform between two lines of foes to meet his fate as he passes very close to me i look right into his face and it is imprinted on my memory for all time he is a big typical uhlan with round close-cropped head blue eyes arrogant lips large ears big and heavy of build but what impresses me is that he is no coward he knows his destiny he will be shot for a certainty shot for wearing the red cross while carrying weapons but he really is a splendid devil as he goes strutting down the long platform between the gendarmes all alone among his enemies alone in the last moments of his life then a door opens he passes in the door shuts he will be seen no more all is panic now we know the truth the germans have made a sudden sortie and are attacking just at the edge of ostend the gendarmes are fighting them and are keeping them back then a boy scout rushes in on a motorcycle and asks for the red cross to be sent out at once and then and there it musters in the dining-room of the hotel and rushes off in motor-cars to the scene of action then another car dashes in with another uhlan who has been shot in the back and now i watch the belgians lifting their enemy out all look of fight goes out of their faces as they raise him just as gently just as tenderly as they have raised their own wounded man a few moments ago and carry him onto their red cross ship just as carefully and pitifully quick quick a war correspondent hastens up there's not a minute to lose the kaiser has given orders that all english war correspondents will be shot on sight the germans will be here any minute they will cut the telegraph wires stop the boats and shoot everyone connected with the newspaper the prospect finally drives us with a panic-stricken crowd on to the boat and so exactly six hours after we landed we rush back again to england among the crowd are italians belgians british and a couple of americans an old franciscan priest sits down and philosophically tucks into a hearty lunch belgian priests crouch about in attitudes of great depression poor priests they know how the germans treat priests in this well-named holy war end of chapter one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two on the way to antwerp a couple of days afterward however feeling thoroughly ashamed of having fled and knowing that ostend was now reinforced by english marines i gathered my courage together once more and returned to belgium this time so that i should not run away again so easily i took with me a suitcase and a couple of trunks these trunks contained clothes enough to last a summer and a winter the manuscript of a novel our marriage which had appeared serially and all my chiffons in fact i took everything i had in my wardrobe i thought it was the simplest thing to do so it was but it afterwards proved an equally simple way of losing all i had getting back to ostend i left my luggage at the maritime hotel and hurried to the railway station i had determined to go to antwerp for the day and see if it would be possible to make my headquarters in that town pas de trance said the ticket official but why c'est la guerre comment c'est la guerre madame that was the answer one received to all one's queries in those days if you asked why the post had not come or why the boat did not sail for england or why your coffee was cold or why your boots were not cleaned or why your window was shut or why the canary didn't sing you would always be sure to be told c'est la guerre next morning however the train condescended to start and three hours after its proper time we steamed away from ostend slowly painfully through the hot summer day our long brown train went creeping toward Anvers envers the very name had grown into an emblem of hope in those sad days when the belgians were fleeing for their lives towards the safety of their great fortified city on the scheldt oh to see them at every station crushing in in they crowd and in they crowd herding like dumb driven cattle and always the poor white-faced women with their wide innocent eyes 
had babies in their arms and little fair-haired flemish children hanging to their skirts wherever we stopped we found the platforms lined ten deep and by the wildness with which these fugitives fought their way into the crowded carriages one guessed at the pent-up terror in those poor hearts they must they must get into that train you could see it was a matter of life and death with them and soon every compartment was packed and on we went through the stifling blinding august day onwards towards antwerp but when a soldier came along how eager every one was to find a place for him not one of us but would gladly give up our seat to any soldat we would lean from the windows and shout out loudly almost imploringly here soldat here and when two wounded men from malines appeared we performed absolute miracles of compression in that long brown train we squeezed ourselves to nothing we stood in back rows on the seats while front rows sat on our toes and the passage between the seats was packed so closely that one could scarcely insert a pin and still we squeezed ourselves and still fresh passengers came clamouring in and so wonderful was the spirit of good will abroad in these desperate days in belgium that we kept on making room for them even when there was absolutely no more room to make then a soldier began talking and how we listened never did priest or orator get such a hearing as that little blue-coated belgian white with dust clotted with blood and mud his yellow beard weeks old on his young face with his poor feet in their broken boots the original blue and red of his coat blackened with smoke and hardened with earth where he had slept among the beetroots and potatoes at malines he told us in a faint voice i often saw king albert when i was fighting near malines yes he was there our king he was fighting too i saw him many times i was quite near him ah he has a bravery and magnificence about him i saw a shell exploding just a bare yard from where he was over and over again i saw his face always calm and resolute i hope all is well with him he ended falteringly but in battle one knows nothing yes yes all is well answered a dozen voices king albert is back at antwerp and safe with the queen a look of radiant happiness flashed over the poor fellow's face as he heard that then he made us all laugh he said for two days i slept out in the fields at first among the potatoes and the beetroots and then i came to the asparagus he drew himself up a bit savez-vous the asparagus of malines it is the best asparagus in the world c'est ça and i slept on it on the malines asparagus about noon that day we had arrived close to ghent when suddenly the train came to a standstill and we were ordered to get out and told to wait on the platform two hours to wait the station-master told us the grey old city of ghent calm and massive among her monuments looked as though war were a hundred miles away the shops were all open business was being briskly done ladies were buying gloves and ribbons old wide-bearded gentlemen were smoking their big cigars here and there was a belgian officer the shops were full of english papers i went into the cathedral it was saturday morning but great crowds of people peasants bourgeoisie and aristocracy were there praying and telling their rosaries and as i entered a priest was finishing his sermon remember this my children remember this said the little priest only silence is great the rest is weakness it has often seemed to me since that those words hold the keynote to the belgian character sur la silence est grande la reste est faiblesse for never does one hear a belgian complain at last over the flat green country came a glimpse of antwerp a great city lying stretched out on the flat lands that border the river scheldt from the train windows one saw a bewildering mass of taxicabs all gathered together in the middle of the green fields at the city's outskirts for all the taxicabs had been commandeered by the government and near them was a field covered with monoplanes and biplanes a magnificent array of aircraft of every kind with the sunlight glittering over them like silver they were all ready there to chase the zeppelin when it came over from cologne and in the airfield a ceaseless activity went on slowly and painfully our train crept into antwerp station the pomp and spaciousness of this building with its immense dome-like roof was very striking it was the second largest station in the world and in those days it had need to be large for the crowds that poured out of the trains were appalling 
all the world seemed to be rushing into the fortified town soldiers were everywhere and for the first time i saw men armed to the teeth with bayonets drawn looking stern and implacable and i soon found it was a very terrible affair to get inside the city i had to wait and wait in a dense crowd for quite an hour before i could get to the first line of sentinels then i showed my passport and papers while two belgian sentinels stood on each side of me their bayonets horribly near my head out in the flagged square i got a fiacre and started off for a drive my first impression of antwerp as i drove through it that golden day was something never never to be forgotten as long as i live i shall see that great city walled in all round with magnificent fortifications standing ready for the siege along the curbstones armed guards were stationed bayonets fixed while dense crowds seethed up and down continually in the golden sunlight thousands of banners were floating in the wind enormous banners of a size such as i had never seen before hanging out of these great white stately houses along the avenues lined with acacias there were banners fluttering out of the shops along the chaussee de malines banners floating from the beautiful cathedral banners banners everywhere hour after hour i drove and everywhere there were banners golden red and black floating on the breeze it seemed to me that black struck a curiously sombre note almost a note of warning and i confess that i did not quite like it and i even thought to myself that if i were a belgian i would raise heaven and earth to have the black taken out of my national flag alas one little dream that golden summer day of the tragic fate that lay in wait for antwerp in those days we all believed her utterly impregnable after a long drive i drove to the hotel terminus to get a cup of tea and arrange for my stay it gave me a feeling of surprise to walk into a beautiful palm-lined corridor and see people sitting about drinking cool drinks and eating ices there were high-spirited dauntless belgian officers in their picturesque uniforms french and english businessmen and a sprinkling of french and english war correspondents a tall charming grey-haired american lady with a red cross on her black chiffon sleeve was having tea with her husband a grey-moustached american army doctor these were major and mrs livingstone seaman a wealthy philanthropic american couple who were devoting their lives and their substance to helping red cross work suddenly a man came towards me you don't remember me he said you are from australia i met you fifteen years ago in sydney it was a strange meeting that of two australians who were destined later to face such terrific odds in that city on the scheldt my orders are mr frank fox told me as we chatted away to stick it out whatever happens i've got to see it through for the morning post and i'm going to see it through too i said oh no said mr fox you'll have to go as soon as trouble threatens shall i i thought but as he was a man and an australian i did not think it was worth while arguing the matter with him instead we talked of sydney and old friends across the seas the blue mountains and the bush and our poets and writers and painters and politicians friends of long ago forgetting for the moment that we were chatting as it were on the edge of a crater end of chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three germans on the line i was coming back with my luggage from ostend next day when the train which had been running along at a beautiful speed came to a standstill somewhere near bruges there was a long wait and at last it became evident that something was wrong a brilliant-looking belgian general accompanied by an equally brilliant belgian captain who had travelled up in the train with me from ostend informed me courteously that it was doubtful if the train would go on to-day what has happened i asked les aliments sont sur la ligne was the graphic answer with the belgian's courteous assistance i got down my suitcase and a large brown paper parcel for of course in those days no one thought anything of a brown paper parcel 
in fact it was quite the correct thing to be seen carrying one no matter who you were king queen general prince or war correspondent do you see that station over there le capitaine said well in a few hours time a train may start from there and run to antwerp but it will not arrive at the ordinary station it will go as far as the river and then we shall get on board a steamer and cross the river and shall arrive at antwerp from the quay picking up my suitcase he started off with the old general beside him carrying my parasols while i held my brown paper parcel firmly under one arm and grasped my handbag with the other hand i was just thinking to myself how nice it was to have a general and a capitaine looking after me when to my supreme disgust my brown paper parcel burst open and there fell out an evening shoe and such a shoe it was a brilliant blue and equally brilliant silver with a very high heel and a big silver buckle it was a shoe i loved and i hadn't felt like leaving it behind and now there it fell on the station witness to a woman's vanity however the belgian captain was quite equal to the occasion he picked it up and presented it to me with a bow and said in unexpected english your sabbath shoe it was good to have little incidents like that to brighten one's journey for a very long and tedious time elapsed before we arrived at antwerp that night the crowded suffocating train crawled along and stopped half an hour indiscriminately every now and then and we wondered if the germans were out there in the flat fields to either side of us when we arrived at the scheldt i trudged wearily on to the big river steamboat more dead than alive the general was still carrying my parasols and the capitaine still clung to my suitcase and at last we crossed the great blue scheldt and landed on the other side where a row of armed sentinels presented their bayonets at us and kept us a whole hour examining our passports before they would allow us to enter the city thanks to the kindly general i got a lift in a motor-car and was taken straight to the hotel terminus i had eaten nothing since the morning but the sleepy hotel night porter told me it was impossible to get anything at that hour everything was locked up c'est la guerre he said well he was right it was indeed the war and i didn't feel that i had any call to complain or make a fuss so i wearily took the lift up to my bedroom on the fourth floor and speedily fell asleep when i awoke it was three o'clock in the morning and a most terrific noise was going on it was pitch dark darker than any words can say up there in my bedroom for we were forbidden lights for fear of zeppelins all day long i had been travelling through belgium and all day long it seemed to me i had been turned out of one train into another because les allemands were on the line so when the noise awoke me i knew at once it was those germans that i had been running away from all day long between ostend and bruges and bruges and ghent and ghent and bohm and antwerp i lay quite still there come at last i thought this is the real thing vaguely i wondered what to do the roar of cannon was enormous and it seemed to be just outside my window and cracking and rapping through it i heard the quick incessant fire of musketry crack 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 a beautiful clean noise like millions of forest boughs sharply breaking in strong men's hands vaguely i listened and vaguely i tried to imagine how the germans could have got inside antwerp so quickly then vaguely i got out of bed in the pitch blackness so hot and stifling i stood there trying to think but my room seemed full of the roar of cannon and i experienced a queer sensation as though i was losing consciousness in the sea under the loud beat of the waves i mustn't turn up the light i said to myself or they will see where i am that's the one thing i mustn't do again i tried to think what to do and then suddenly i found myself listening with a subconsciousness of immense and utter content to the wild outcry of those cannons and muskets and i felt as if i must listen and listen and listen till i knew the sounds by heart as for fear there was none not any at all not a particle instead there was something curiously akin to rapture it seemed to me that the supreme satisfaction of having at last dropped clean away from all the make-believes of life seized upon me standing there in my nightgown in the pitch black airless room at antwerp a woman quite alone among strangers with danger knocking at the gate of her world make-believe make-believe 
all life up to this minute seemed nothing else but make-believe for only death seemed real and only death seemed glorious all this took me about two minutes to think and then i began to move about my room stupidly vaguely i seemed to bump up against the noise of the cannons at every step but i could not find the door and i could not find a wrapper my hands went out into the darkness grabbing reaching but all the while i was listening with that deep undisturbed content to the terrific fire that seemed to shake the earth and heaven to pieces all i could get hold of was the sheet and blankets i had arrived back at my bed again well i must turn away i must look elsewhere and then i quietly and unexpectedly put out my hand and turned up the light in a fit of desperate defiance of the german brutes outside in a flash i saw my suitcase it was locked i saw my powder puff i saw my bag then i put out the light and picked up my powder puff got to my bag and fumbled for the keys and opened my suitcase and dragged out a wrapper but no slippers came under my fingers and i wanted slippers in case of going out into the streets but by this time i had discovered that nothing matters at all and i quietly turned up the light again being by then a confirmed and age-old fatalist standing in front of the looking-glass i found myself slowly powdering my face then the sound of people rushing along the corridor reached me and i opened my door and went out c'est une bataille ce sont les allemands n'est-ce pas queried a poor old lady mais non madame shouts a dashing big aeronaut running by ce n'est pas une bataille c'est le zeppelin and so it was the zeppelin had come for the second time to antwerp and the cannons and musketry were the onslaughts upon the monster by the belgian soldiers mad with rage at the impudent visit and all ready with a hot reception for it down the stairs i fled snatched away now from those wonderful moments of reality alone with the noise of the cannons in the pitch blackness of that stifling bedroom down the great scarlet carpeted stairs until we all came to a full stop in the hotel lounge below one dim light shaded half into darkness revealed the silhouettes of tall motionless green palms and white wicker chairs and scarlet carpets and little tables and the strangest crowd in all the world the zeppelin was sailing overhead just then flinging the ghastliest of all ghastly deaths from her cages as she sped along her craven way across the skies but that crowd in the foyer of the great antwerp hotel remained absolutely silent absolutely calm there was a tiny boy from liege whose trembling pink feet peeped from the blankets in which he had been carried down there was a lovely heroic liege lady whose gaiety and sweetness and charming toilettes had been making sunshine in a shady place for us all in these dark days every one remembered afterwards how beautiful the little liege lady looked with her great black eyes still sparkling and long red-black hair falling over her shoulders and a black wrapper flung over her white nightgown and her husband a huge fair-haired belgian giant with exquisite manners and a little boy lisp a daring aviator never seen except in a remarkable pair of bright yellow bags of trousers his lisp was unaffected and his blue eyes bright and blue as spring flowers and his heart was iron strong and there was madame la patron wrapped in a good many things and an englishman with a brown moustache who must have had an automatic toilette as he is here fully dressed even to his scarf-pin hat boots and all and some war correspondents who always have the incontestable air of having arranged the war from beginning to end especially when they appear like this in their pyjamas and a crowd of belgian ladies and children and all the maids and garcons and the porters and the night porters and various strange old gentlemen in overcoats and bare legs and strange old ladies with their heads tied who will never be seen again not to be recognized and the cook from the lowest regions and the chasseur who runs messages there we all were waiting while the zeppelin sailed overhead and the terrific crash and boom and crack and deafening detonations grew fainter and fainter as the belgian soldiers fled along through the night in pursuit of the german dastard that was finally driven back to cologne having dashed many houses to bits then the little chasse who has run through the street door away down the road comes racing back breathless across the flagstone courtyard oh mais c'est chic 
le zepp he cries enthusiastically his young black eyes afire c'est tout à fait chic vous savez and if that's not truly belge i really don't know what is end of chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter four of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter four in the track of the huns when i look back on those days the most pathetic thing about it all seems to me the absolute security in which we imagined ourselves dwelling the king and queen were in their palace that tall simple flat-fronted grey house in the middle of the town often one saw the king seated in an open motor-car coming in and out of the town or striding quickly into the palace tall and fair his appearance always seemed to me to undergo an extraordinary change from the face as shown in photographs it was because in real life those beautiful wide blue eyes of his mirrors of truth and simple courage were covered with glasses and la petite reine equally beloved was very often to be seen too driving backwards and forwards to the hospitals the only visits she ever paid all theatres were closed all concerts all cinemas all the galleries were shut never a note of song or music was to be heard anywhere to open a piano at one's hotel would have been a crime and yet that immense crowd gathered together in antwerp for safety ambassadors ministers and their wives and families consuls echevins merchants stockbrokers peasants were anything but gloomy a peculiar tide of life flowed in and out through that vast city full of people it was life vibrant with expectation thrilling with hope and fear without a moment's loneliness they walked about the shady avenues they sat at their cafes they talked they sipped their coffee or their elixir d'anvers and then they went home to bed after seven the streets were empty the cafes shut the day's life ended never a doubt crossed our minds that the germans could possibly get through those endless fortifications surrounding antwerp on all sides getting about was incredibly difficult in fact without a car one could see nothing and there were no cards to be had the war office had taken them all over in despair i went to sir frederick greville the english ambassador and after certain formalities and inquiries sir frederick very kindly went himself to the war office saw count chabot on my behalf and arranged for my getting a car many a dewy morning while the sun was low in the east i have started out and driven along the road to ghent or to liege or to malines and looking from the car i observed those endless forests of wire and the mined waters whose bridges one drove over so slowly so softly in such fear and trembling and then set deep in the great fortified hillsides the mouths of innumerable cannon pointed at one and here and there great reflectors were placed against the dull earthworks to show when the enemy's aircraft appeared in the skies nothing seemed wanting to make those fortifications complete and successful it was heartbreaking to see the magnificent old chateau and the beautiful old houses being ruthlessly cut down raised to the earth to make clear ground in all directions for the defence work the stumps of the trees used to look to me like the ruins of some ancient city for even they represented the avenues of real streets and roads and the black empty places behind them were the homes that had been demolished in this overwhelming attempt to keep at least one city of belgium safe and secure from the marauding huns afterwards when it was all over when antwerp had fallen i passed through the fortifications for the last time on my way to holland and oh the sadness of it there were the wire entanglements untouched unaltered the great reflectors still mirrored the sunlight and the stars the demolition of the chateau and house had been all in vain on this side there had been little fighting they had got in on the other side every few minutes one's car would be held up by sentinels who rushed forward with poised bayonets demanding the password for the day that always seemed to me like a bit of medieval history 
arrête cried the sentinels on either side the road lifting their rifles as they spoke of course we came to a stop immediately then the chauffeur would lean far out and whisper in a hoarse low voice the password which varied with an incessant variety sometimes it would be ostend or termont or demain or general or bruxelles or belgique or whatever the war office chose to make it then the sentinel would nod good he would say and on we would go the motor-car lent me by the belgian war office was driven by an excitable old belgian who loved nothing better than to get into a dangerous spot his favourite saying when we got near shell-fire and one asked him if he were frightened was one can only die once and the louder the shells the quicker he drove towards them and i used to love the way his old eyes flashed and i loved too the keenly disappointed look that crept over his face when the sentinels refused to let him go any nearer the danger line and we had to creep ignominiously back to safety does not your master ever go towards the fighting i asked him non madame he answered sadly mon general he is the papa of the commissariat he does not go near the fighting he only looks after the eating we left antwerp one morning about nine o'clock and sped outwards through the fortifications being stopped every ten minutes as usual by the sentinels and asked to show our papers on we ran along the white tree-lined roads through exquisite green country the roads were crowded constantly with soldiers coming and going and in all the villages we found the headquarters of one or other division of the belgian army making life and bustle indescribable in the flagged old streets and around the steps of the quaint medieval town halls and cathedrals we had gone a long way when we were brought to a standstill at a little place called heist op den berg where the sentinels leaned into our car and had a long friendly chat with us you cannot go any further they said the germans are in the next town ahead they are only a few kilometres away what town is it i asked eierschot they replied that is on the way to louvain is it not i asked i have been trying for a long time to get to louvain you can never get to louvain madame the sentinels told me smilingly between here and louvain lies the bulk of the german army just then a chasseur mounted on a beautiful fiery little brown ardennes horse came galloping along shouting as he passed the germans have been turned out of eierschot we have driven them out la salle cochon he jumped off his horse gave the reins to a soldier and leapt into a train that was standing at the station a sudden inspiration flashed into my head without a word i jumped out of the motor-car ran through the station and got into that train just as it was moving off leaving my old belgian to look after the car next moment i found myself being carried along through unknown regions and as i looked from the windows i soon discovered that i had entered now into the very heart of german ruin and pillage and destructiveness pangs of horror attacked me at the sight of those blackened roofless houses standing lonely and deserted among green thriving fields i saw one little farm after another reduced to a heap of blackened ashes with some lonely animals gazing terrifiedly into space sometimes just one wall would be standing of what was once a home sometimes only the front of the house had been blown out by shells and you could see right inside see the rooms spread out before you like a panorama see the children's toys and frocks lying about and the pots and pans even the remains of dinner still on the table and all the homely little things that made you feel so intensely the difference between this chill deathly desolation and the happy domestic life that had gone on in such peaceful streams before the huns set their faces belgium wards mile after mile the train passed through these ravaged areas and i stood at the window with misty eyes and quickened breath looking up and down the lonely roads and over the deserted fields where never a soul was to be seen and in my mind's eye i could follow those peasants fleeing fleeing ever fleeing from one village to another from one town to another hunted and followed by the cruel menace of war which they poor innocent ones had done so little to deserve the only comfort was to think of them getting safely across to england and as i looked at those little black and ruined homes i could follow the refugees in their flight and see them streaming out of the trains at victoria and charing cross 
and being taken to warm comfortable homes and clothed and fed by gentle-voiced english people and then waking perhaps in the depths of the night to find themselves in a strange land how their thoughts would fly with what awful yearning back to those little blackened homes back to the memories of the cow and the horse and the faithful dogs and the corn in the meadows and the purple cabbages uncut and the apples ungarnered yes i could see it all and my heart ached as it had never ached before when i roused myself from these sad thoughts i looked about me and discovered that i was in a train full of nothing but soldiers and priests i sat very still in my corner i asked no questions and spoke to no one i knew by instinct that this train was going to take me to a place that i never should have arrived at otherwise and i was right the train took me to Ayrshot, and i may say now that only one other war correspondent arrived there alighting at the station at Ayrshot, i looked about me scarcely believing that what i saw was real the railway station appeared to have fallen victim to an earthquake end of chapter four recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five of a woman's experience in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five Ayrshot. i think until that day i had always cherished a lurking hope that the huns were not as bad as they were painted i had been used to think of the german race as tinged with a certain golden glamour because to it belonged the man who wrote the fifth symphony the man who wrote the divine first part of faust and still more that other whose mocking but sublime laughter would be a fitting accompaniment of the horrors at Ayrshot. but beethoven goethe heine not even out of respect for your undying genius can i hide the truth about the germans any longer what i have seen i must believe in the pouring rain wearing a belgian officer's greatcoat i trudged along through a city that might well have been pompeii or herculaneum it was a city that existed no longer it was absolutely the shell of a town the long streets were full of hollow blackened skeletons of what had once been houses street upon street of them and street upon street the brain reeled before the spectacle and each of those houses once a home a place of thought of rest of happiness of work of love all the inhabitants have fled leaving their lares and penates just as the people of pompeii and herculaneum sought to flee when the lava came down on them here a wall stands there a pillar and a few bricks but between the ruins strange touching unbelievable gleaming from the background are the scarlet and white of dahlias and roses in the gardens behind that have somehow miraculously escaped the ruin that has fallen on the solid walls and ceilings and floors so carefully constructed by the brain of man and so easily ruined by man's brutality it is as though the flowers had some miraculous power of self-preservation some secret unknown to bricks and mortar some strange magic that keeps the sweet blossoms laughing and defiant under the hun's shell-fire and the red and the pure white of them and the green intensify with a tremendous potency the black horrors of the town in every street i observed always the same thing hundreds of empty bottles toujours les bouteilles one of my companions kept saying a brilliant young brussels lawyer who was now in this regiment the other officer was also from brussels and i was told afterwards that these two had formerly been the nuts of brussels the two smartest young men of the town to see them that day gave little idea of their smartness they both were black with grime and smoke with beards that had no right to be there creeping over their faces boots caked with mud to the knees and a general air of having seen activities at very close quarters they took me to the church and there the little old brown-faced sacristan joined us punctuating our way with groans and sobs of horror this is what i see before me stretches a great dim interior lit with little bunches of yellow candles it is in a way a church but what has happened to it what horror has seized upon it 
turning it into the most hideous travesty of a church that the world has ever known on the high altar stand empty champagne bottles empty rum bottles a broken bottle of bordeaux and five bottles of beer in the confessional stand empty champagne bottles empty brandy bottles empty beer bottles in the holy water fonts are empty brandy bottles stacks of bottles are under the pews or on the seats themselves beer brandy rum champagne bordeaux burgundy and again beer brandy rum champagne bordeaux burgundy everywhere everywhere in whatever part of the church one looks there are bottles hundreds of them thousands of them perhaps everywhere bottles 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 the sacred marble floors are covered everywhere with piles of straw and bottles and heaps of refuse and filth and horse dung mais madame cries the burning trembling voice of the distracted sacristan look at this and he leads me to the white marble bas-relief of the madonna the madonna's head has been cut right off then even as i stand there trying to believe that i am really looking at such nightmares i feel the little sacristan's fingers trembling on my arm turning me towards a sight that makes me cold with horror they have set fire to the christ to the beautiful wood carving of our saviour and burnt the sacred figure all up one side and on the face and breast and as they finish the work i can imagine them with a hiccup slitting up the priceless brocade on the altar with a bayonet then turning and slashing at the great old oil paintings on the cathedral walls chopping them right out of their frames but leaving the empty frames there with a german sense of humour that will presently make germany laugh on the wrong side of its face a dead pig lies in the little chapel to the right a dead white pig with a pink snout very still and pathetic is that dead pig and yet it seems to speak it seems to realize the sacrilege of its presence here in god's house it seems to say let not the name of pig be given to the germans we pigs have done nothing to deserve it and here madame voyez-vous here the floor is chipped and smashed where they stabled their horses these barbarians says the young lieutenant on my left and now we come to the gate of shame it is the door of a small praying room still pinned outside on the door is a piece of white paper with this message in german this room is private keep away and inside inside are women's garments a pile of them tossed hastily on the floor torn perhaps from the wearers a pile of women's garments in silence we stand there in silence we go out it is a long time before any one can speak again though the little sacristan keeps on moaning to himself as we step out of the horrors of that church some german prisoners that have just been brought in are being marched by and then rage overcomes one of the young lieutenants white trembling beside himself he rushes forward he shouts he raves he is thinking of that room they were of belgium those girls and women he is of belgium too and he flings his scorn and hatred at the uhlans marching past he lashes and whips them with his agony of rage until the cowering prisoners are out of hearing the other lieutenant at last succeeds in silencing him what is the use mon ami he says what is the use perhaps his outburst is reported to headquarters by somebody for that night at the officers mess the captain of the regiment has a few words to say against showing anger towards prisoners and very gently and tactfully he says them he is a belgian and all belgians are careful to a point that is almost beyond human comprehension in their criticisms of their enemies let us be careful never to demean ourselves by humiliating prisoners says the captain looking round the long roughly set table you see my friend these poor german fellows that we take are not all typical of the crimes that the germans commit lots of them are only peasants or men that would prefer to stay by their own fireside what about Eyershot and the church cry a score of irritated young voices the captain draws his kindly lips together and attacks his black bread and tinned mackerel ah he says we must remember they were all drunk and as he utters these words there flash across my mind those old old words that will never die forgive them for they know not what they do end of chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine
chapters six and seven of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six the swift retribution as i stood in the rain down there in the ruined blackened piazza of Ayershot, someone drew my attention to the hole in the back window of the burgomaster's house in cold blood the germans had shot the burgomaster and they had shot two of his children and as they could not find the burgomaster's wife who had fled into the country they had offered four thousand francs reward for her a hoarse voice whispered that in that room with the broken window the german colonel who had ordered the murder of the good kind beloved burgomaster had met his own fate yes in the room of the dead burgomaster's maidservant the german colonel had fallen dead from a shot fired from without by whose hand was it fired that shot that laid the monster at his victim's feet by the hand of an inferior someone whispers and i put together the story and understand that the girl's village sweetheart avenged her they are both dead now the girl and her village swain shot down instantly by the howling germans but their memory will never die for they stand that martyred boy and girl for belgium's fight for its women's honour and the manliness of its men chapter seven they would not kill the cook besides myself i discover only one woman in the whole of Ayershot, a little fair-haired fleming with a lion's heart she is the bravest woman in the world i love the delightful way she drops her wee six weeks old baby into my arms and goes off to serve a hundred hungry belgians with black bread and coffee confident that her little treasure will be quite safe in the lap of the anglaise smiling and running about between the kitchen the officers mess and the bar this brave good soul finds time to tell us how she remained all alone in Ayershot for three whole weeks all the while the germans were in possession of the town i knew that cooking they must have she says and food and drink and for that i knew i was safe so i remained here and kept the hotel of my little husband from being burned to the ground but i slept always with my baby in my arms and the revolver beside the pillow in the night sometimes i heard them knocking at my door yes they would knock 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 and i would lie there the revolver ready if needs be for myself and the petite both but they never forced that door they would go away as stealthily as they had come ah they knew that if they had got in they would have found a dead woman not a live one and i quite believed her end of chapter seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 8. You'll Never Get There. As the weeks went on, a strange thing happened to me. At first vaguely, faintly, and then with an ever-deepening intensity, there sprang to life within me a sense of irritation at having to depend on newspapers or hearsay for one's knowledge of the chief item in this war, the enemy an overwhelming desire seized upon me to discover for myself what a certain darksome unknown quantity was like that darksome unknown quantity that we were always hearing about but never saw that we were always moving away from if we heard it was anywhere near that was making all the difference to everything that was at the back of everything that mattered so tremendously and yet could never be visualized the habit of a lifetime of groping for realities began to assert itself and i found myself chafing at not being able to find things out for myself in the descriptions i gleaned from men and newspapers i was gradually discovering many puzzling incongruities there are thinkers whose conclusions one honours and attends to but these thinkers were not out here looking at the war with their own eyes Maeterlinck, for instance whose deductions would have been invaluable was in france tolstoy was dead mr wells was in england writing to believe what people tell you you must first believe in the people if you can find one person to believe in in a lifetime and that one person is yourself 
you are lucky one day towards the end of september i heard an old professor from liege university talking to a young bruxellois with a black moustache and piercing black eyes who had arrived that day at our hotel so you are going back at once to brussels monsieur said the old professor in a shaky voice yes monsieur why don't you come with me i have not the courage courage but there is nothing to fear you come along with me and i'll see you through all right i assure you the trains run right into brussels now the germans leave us bruxellois alone they are trying to win our favour they never interfere with us there is not the slightest danger and there is not half so much trouble and difficulty to get in and out of brussels as there is to get in and out antwerp you get into a train at ghent go to grammont and there change into a little train that takes you straight to brussels they never ask us for our passports now for myself i have come backwards and forwards from brussels half a dozen times this last fortnight on special missions for our government i have never been stopped once if you'll trust yourself to me i'll see you safely through i desire to go very much muttered the old man there are things in liege that i must attend to but to get to liege i must go through brussels it seems to me there is a great risk a very great risk no risk at all said the young bruxellois cheerfully that evening at dinner the young man aforesaid was introduced to me by mr frank fox of the morning post who knew him well it was not long before i said to him do you think it would be possible for an englishwoman to get into brussels i should like very much to go i want to get an interview with monsieur max from my newspaper he was an extremely optimistic and cheerful young man he said quite easy i know monsieur max very well if you come with me i'll see you safely through and take you to see him as a matter of fact i've got a little party travelling with me on friday and i shall be delighted if you will join us i'll come i said extraordinary how easy it is to make up one's mind about big things that decision which was the most important one i ever made in my life gave me less trouble than i have sometimes been caused by such trifles as how to do one's hair or what frock to wear next day i told everyone i was going to try to get into brussels you'll be taken prisoner you're mad you'll be shot you will be taken for a spy you will never get there all these things and hosts of others were said but perhaps the most potent of all the arguments was that put up by the sweet little lady from liege the black-eyed mother with two adorable little boys and a delightful big husband the gallant chevalier in yellow bags of trousers whom i have already referred to in an earlier chapter this little liegeoise and i were now great friends i shall speak of her as alice she had a gaiety and insouciance and a natural childlike merriment that all her terrible disasters could not overcloud what laughs we used to have together she and i what talks what walks and sometimes the big husband would give alice a delightful little dinner at the criterium restaurant in the avenue de kaiser where we ate such delicious things it was impossible to believe oneself in a belgian city with war going on at the gates when i told alice that i was going to brussels she set to work with all her womanly powers of persuasion to make me give up my project there was nothing she did not urge the worst of all was that we might never see each other again but i don't feel like that i told her i feel that i must go it's a funny feeling i can't describe it because it isn't exactly real i don't feel exactly that i must go even when i am telling you that it isn't exactly true i am afraid this is too complicated for me said alice gravely i admit it sounds complicated i suppose what it really means is that i want to go and i am going but my husband says we may be in brussels ourselves in three weeks time why not wait and come in in safety with the belgian army other people gathered round us there in the dimly lit palm court of the big antwerp hotel and a lively discussion went on a big dark man with a melancholy face said wistfully i wish i could make up my mind to go too this was cherry curtain the famous naturalist and photographer he was out at the front looking for pictures and in his mind's eye doubtless he saw the pictures he would get in brussels pictures sneakingly and stealthily taken from windows at the risk of one's life glorious pictures pictures a photographer would naturally see in his mind's eye when he thought of getting into brussels during the german occupation 
mr curtin's interpreter a little fair-haired man however put in a couple of sharp words that were intended to act as an antidote to the great photographer's uncertain longings you'll be shot for a dead certainty cherry he said you get into brussels with your photographic apparatus why you might as well walk straight out to the germans and ask them to finish you off cherry had his old enemy malaria hanging about him at that time or i quite believe he would have risked it and come but as events turned out it was lucky for him he didn't for his king and his country have called him since then in a voice he could not resist and he has gone to his beloved africa again in colonel driscoll's league of frontiersmen when i met him out there in antwerp he had just returned from his famous journey across central africa his thoughts were all of lions giraffes monkeys rhinoceros he would talk on and on quite carried away he made noises like baboons boars lions monkeys he was great fun i was always listening to him and gradually i would forget the war forget i was in antwerp and be carried right away into the jungle watching a crowd of giraffes coming down to drink indeed the vividness of cherry's stories was such that when i think of antwerp now i hear the roar of lions the pad pad of wild beasts the guttural uncouthness of monkeys all the sounds in fact that so excellently represent antwerp's present occupiers but the faces of cherry's wild beasts were kinder humaner faces than the faces that haunt antwerp now End of chapter eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapters nine and ten of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter nine setting out on the great adventure it was on friday afternoon september twenty fourth that i ran down the stairs of the hotel terminus with a little brown bag in my hand without saying good-bye to anybody i hurried out and jumped into a cab at the door accompanied by the old professor from liege and the young brussels lawyer it was a gorgeous day about four o'clock in the afternoon with brilliant sunlight flooding the city and a feeling of intense elation came over me as our cab went rattling along over the old flagged streets overhead in the bright blue sky aeroplanes were scouting the wind blew sweet from the scheldt and the flat green lands beyond all the banners stirred and waved french english belgian and russian and i felt contented and glad i had started first we called for madame julie said the young lawyer we drove along the quay and stopped at a big white house to my surprise i found myself now suddenly precipitated into the midst of a huge belgian party mamma papa aunts uncles nephews nieces friends officers little girls little boys servants gathered in a great high ceiled and bewindowed drawing-room crowded to the full i was introduced to everybody and a lot of handshaking went on i thought to myself this is a new way to get to brussels servants were going round with trays laden with glasses of foaming champagne and little sweet biscuits we shall drink to the health of julie said some one and we drank to julie the sun poured in through the windows and the genial affectionate belgian family all gathered closer round the beloved daughter who was going bravely back to-day to brussels to join her husband there at his post it was a touching scene but as i think of it now it becomes poignant with the tragedy hidden beneath the glittering sunlight and foaming champagne that fine old man with the dignified grey head and beard was a distinguished belgian minister who has since met with a sad death he was julie's father a father any woman might have been proud of he said to me je suis content that a lady is going too in this little company it is hard for my daughter to be travelling about alone yet she is brave she does not lack courage she came alone all the way from brussels three days ago in order to bring her little girl to antwerp and leave her in our care and now she feels it is her duty to go back to her husband in brussels though we of course long to have her remain with us then at last the parting came and tall brown-eyed buxom julie kissed and was kissed by everybody and everybody shook hands with me and wished me luck 
and i felt as if i was one with them although i had never seen them in my life before and never saw them in my life again we ran down the steps and now instead of getting into the old rickety fiacre we entered a handsome motor-car belonging to the belgian ministry and drove quickly to the quay the father came with us his daughter clinging to his arm at the quay we went on board the big river steamer and julie bade her father farewell she flung herself into his arms and he clasped her tight he held her in silence for a long minute then they parted they never met again as we moved away from the quay it seemed to me that our steamer was steering straight for the hesperides all the west was one great blazing field of red and gold and the sun was low on the broad water's edge while behind us the fair city of antwerp lit sparkling lights in all her windows and the old cathedral rose high into the sunlight with a belgian banner fluttering from a pinnacle and that is how i shall always see antwerp fair and stately and sun-wreathed as she was that golden september afternoon when i think of her i refuse to see her any other way i refuse to see her as she was when i came back to her or as when i left her again for the last time chapter x from ghent to Grammont. i don't know why we were all in such high spirits for we had nothing but discomfort to endure and yet out of that very discomfort itself some peculiar psychic force seemed to spring to life and thrive until we became as merry as crickets a more inherently melancholy type than the old liege professor could scarcely be imagined poor old soul he had lost his wife a week before the war and in the siege of liege one of his sons had fallen and he had lost his home and everything he held dear he was an enormous man dressed in deep black the most pronounced mourning you can possibly imagine with a great black pot hat coming well down on his huge face his big frame quivered like a jelly as he sat in the corner of the train and was shaken by the rough movements and the frequent stoppages yet he became cheerful just as cheerful as any of us strange as it seems in the telling this cheerfulness is a normal condition of the people nearest the front there is only one thing that kills it loss of freedom when loss of freedom means loss of companionship ruin danger cold hunger heat dirt discomfort wounds suffering death are all dashed with glory and become acceptable as part of the greatest adventure in the world but loss of freedom wrings the colour from the brain and shuts out this world and the next when it entails loss of comradeship when i first realized this strange phenomenon i thought it would take a volume of psychology to explain it and then all suddenly with no effort of thought i found the explanation revealing itself in one magic blessed word companionship out here in the danger zones the irksome isolation of ordinary lives has vanished we are no longer alone there are no such things as strangers we are all together wherever we are in the trenches on the roads in the trams in the cities in the villages we all talk to each other we all know each other's histories we pour out our hopes and fears we receive the warm sweet stimulus of human comradeship multiplied out of all proportion to anything that life has ever offered any single one of us before till even pain and death take on more gentle semblance seen with the eyes of a million people all holding hands young men who have not gone go now find out for yourselves whether this wonderful thing that i tell you is not true that the battlefield apart from its terrific and glorious qualities holds also that secret of gaiety of heart that mankind is ever searching for we were at st nicola now and it was nearly dark and our train was at a standstill i shall get out and see what's the matter said the young lawyer whom i shall refer to hereafter as jean he came back in a minute looking serious the train doesn't go any further he said there's no train for ghent to-night we all got out clutching our bags and stood there on the platform in the reddened dusk that was fast passing into night a pontonnier who had been in the train with us came up and said he was expecting an automobile to meet him here and perhaps he could give some of us a lift as far as ghent however his automobile didn't turn up and that little plan fell through 
jean began to bite his moustache and walk up and down smiling intermittently a queer distracted-looking smile that showed his white teeth he always did that when he was thinking how to circumvent the authorities he had a word here with an officer and a word there with a gendarme then he came back to us we shall all go and interview the station-master and see what can be done so we went to the station-master and jean produced his papers and julie produced hers and the old professor from liege produced his and i produced my english passport jean talked a great deal and the station-master shook his head a great deal and there was an endless colloquy such as belgians dearly love and just as i thought everything was lost the station-master hastened off into the dark with a little lantern and told us to follow him right across the train lines and we came to a bewildering mass of lights and at last we reached a spot in the middle of many train lines which seemed extremely dangerous when the station-master said stand there and when train fifty seven comes along get immediately into the guard's van there is only one we waited a long time and the night grew cold and dark before fifty seven came along when it puffed itself into a possible position we all performed miracles in the way of climbing up with an enormous step and then we found ourselves in a little wooden van with one dim light burning and one wooden seat and in we got seating ourselves in a row on the hard seat and off we started through the night for ghent looking through a peephole i suddenly stifled an exclamation pointing straight at me were the muzzles of guns mais oui said jean that is what this train is doing it is taking guns to ghent there are big movements of troops going on we were shaken nearly to pieces and we went so slowly that we scarcely moved at all but we arrived at ghent at last arrived of course as usual in wartime at a station one had never seen or heard of before in a remote far-off portion of the town and then we had to find our way back to the town proper a long long walk it was twelve o'clock when we got into the beautiful old dreamlike town first we went to the hotel ganda full up said the fat white-faced porter rudely no room even on the floor to sleep can you give us something to eat we pleaded impossible the kitchens are shut up he was a brute of a porter an extraordinary man who never slept and was on duty all night and all day he was hand in glove with the germans all the time his face did not belie him he looked the ugliest stealthiest creature showing a covert rudeness towards all english-speaking people that many of us remember now and understand in the pitch darkness we set out again clattering about the flagged streets of ghent a determined little party now with our high spirits quite unchecked by hunger and fatigue to try to find some sleeping place for the night from hotel to hotel we wandered every one was full evidently a vast body of troops had arrived at ghent that day but finally at one o'clock we went last of all to the hotel we should have gone to first that was the hotel de la poste it being the chief hotel at ghent we had felt certain it would be impossible to get accommodation there but other people had evidently thought so too and the result was we all got a room from the outside the hotel appeared to be in pitch darkness but when we got within we found the lights burning and great companies of belgian cavalry officers gathered in the lounge and halls finishing their supper there are great movements of troops going on said jean this is the first time i have seen our army in ghent to my delight i recognized my two friends from ayershot the brussels nuts on hearing that i was going to brussels one of them begged me to go and see his father and sister if i got safely there and i gladly promised to do so after that about two o'clock in the morning it was then we crawled down some steps into the cellar where the most welcome supper i have ever eaten soon pulled us all round again cold fowl red wine delicious bread and butter then we went up to our rooms giving strict injunctions to be called at six o'clock and for four hours we slept the sleep of the thoroughly tired out next morning at half past six we were all down and had our cafe au lait in the restaurant and then started off cheerfully to the principal railway station so far so good all we had to do now was to get into a train and be carried straight into brussels why then did jean look so agitated when we went to the ticket office and asked for our tickets he turned to us with a shrug ah ces allemands 
one never knows what the cochons are going to do the station-master here says that the trains may not run into brussels to-day he won't book us further than grammont he believes the lines are cut from there on i was so absorbed in watching the enormous ever-increasing crowds on the ghent station that the seriousness of that statement passed me by i did not realize where grammont was and it did not occur to me to wonder by what means i was going to get from grammont to brussels i only urged that we should go on the old professor and madame julie argued as to whether it would not be better to abandon their plans and return to antwerp that seemed to me a tedious idea so i did my best to push on jean agreed at any rate he said we will go as far as grammont and see what happens there perhaps by the time we get there we shall find everything all right again so at seven o'clock we steamed away from ghent out into the fresh bright countryside now we were in the region of danger we were outside the dernière ligne of the belgian army if one came this way one came at one's risk but as i looked from the train windows everything seemed so peaceful that i could scarcely imagine there was danger there were no ruins here there was no sign of war at all only little farms and villages bathed in the blue september sunlight with the peasants working in the fields as i tried to push my window higher someone who was leaning from the next window spoke to me in english and i met a pair of blue english-looking eyes may i fix that window for you i guess you're english aren't you ma'am i gave him one quick hard look it was the war look that raked the face with a lightning glance by now i had come to depend absolutely on the result of my glance yes i said and you are american he admitted that was so almost immediately we fell into talk about the war how long do you think it will last asked the american i don't know what do you think i give it six weeks i'll be over then and he assured me that was the general opinion of those he knew six weeks or less but what are you doing in this train he added interestedly going to brussels brussels he looked at me with amazed eyes pardon me did you say going to brussels yes pardon me but how are you going to get to brussels i am going there but you are english yes then you can't have a german passport to get into brussels if you are english no i haven't got one but don't you realize ma'am that to get into brussels you have got to go through the german lines we began to discuss the question he was an american who had friends in brussels and was going there on business his name was richards he was a kindly nice man he could speak neither french nor flemish and had a belgian with him to interpret what do you think i ought to do i asked go back he promptly said if the germans stop you they'll take you prisoner and even if you do get in he added you will never get out it is even harder to get out of brussels than it is to get in i'm going to chance it well if that's so the only thing i can suggest is that if you do manage to get into brussels safely you go to the american consulate and show them your papers and they may give you a paper that'll help you to get out but would the americans do that for a british subject sure we're a neutral country as a little american boy said i'm neutral i don't care which country whips the germans then another idea occurred to mr richards but you mustn't go into brussels with an english passport about you you'll have to hide that somehow i shall give it to monsieur jean to hide i said he's the conductor of the little belgian party there well let me see your passport then in case you have to part with it and you arrive in brussels without it i can satisfy our consul that i have seen it and that you are an english subject and that will make things easier for you at the american consulate i showed him my passport and he examined it carefully and promised to do what he could to help me in brussels then we arrived at grammont and there the worst happened the train lines were cut and we could go no further by rail to get to brussels we must drive by the roads all the way End of chapter 10 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapters 11 and 12 of A Woman's Experience in the Great War by Louise Mack This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 11 Brabant it was like a chapter out of quite another story to leave the train at grammont 
and find ourselves in the flagged old brabant square in front of the station that hot glittering end of summer morning while on the ear rose a deafening babble of voices from the hundreds of little belgian carts and carriages of all shapes and sizes and descriptions that stood there with their drivers leaning forward over their skinny horses yelling for fares the american hurried to me as i stood watching with deep interest this vivacious scene which reminded me of some old piazza in italy and quite took away the sharp edge of the adventure the sharp edge being the germans who now were not very far away judging by the dull roar of cannon that was here distinctly audible the american said ma'am i found this little trap that will take us to brussels for fourteen francs right into brussels and there is a seat for you in that trap if you'd care to come i'd be very pleased and happy to have you come along with me it is awfully good of you i said i knew he was running great risks in taking me with him and i deeply appreciated his kindness but jean remonstrated a little hurt at the suggestion madame you are of our party we must stick together i've just found a trap here that will take us all there are four other people already in it and that will make eight altogether the driver will take us to brussels for twelve francs each with an extra five francs if we get there safely so i waved good-bye to the little cart with the friendly american who waved back as he drove away into the sunlight shouting good luck good luck as i heard that deep-sounding english word come ringing across the flagged old brabant village it was though i realized its meaning for the first time good luck and my heart clutched at it and clung to it searching for strength as the heart of women and men too will do in wartime chapter twelve driving extraordinary the task of arranging that party in the wagonette was anything but easy the old liege professor in his sombre black sat on the back seat while in front sat an equally enormous old banker from brussels also in black and those two huge men seemed to stick up out of the carriage like vast black pillars they moved their seats afterwards but it did not make any difference wherever they sat they stuck up like huge black pillars calling attention to us in what seemed to me a distinctly undesirable way two horses we had for our long drive to brussels and uncommonly bony horses they were our carriage was a species of long drawn-out victoria it had an extra seat behind with its back to the horses a horrid tilting little seat as i soon discovered for it was there that i found myself sitting with jean beside me as we started off through the golden saturday morning jean and i had each to curl an arm round the back of the seat otherwise we should have been tipped out for a tremendously steep white hill road lined with poplars began to rise before us and we were in constant danger of falling forward on our noses but the only thing i cared about by then was to sit next to jean he seemed to be my only safeguard my only hope of getting through this risky adventure and in low voices we discussed what i should do if we did indeed meet the enemy a contingency which began to grow more and more probable every moment all sorts of schemes were discussed between us sitting there at the back of that jolting carriage but it was quite evident to both that though we might make up a plausible story as to why i was going to brussels although i might call myself an american or an italian or a spaniard seeing that i could speak those languages well enough to deceive the germans and seeing also that i had the letter to the spanish minister in my bag from the vice-consul at antwerp still neither i nor jean could do the one thing necessary we could not produce any papers of mine that would satisfy the germans if i fell into their hands but we're not going to meet them said jean he lit a cigarette you had better give me all your papers he added airily what will you do with them he smoked and thought if we meet the germans i'll throw them away somewhere but how on earth shall i ever get them again and suppose the germans see you throwing them away i did not like the phrase throw them away it seemed like taking from me the most precious thing in the world the one thing that i had firmly determined never to part with my passport but i now discovered that jean had a thoughtful mood upon him and did not want to talk he wanted to think he told me so he said it is necessary that i think out many little things now pardon and he tapped his brow so i left him to it along the white sun-bathed road as we drove 
we met a continual procession of carts wagons fiacres and vehicles of all shapes kinds and descriptions full of peasants or bourgeoisie all travelling in the direction of ghent every now and then a private motor-car would flash past us flying the red white and blue flag of holland or the stars and stripes of america they had an almost impudent insouciance with them those lucky neutral motor-cars as they rushed along the sunny brabant road to brussels joyously confident that there would be no trouble for them if they met the germans how i envied them how i longed to be able by some magic to prove myself american or dutch every ten minutes or so we used to shout to people on the road coming from the opposite direction il y a des allemands or il y a du danger and the answer would come back pas des allemands or oui les allemands sont là pointing to the right or les allemands sont là pointing to the left i would feel horribly uncomfortable then although apparently i was not frightened in the least there was one thing that undeceived me about myself i had lost the power to think as clearly as usual i found that my brain refused to consider what i should do if the worst came to the worst whenever i got to that point my thoughts jibbed vagueness seized upon me i only knew that i was in for it now that i was seated there in that old rickety carriage that i was well inside the german lines and that it was too late to turn back in a way it was a relief to feel incapable of dealing with the situation because it set my mind free to observe the exquisite beauty of the country we were travelling through and the golden sweetness of that never-to-be-forgotten september day up and up that long steep white hill our carriage climbed with rows of wonderful high poplars waving in the breeze on either side of us and gracious grey belgian chateaux showing their beautiful lines through vistas of flower-filled gardens and green undulating woods of such richness and fertility and calm happy opulence that the sound of the cannon growing ever louder across the valleys almost lost its meaning in such a fair enchanted country but the breeze blew round us a soft and gentle breeze laden with the scent of flowers and green things red pears of great size and mellowness hung on the orchard trees the purple cabbage that the brabant peasants cultivate made bright spots along the ground in the villages at the doors of the little white cottages i saw old wrinkled belgian women sitting little fair-haired blue-eyed children with peculiarly small sweet faces stood looking up and down the long roads with an expression that often brought the tears to my eyes as i realized the fears that those poor little baby hearts must be filled with in those desperate days and yet the prevailing note of the people we met along that road was still gaiety rather than sadness or terror il y a des allemands il y a du danger we went on perpetually with our questions and the answers would come back laughingly with shakings of the head no not met any germans or no they are fighting round nino we've been making detours all the morning to try and get out of their way and now the road was so steep that jean and i jumped down from our sloping seat at the back and walked up the hill to save the bony horses every now and then we would pause to look back at that wide dream-like view which grew more and more magnificent the higher we ascended until at last fair brabant lay stretched out behind us bathed in a glittering sunlight that had in it that day some exquisitely poignant quality as though it were more golden than gold just because across that great plain to the left the fierce detonations of heavy artillery told of the terrific struggles that were going on there for life and death presently we met a couple of black-robed belgian priests walking down the hill and mopping their pale faces under their black felt hats the germans are all over the place to-day they told us and yesterday they arrested a train full of people between Angers and hall they suspected them of carrying letters into brussels so they cut the train lines last night and marched the people off to be searched the young men may have been sent into germany to-day or so rumour says that may or may not be true but anyway it is quite true that the train-load of passengers was arrested wholesale and that every single one of them was searched and those who were found carrying letters were taken prisoners perhaps to be shot c'est ça said jean coolly we bade the priests good-bye and trudged on jean presently under his breath said 
i've got a hundred letters in my pockets i'm taking them from antwerp people into brussels i suppose i shall have to leave them somewhere he smiled his queer high up smile showing all his white teeth and i felt sure that he was planning something i felt certain he was not going to be balked at the top of the hill we got into our trap again and off we started travelling at a great rate we dashed along and vehicles dashed past us in the opposite direction and i had the feeling that i was going for a picnic so bright was the day so beautiful the surroundings so quick the movements along the road at Anjon, said jean turning round and addressing the other people in the carriage by now they had all made friends with each other and were chattering nineteen to the dozen at Anjon, we shall get lunch but there is nowhere that one finds lunch at Anjon, protested the fat brussels banker i promise you as good a lunch as ever you have eaten and good wine to wash it down was jean's reply at last we arrived at Anjon and found ourselves in a little brown straggling picturesque village on a hillside full of peasants who were gathered in a dense crowd in the grand place which was here the village common they had come in out of the fields these peasants stained with mud and all the discolorations of the soil their innocent faces spoke of the calm sweet things of nature but mixed with the innocence was a great wonder and bewilderment now all this time ever since we left ghent we had never seen a belgian militaire that of itself told its own story of how completely we were outside the last chance of belgian protection outside la dernière ligne end of chapter twelve recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapters thirteen through fifteen of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirteen the lunch at Angion. dear little Angion, i shall always remember you it was so utterly out of the ordinary to drive to the railway station and have one's lunch cooked by the station master a dear old man he was that old grey-bearded belgian a hero too his trains were stopped his lines were cut he was ever in the midst of the germans but he kept his bright spirits happy and when jean ushered us all into his little house that formed part of the railway station he received us as if we were old friends shook us all by the hand and told us with great gusto exactly what he would give us and he rolled the words out too almost as though he was an italian as he promised us a beautiful omelette followed by a nice beefsteak and fried potatoes and cheese and fruit and a beautiful coffee and then he hurried away into the kitchen and we heard him cracking the eggs while his old sister set the table in the little dining-room we travellers all sat on a seat out in front of the railway line under the sweet blue sky facing green fields and refreshing ourselves with little glasses of red tonic-like beer it was characteristic of those dear belgian souls that they one and all raised their little glasses before they drank and looking towards me said vive l'angleterre to which i responded with my tiny glass lève la belgique and we all added a baller kaiser and from across the fields the noise of the battle round ninove came towards us louder and louder every moment as we sat there we discussed the cannonading that now seemed very near so loud and so close to us were the angry growlings of the guns that i felt amazed at not being able to see any smoke it was evident that some big encounter was going on but the fields were green and still and nothing at all was to be seen by now i had lost all sense of reality i was merely a figure in an extraordinary dream in which the great guns pounded on my right hand and the old station-master's omelette fried loudly on my left jean strolled off alone while two of the ladies of the party went away to buy some butter in brussels they said it was impossible to get good butter under exorbitant prices so they paid a visit to a little farm a few steps away and came back presently laden with butter enough to keep them going for several weeks for which they had paid only one franc each and now the old station-master comes out and summons us all in to lunch he wishes us bon appetit and we seat ourselves round the table under the portraits of king albert and la petite reine in his little sitting-room 
a merrier lunch than that was never eaten the vast omelette melted away in a twinkling before the terrific onslaught made upon it chiefly by the liege professor and the brussels banker who by now had got up their appetites the red cross lady who took it upon herself to help out the food kept up a cheerful little commentary of running compliments which included us all and the beefsteak and the omelette and the potatoes and the station-master until we could hardly tell one from the other so agreeable did we all seem the old station-master produced some good burgundy sun-kissed purply red of a most respectable age when everything was on the table he brought his chair and joined in with us asking questions about antwerp and ghent and ostend and giving us in return vivid sketches of what the germans had been doing in his part of the world the extraordinary part of all this was that though we were in a region inhabited by the germans there was no sign of destruction the absence of ruin and pillage seems to conceal the fact that this was invested country after our bon cafe we all shook hands with the station-master wished him good luck and hurried back to the village where we climbed into our vehicle again this time i took a place in the inside of the carriage leaving jean and another man to hang on to that perilous back seat at two o'clock we were off the horses freshened by food and water galloped along now at a great pace and the day developed into an afternoon as cloudless and glittering as the morning but almost immediately after leaving Angeon, an ominous note began to be struck whenever we shouted out our query il y a des allemands the passers-by coming from the opposite direction shouted back oui oui beaucoup d'allemands and suddenly there they were chapter fourteen we meet the grey coats my first sight of the german army was just one man he was a motorcyclist dressed in grey with his weapons slung across his back and he flashed past us like lightning every one in the carriage uttered a deep oh it seemed to me an incredible thing that one german should be all alone like that among enemies i said so to my companions the others are coming they said with an air of certainty that turned me cold all over but it was at least two miles further on before we met the rest of his corps then we discovered fifty german motorcyclists in grey uniforms and flat caps flying smoothly along the side path in one long grey line their accoutrements looked perfect and trim their general appearance were strikingly smart natty and workmanlike in the extreme just before they reached us jean got down and walked on foot along the road at the edge of the side path where they were riding and as they passed quite near him jean turned his glance towards me and gave me an enormous wink i don't know whether that was jean's sense of humour i always forgot afterwards to ask him what it meant i only know that it had a peculiarly cheering effect on me to see that great black eye winking and then turning itself with a quiet careless gaze on the faces of the fifty german cyclists they passed without doing more than casting a look at us and were lost to sight in a moment flashing onwards with tremendous speed towards Angeon. we were now on the brow of a hill and as we reached it and began to descend we were confronted with a spectacle that fairly took away my breath the long white road before us was literally lined with germans chapter fifteen face to face with the huns yes there they were and when i found myself face to face with those five hundred advancing germans about two kilometres out of Angeon, i quite believed i was about to lose my chance of getting to brussels and of seeing the man i was so anxious to see little did i dream at that moment out there on the sunny brabant hillside seated in the old vatour with that long never-ending line of germans filling the tree-lined white dusty highway far and wide with their infantry and artillery their cannon and the prancing horses of their officers and their gleaming blue and scarlet uniforms and glittering appointments that it was not i who was going to be taken prisoner by les allemands that brilliant saturday afternoon but max of brussels himself up and down the long steep white road to brussels the germans halted shouting in stentorian voices that we were to do likewise our driver quickly brought his two bony horses to a standstill and in the open carriage with me our queer haphazard party sat as if turned to stone 
the red cross belgian lady had already hidden her red cross in her stocking so that the germans if we met them should not seize her and oblige her to perform red cross duties in their hated service the guttural voice of an erect old blue and scarlet german colonel fell on my ears like a bad dream as he brought his big prancing grey horse alongside our driver and demanded roughly what we were doing there while in the same bad dream as i sat there in my corner of the voiture i watched the expressions written all over those hundreds of fierce fair arrogant faces staring at us from every direction in a blaze of hatred i told myself that if ever the brute could be seen rampant in human beings faces there it was rampant uncontrolled unashamed only just escaping from being degraded by the accompanying expressions of burning arrogance and indomitable determination that blazed out of those hundreds of blue teutonic eyes the set of their lips was firm and grim beyond all words often a peculiar ironic smirk caused by the upturning of the corners of their otherwise straight lips seemed to add to their demoniac suggestiveness but their physique was magnificent and there was not a man among them who did not look every inch a soldier from his iron-heeled blucher boots upwards as i studied them drinking in the unforgettable picture it gave me a certain amount of satisfaction to know that i was setting up my own small womanly daring up against that great mass of unbridled cruelty and conceit and i sat very still very still indeed stiller than any mouse allowing myself the supreme luxury of a contemptuous curl of my lips picture after picture of the ruined cities i had seen in belgium flashed like lightning over my memory out there in the sunny brabant hillside again i saw before me the horrors that i had seen with my own eyes at aerschot termonde and louvain and then instead of feeling frightened i experienced nothing but a red-hot scorn that entirely lifted me above the terrible stress of the encounter and whether i lived or died mattered not the least bit in the world beside the satisfaction of sitting there an english subject looking down at the german army with that contemptuous curl of my lips and that blaze of hatred in my heart meanwhile our driver's passport with his photograph was being examined who is this shouted the silly old german colonel pointing to the photograph c'est moi replied the driver and his expression seemed to say who on earth did you think it was the fat colonel who obviously did not understand a word of french kept roaring away for one schultz who seemed to be some distance off the roaring and shouting went on for several minutes it was a curious manifestation of german lack of dignity and i tried in vain to imagine an english colonel roaring at his men like that then schultz came galloping up he acted as interpreter and an amusing dialogue went on between the roaring colonel and the young dashing bafferois who was obviously a less brutal type than his interrogator the old banker from brussels was next questioned and his passport to come in and out of brussels being correctly made out in german and french the german seized upon jean and demanded what he was doing there why he was going to brussels and why he had been to grammont jean's answer was that he lived in brussels and had been to grammont to see his relations and schultz's explanations rendered this so convincing that the lawyer's passport was handed back to him you are sure none of you have no correspondence no newspapers roared the colonel what is in that bag leaning into the carriage a soldier prodded at my bag i dared not attempt to speak my english origin might betray me in my french i sat silent i made no reply i tried to look entirely uninterested but i was really almost unconscious with dread but the red cross lady replied with quiet dignity that there was nothing in her bag but requisites for the journey next moment as in a dream i heard that roaring voice shout gut get on our driver whipped lightly the carriage moved forward and we proceeded on our way filled with queer thoughts that sprang from nerves overstrained and hearts over quickly beating only jean remained imperturbable quelle chance they were nearly all bavarois did you see the dragon embroidered on their pouches the bavarois are always plus gentil than any of the others this was something i had heard over and over again 
according to the belgians these bavarois had all through the war manifested a better spirit towards the belgians than any other german regiment the accredited reason being that the belgian queen is of bavarian nationality when the uhlans slashed up the queen's portrait in the royal palace at brussels the bavarois lost their tempers and a fierce brawl ensued in which seven men were killed all the belgians in our old ramshackle carriage were loud in their expressions of thankfulness that we had encountered bavarois instead of uhlans so at last that dread mysterious darksome quantity known as les allemands ever moving hither and thither across belgium always talked of on the other side of the belgian lines but never seen had materialized right under my very eyes the beautiful rich brabant orchard country stretched away on either side of the road and behind us along the road ran like a wash of indigo the brilliant prussian blue of the moving german cavalcade making now towards angeon and grammont and now the old professor from liege drew all attention towards himself he was shaking and quivering like a jelly je pour he said simply mais non monsieur cried jean it is all over now courage courage pas de danger cried every one encouragingly it was only a ruse of the enemy letting us go whispered the professor they will follow and shoot us from behind plaintively as a child he asked the fat brussels banker to allow him to change places and sit in front instead of behind in a sudden rebound of spirits the red cross lady and i laughingly sat on the back seat and opened our parasols behind us while the old brussels banker when the two fat men had exchanged seats not without difficulty whispered to us and all the while there are a hundred letters sewn up inside the cushion of the seat our friend from liege is sitting on now end of chapter fifteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapters sixteen through eighteen of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter sixteen a prayer for his soul on we drove on and on all the road to brussels was patrolled now at the gates of villa gardens on the side paths grey german gentries were posted bayonets fixed we drove through germans all the way they looked at us quietly once only were we stopped again and this time it was only the driver's passport that was looked at at last we arrived at hall an old-world brabant town containing a miracle as far as i can remember it was a bomb from some bygone war that came through the church wall and was caught in the skirts of the madonna hall said jean is now the headquarters of the german army in belgium the etat major has been moved here from brussels he is in residence at the hotel de ville voila see the germans they always pose themselves like that on the steps where there are any steps to pose on ah mais c'est triste n'est-ce pas mon pauvre belgique we clattered up the main street and stopped at a little cafe facing the hotel de ville stiffly we alighted from our wagonette and entering the cafe quenched our thirst in lemonade watching the germans through the window as we rested nervous as i was myself i admired the belgians sans foi they manifested not the slightest signs of nervousness scorn was their leading characteristic then a sad little story reached my ears an old peasant was telling jean that an english aviator had been shot down at hull the day before and was buried somewhere near how i longed to look for my brave countryman's grave but that was impossible instead i breathed a prayer for his soul and thought of him and his great courage with tenderness and respect it was all i could do chapter seventeen brussels finally after a wild and breathless drive of thirty-five miles through rich orchard country all the way and always between german patrols we entered brussels crowds of german officers and men were dashing about in motor-cars in all directions while the populace moved by them as though they were ghosts taking not the slightest notice of their presence the sunlight had faded now 
and the lights were being lit in brussels and i gazed about me filled with an inordinate curiosity at first i thought the people seemed to be moving about just as usual but soon i discovered an immense difference between these brussels crowds and those of normal times and conditions it was as though all the red roses and carnations had been picked out of the garden the smart world had completely disappeared those daintily dressed exquisite women and elegant young and old men that made such persuasive notes among the streets and shops of brussels in ordinary times had vanished completely under the german occupation in their place was now a rambling roaming crowd of the lower middle classes dashed with a big sprinkling of wide-eyed wrinkled peasants from the brabant country outside who had come into the big city for the protection of the lights and the houses and the companionship even though the dreaded allemands were there listlessly people strolled about they looked in the shop windows but nobody bought no business seemed to be done at all except in the provision shops where i saw groups of german officers and soldiers buying sausages cheese and eggs crowds gathered before the german notices pasted on the walls so continuously that brussels was half covered beneath these great black and white printed declarations which as they were always printed in three languages german french and flemish took up an enormous amount of wall space here and there dutch journalists stood hastily copying these affiches into their notebooks now and then from the crowd reading a low voice would mutter languidly their sale cochon but more often the brussels sense of humour would see something funny in those absurd proclamations and people were often to be seen grinning ironically at the german official war news specially concocted for the people of brussels it was all the direct opposite of the news in belgian and english papers we the allies had just announced that austria had broken down and was on the verge of a revolution the germans announced precisely the same thing only of servia and the brussels people coolly read the news and passed on believing none of it and all the time while the belgians moved dawdlingly up and down and round about their favourite streets and arcades the germans kept up one swift everlasting rush flying past in motors or striding quickly by with their firm long tread they always seemed to be going somewhere in a hurry or doing something extraordinarily definite after i had been five minutes in brussels i became aware of this curious sense of immense and unceasing german activity flowing like some loud swift resistless current through the dull depleted stream of brussels life all day long it went without ceasing and all night too in and out of the city in and out of the city in and out of the city past the deserted lace shops with their exquisite delicate contents past the many closed hotels past the great white beauties of brussels architecture past the proud but yellowing avenues of trees along the heights past those sculptured monuments of belgians who fell in bygone battles and now in the light of nineteen fourteen leapt afresh into life again galvanized back into reality by the shriek of a thousand obu and the blood poured warm on the blackened fields of belgium we drove to an old hotel in a quiet street and our driver jumped down and rang the courtyard bell then the door opened and an old belgian porter stood and looked at us with sad eyes saying in a low voice come in quickly we all got down and went through the gateway we found ourselves in a big old yellow stone courtyard chilly and deserted the driver ran out and returned carrying in his arms the long flat seat cushion from the carriage then the old porter locked the gate and we all gathered round the brave little flemish driver who was down on his knees now over the cushion doing something with a knife next minute he held up a bundle of letters and then another and then another and here is your english passport madame jean said to me unknown to most of us the driver and jean while we waited at angion had made a slit in the cushion had taken out some stuffing and put in instead a great mass of letters and papers for brussels then they had wired up the slit turned the cushion upside down and let us sit on it it was rather like sitting on a mine only like the heroine of the song we didn't care we didn't know chapter eighteen 
burgomaster max the hotel is closed to the public we shut it up so that we should not have germans coming in says the little bruxellois widow who owns it but if madame likes to stay here for the night we can arrange only there is no cooking the old professor from liege asks in his pitiful childlike way if he can get a room there too he would be glad so glad to be in a hotel that was not open to the public or the germans leaving my companions with many expressions of friendliness i now rush off to the hotel de ville accompanied by the faithful jean just as we reach our destination we run into the man i have come all this way to see i see a short dark man with an alert military bearing it seems to me that this idol of brussels is by no means good-looking certainly there is nothing of the hero in his piquant even somewhat droll appearance but his eyes they are truly extraordinary they bulge right out of their sockets they have the sharpness and alertness of a terrier's they are brilliant humorous stern merry tender audacious glistening bright all at once his beard is clipped his moustaches are large and upstanding his immaculate dress and careful grooming give him a dandified air as befitting the most popular bachelor in europe who is also an orphan to boot his forehead is high and broad his general appearance is immediately arresting one scarcely knows why quite unlike the conventional burgomaster type is he m max briefly explains that he is on his way to an important meeting but he will see me at eleven o'clock next morning if i will come to the hotel de ville then he hurries off his queer dark face lighting up with a singularly brilliant smile as he bids us au revoir an historic moment that for m max has never been seen in brussels since of itself m max's face is neither particularly lovable nor particularly attractive therefore this man's great hold over hearts is all the more remarkable it must of course be attributed in part to the deep warm audacious personality that dwells behind his looks but in truth m max's enormous popularity owes itself not only to his electric personality his daring and sang froid but also to his common sense which steered poor bewildered brussels through those terribly difficult first weeks of the german occupation nothing in history is more touching more glorious than the sudden starting up in time of danger of some quiet unknown man who stamps his personality on the world becomes the prop and comfort of his nation is believed in as christians believe in god and makes manifest again the truth that war so furiously and jealously attempts to crush and darken the power of mind over matter the mastery of good over evil from this war three such men stand out immortally king albert max of brussels mercier of malines and belgium has produced all three thrice fortunate belgium each stone that crumbles from her ruined homes seems to the watching world to fly into the heavens and glow there like a star on foot swinging my big yellow furs closer round me in the true belgian manner i walked along at jean's side trying to convince myself that this was all real this brussels full of grey-clad and blue-clad prussians saxons and bafferois with here and there the white uniform of the imperial guard suddenly i started horribly conscious as i was that i was an english authoress and with no excuse to offer for my presence there i felt distinctly nervous when i saw a queer young man in a bulky brown coat move slowly along at my side with a curious sidling movement whispering something under his breath i was not sure whether to hurry on or to stand still jean chose the latter course whereupon the stranger flicked a look up and down the street then put his hand in his inner breast pocket le ton he whispered hoarsely flashing looks up and down the street how much asked jean five francs he answered put it away tout de suite vous savez c'est dangereux then quickly he added walking along beside us still and speaking still in that hoarse melodramatic voice which pleased him a little i couldn't help think les allemands will give me a year in prison if they catch me so i have to make it pay n'est-ce pas but the brussels people must have their newspapers 
they've got to know the truth about the war n'est-ce pas and the english papers tell the truth how do you get the newspapers i whispered like a conspirator myself i sneak in and out of brussels in a peasant's cart all the way to sotejean he whispered back every week they catch one of us but still we go on n'est-ce pas we don't know what fear is in brussels that's because we've got monsieur max at the head of us ah there's a man for you monsieur max a look of pride and tenderness flashed across his dark crafty face then he was gone and i found myself longing for the morning when i should talk with monsieur max myself but sunday i was awakened by the loud booming of cannon proceeding from the direction of malines what is happening i asked the maid who brought my coffee isn't that firing very near oui madame on dit that in a few days now the belgian army will re-enter brussels and the germans will be driven out that will be splendid madame will it not splendid i answered mechanically this optimism was now becoming a familiar phrase to me i found it everywhere but alas i found it alongside what was continually being revealed as pathetic ignorance of the true state of affairs and the nearer one was to actual events the greater appeared one's ignorance this very day when we were saying in a few days now the germans will be driven out of brussels they were commencing their colossal attack upon antwerp and we knew nothing about it the faithful jean called for me at half past ten and hurrying through the rain-wet streets to meet monsieur max at the hotel de ville we became suddenly aware that something extraordinary was happening a sense of agitation was in the air people were hurrying about talking quickly and angrily and then our eyes were confronted by the following startling notice pasted on the walls printed in german french and flemish and flaming over brussels in all directions notice mayor max having committed offences against the german government i have been forced to suspend his functions mr max is in honourable detention in the fortress the german governor von der goltz brussels twenty sixth september nineteen fourteen cries of grief and rage kept bursting from those broken-hearted belgians not a man or woman in the city was there who did not worship the very ground max walked on the blow was sharp and terrible it was utterly unexpected too crowds kept on gathering presently with that never-ceasing accompaniment of distant cannon the anger of the populace found vent in groans and hisses as a body of uhlans made its appearance conducting two belgian prisoners towards the town hall and then all in a moment brussels was in an uproar prudence and fear were flung to the wind like mad creatures the seething crowds of men women and children went tearing along towards the hotel de ville groaning and hooting at every german they saw and shouting aloud the name of max while to add to the indescribable tumult hundreds of little boys ran shrieking at the tops of their voices here's a photograph of mr max ten cents the civic guard composed now mostly of elderly enrolled brussels civilians dashed in and out among the infuriated mob waving their sticks and imploring the population to restrain itself or the consequences might be fatal for one and all meanwhile the aldermen were busy preparing a new affiche which was soon being posted up in all directions important notice in the absence of mr max running the communal affairs and maintenance order will be provided by the college of aldermen in the interest of the city we are issuing a supreme call for calm and coolness of our citizens we rely on the support of all to maintain public tranquillity brussels the college of aldermen accompanied by jean i hurried on to the hotel de ville voyez vous says jean under his breath voici les allemands dans l'hôtel de ville quelle chose n'est ce pas and i hear a sharp note in the poor fellow's voice that told of bitter emotion it was an ordeal to walk through that beautiful classic courtyard patrolled by grey-clad german sentinels armed to the teeth the only thing to do was to pass them without either looking or not looking but once inside i felt safer the germans kept to their side of the town hall leaving the belgian municipality alone we went up the wide stairs hung with magnificent pictures and found a sad group of belgians gathered in a long corridor 
the windows of which looked down into the courtyard below where the germans were unloading wagons or striding up and down with bayonets fixed looking down from that window while we waited to be received by m le Mounier, the acting burgomaster who had promptly taken m max's place i interested myself in studying the famous german leg a greater part of it was boot these boots looked as though immense attention had been given to them in fact there was nothing they didn't have iron heels waterproof uppers patent soles in immense thickness with metal intermingled an infinite capacity for not wearing out i watched these giant boots standing in the gateway of the exquisite hotel de ville fair monument of belgium's genius for the gothic i could see nothing of the upper part of the germans only their legs and it was forced upon my observation that those legs were of great strength and massive yet with a curious flinging freedom of gait that was the direct result of goose-stepping then i saw two officers goose-stepping into the courtway i saw their feet first then their knees the effect was curious they appeared to kick out contemptuously at the world then pranced in after the kick the conceit of the performance defies all words then jean's card was taken into the acting burgomaster and next moment a belgian echevin said to us entrez s'il vous plaît and we passed into the room habitually occupied by m max we found ourselves in a palatial chamber the walls covered thickly with splendid tapestries and portraits from the high gilded ceiling hung enormous chandeliers glittering and pageantesque under one of these giant chandeliers stood an imposing desk covered with papers an elderly gentleman with a grey wide beard was seated there we advanced over the thick soft carpets m le meunier received us with great courtesy nous avons perdu notre tête he murmured sadly without m max we are lost the air was full of agitation here was a scene the like of which might well have been presented by the stage so spectacular was it so dramatic the lofty chamber with its superb appointments and hangings and these elderly grey-bearded men of state who had just been dealt the bitterest blow that had yet fallen on their poor tortured shoulders but this was no stage scene this was real if ever anything on earth was alive and real it was this scene in the burgomaster's room in brussels on the first day of max's imprisonment throbbing and palpitating through it was human agony human grief human despair as these grey-bearded belgians stared with dull heavy eyes at the empty space where their heroic chief no longer was tragic beyond the words of any historian was that scene which at last however by sheer intensity of concentrated and concealed emotion seemed to summon again into that chamber the imprisoned body the blazing dauntless personality of the absent one until his prison bonds were broken and he was here seated at this desk cool fearless imperturbable directing the helm of his storm-tossed bark with his splendid sanity and saying to all fear nothing mes enfants there is no such thing as fear end of chapter eighteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapters nineteen through twenty two of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter nineteen his arrest the story of max's arrest was characteristic he was busy at the hotel de ville with his colleagues when a peremptory message arrived from von der goltz bidding him come at once to an interview i cannot come at once said max i am occupied in an important conference with my colleagues i'll come at half-past four o'clock presently the messenger returned Monsieur max will you come at once he said in a worried manner von der goltz is angry i am busy with my work replied max imperturbably as i said before i shall be with von der goltz at four thirty at four thirty he went off accompanied by his colleagues and a dramatic conference took place between the germans and belgians max now fearlessly informed the germans that he considered it would be unfair for brussels to pay any more at present 
of the indemnity put upon it by germany one reason he gave was very simple the germans had posted up notices in the city declaring that in future they would not pay for anything required for the service of the german army but would take whatever they wanted free you must wait for your indemnity said max you can't get blood from a stone then we arrest you all as hostages for the money was the german's answer at first max and all his echevins were arrested two hours later the aldermen were released but not max he was sent to his honourable detention in a german fortress the months have passed he is still there chapter twenty two general Thies. by degrees brussels calmed down but the germans wore startled expressions all that grey wet sunday as though realizing that within that pent-up city was a terribly dangerous force a force that had been restrained and kept in order all this time by the very man they had been foolish enough to imprison because brussels found herself unable to pay up her cruelly imposed millions later on that sunday afternoon i fulfilled my promise and went to call on general Thies, the father of one of my Irishot acquaintances i found the old general in that beautiful house of his in the chaussee de Charleroi, sitting by the fireside in his library reading the old testament the only book i can read now the general said in a voice that shook a little as if with some burning secret agitation i remember so well that interview it was a grey sunday afternoon with a touch of autumn in the air and no sunlight through the great glass windows at the end of the library i could see that brussels garden with some trees green and some turning palely gold already on their way towards decay seated on one side of the fire was the beautiful young unmarried daughter of the house sharing her father's terrible loneliness while on the other side sat the handsome melancholy old belgian hero whose trembling voice began presently to tell the story of his beloved nation its suffering its heroism its love of home its bygone struggles for liberty and outside in the streets germans strode up and down germans stood on the steps of the palais de justice germans everywhere mademoiselle Thies, a tall fair very beautiful young girl chats away brightly trying to cheer her father presently she talks of monsieur max brussels can talk of nothing else to-day she shows him to me in a different aspect now i see him in society witty delightful charming debonair i did so love to be taken into dinner by monsieur max exclaims the bright young belle he was so interesting so amusing and so nice to flirt with he did not dance but he went to all the balls and walked about chatting and amusing himself and every one else before one big fancy dress ball it was the last in brussels before the war monsieur max announced that he could not be present every one was sorry his presence always made things brighter livelier suddenly in the midst of the ball a policeman was seen coming up the stairs his stick in his hand gravely without speaking to any one he moved down the corridors the police whispered every one what can it mean and then one of the hosts went up to the policeman determined to take the bull by the horns as you say in england and find out what is wrong and voila it is no policeman at all it is monsieur max undoubtedly the hatred and terror of germany at this time was all for russia in russia germany saw her deadliest foe every belgian man or woman that i talked with in brussels asserted the same thing the germans are terrified of russia said the old general they see in russia the greatest enemy to their plans in asia minor they fear russian civilization or so they say civilization indeed what they fear is russian numbers it was highly interesting to observe as i was forced to do a little later how completely that hatred for russia was passed on to england the passing on occurred after english troops were sent to the assistance of antwerp from then on the blaze of hatred in germany's heart was all for england deepening and intensifying with extraordinary ferocity ever since october fourth nineteen fourteen and why the reason is obvious now our effort to save antwerp unsuccessful as it was yet by delaying two hundred thousand germans enabled those highly important arrangements to be carried out on the allies western front that frustrated germany's hopes in france and stopped her dash for calais
chapter twenty one how max has influenced brussels in their attitude to the germans the bruxellois undoubtedly take their tone from monsieur max for his sake they suppressed themselves as quickly as possible that famous sunday and soon went on their usual way their attitude towards the germans revealed itself as a truly remarkable one it was perfect in every sense they were never rude never sullen never afraid and until this particular sunday and afterwards again they always behaved as though the germans did not exist at all they walked past them as though they were air no one ever speaks to the huns in brussels they sit there alone in the restaurants or in groups eating 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 hour after hour they sit there you pass at seven and they are eating and drinking you pass at nine they are still eating and drinking their red faces grow redder and redder their gold wedding rings grow tighter and tighter on their fingers the belgians wait on them with an admirable air of not noticing their presence never looking at them never speaking to them the waiters bringing them their food with an admirable detached air as though they are placing viands before a set of invisible spectres always alone are the germans in brussels and sometimes they look extremely bored i can't help noticing that they do their best to win a little friendliness from the belgians but in vain at the restaurants they always pay for their food they also make a point of sometimes ostentatiously dropping money into the boxes for collecting funds for the belgians but the bruxellois never for one moment let down the barriers between themselves and les allemands although they do occasionally allow themselves the joy of getting a rise out of the landsturm when possible an amusement which the germans apparently find it impolite to resent i sat in a tram in brussels when two germans in mufti entered and quite politely excused themselves from paying their fares explaining that they were military and travel free but how do i know that you are really german soldiers says the plucky little tram guard while all the passengers crane forward to listen you're not in uniform i don't know who you are you must pay your fares messieurs or you must get out with red annoyed faces the germans pull out their soldiers medals gaudy ornate affairs on blue ribbons round their necks i don't recognize these says the tram guard examining them solemnly they're not what our soldiers carry i can't let you go free on these but we have no money splutter the germans then i must ask you to get out says the guard gravely and the two germans looking very foolish actually get out of the tram whereupon the passengers all burst into uncontrollable laughter which gives them a vast amount of satisfaction while the two germans very red in the face march away down the street as for the street urchins they flourish under the german occupation adopting exactly the same attitude towards their conquerors as that manifested by their elders and monsieur max dressed up in paper uniforms with a carrot for the point of their imitation german helmet they march right under the noses of the germans headed by an old dog round the old dog's neck is an inscription the war is taking place for the aggrandizement of belgium the truth is the beautiful truth that the spirit of monsieur max hangs over brussels steals through it pervades it it is his ego that possesses the town it is max who is really in occupation there it is max who is the true conqueror it is max who holds brussels and will hold it through all time to come for all that the germans are going about the streets and for all that max is detained in his honourable fortress the man's spirit is so indomitable so ardent that he makes himself felt through his prison walls and the population of brussels is able to say with magnificent sang-froid and a confidence that is absolutely real they may keep m max in a fortress but even les aboches will never dare to hurt a hair of his head chapter twenty two under german occupation in my empty hotel the profoundest melancholy reigns the inherent sadness of the occupied city seems to have full sway here the palm court with its high glassed roof is swept with ghostly echoes especially when the day wanes towards dusk the great deserted dining salon with its polished tables and its rows of chairs is like a mausoleum for dead revellers 
the writing-rooms with their desks always so pitifully tidy the smoking-rooms the drawing-rooms the floor upon floor of empty guestless bedrooms with the beds rolled back and the blinds down they ache with their ghastly silences and seem to languish away towards decay the only servant is antoine the bent little old faithful white-haired porter who has passed his lifetime in the service of the house madame la patronne in heavy mourning with her two small boys clinging to either arm sometimes moves across the palm court to her own little sitting-room and sometimes some belgian woman friend always in black drops in and she and la patronne and the old porter all talk together dully guardedly relating to each other the gossip of brussels and wondering also how things are going with les petits belges outside in the world beyond in front the great doors are locked and barred one tiny door cut in the wooden gate at the side is one sole means of exit and entrance but it is almost too small for the liege professor and he tells me plaintively that he will be glad to move on to liege i get broken to pieces squeezing in and out of that little door he says and i am always afraid i will stick in the middle and the germans in the restaurant will see me and ask who i am and what i am doing here i can get through the door easily enough i answer but i suffer agonies as i stand there on the street waiting for old antoine to come and unlock it and then there is no food here no lunch no dinner and i do not like to go in the restaurants alone i am afraid the germans will notice me i am so big you see everybody notices me do you think i will ever get to liege of course you will but do you think i will ever get back from liege to antwerp of course you will j'ai peur moi aussi and indeed sitting there in the dusk in the eerie silences of the deserted hotel with the german guns booming away in the distance towards malines there creeps over me a shuddering sensation that is very like fear at the ever-deepening realization of what belgium has suffered and may have to suffer yet and i find it almost intolerable the thought of this poor brave old trembling belgian weighted with years and flesh struggling so manfully to get back to liege and gauge for himself the extent of the damage done to his house and properties to see his servants and help them make arrangements for the future like all the rest of the belgian fugitives he knows nothing definite about the destruction of his town it may be that his home has been razed to the ground it may be that it has been spared he is sure of nothing and that is why he has set out on this long and dangerous journey which is not by any means over yet then the old porter approaches gentle sorrowful monsieur good news there is a train for liege to-morrow morning at five o'clock merci bien says the old professor mais j'ai peur i rise at four next morning and come down to see him off we two who have never seen each other before seem now like the only relics of some bygone far-off event to see his fat old enormous face gives me a positive thrill of joy i feel as if i have known him all my life and when he is gone i feel curiously alone the melancholy old fat man's presence had lent a semblance of life to the hotel which now seems given over to ghosts and echoes unable to bear it i move into the metropole it was very strange to be there very strange indeed this was the metropole and yet not the metropole sometimes i could not believe it was the metropole at all the gay bright lively friendly companionable metropole so sad was this big red carpeted hotel so full of gloomy echoing silences and with never a soul to arrive or leave to ask for a room or a time-table there were italians in charge of the hotel for which i was profoundly thankful how nice they were to me those kindly sons of the south they allowed me to look in their visitor's book and as i expected i found that the dry hotel register had suddenly become transformed into a vital human document of surpassing interest of intense historic value as i glanced through the crowded pages i came at last upon an ominous date in august upon which there were no names entered it was the day on which brussels surrendered to the germans on that day the register was blank entirely blank and next day also and the next and the next and the next were those white empty sheets with never a name inscribed upon them 
for weeks this blankness continued it was stifling in its significance it clutched at one's heartstrings it shouted aloud of the agony of those days when all who could do so left brussels and only those who were obliged to remained it told its desolate tale of the visitors that had fled or ceased to come only here and there after a long interval appeared a german name or two frau schmidt arrived herr lemberg fräulein gottmituns there was a subdued little group of occupants when i was there mr morse the american pill-maker mr williams another american an ex-portuguese minister and his wife and son exiles these from portugal a little dutch baroness who is said to be a great friend of gyps half a dozen english nurses and two wounded german officers i made friends quickly with the nurses and the americans and to look into english eyes again gave me a peculiarly soothing sense of relief that taught me if i needed teaching how alone i was in all these dangers and agitations mr williams had a queer experience i have often wondered why america did not resent it on his account he was arrested and taken prisoner for talking about the horrors of louvain in a train he was released while i was there i saw him dashing into the hotel one evening a brown paper parcel under his arm there was quite a little scene in the waiting-room every one came round him asking what had happened it seemed that as he stepped out of the tram he was confronted by german officers who promptly conducted him into an honourable detention there he was stripped and searched and in the meanwhile private detectives visited his room at the metropole and went through all his belongings nothing of a compromising nature being found mr williams was allowed to go free after twenty-four hours having first to give his word that in future he would not express himself in public when i invited him to describe to me what happened in his honourable detention he answered with a strained smile no more talking for me surely this insult to a free-born american must have been a bitter dose for the american consulate to swallow but perhaps they were too busy to notice it when i called at the consulate the place was crowded with english nurses begging to be helped away from brussels i found that mr richards had already put in a word on my behalf this is what they gave me at the american consulate in brussels as a safeguard against the germans i shouldn't have cared to show it to the enemy it seemed to me to deliver me straight into their hands i hid it in the lining of my hat with my passport end of chapter twenty two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapters twenty three to twenty five of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty three chanson triste chilly and wet to-day in brussels and yet so triste so triste never before have i known a sadness like to this not in cemetery not in ruined town not among wounded coming broken from the battle as on that red day at heist op den berg a brooding soul mist is in the air of brussels it creeps it creeps it gets into the bones into the brain into the heart even when one laughs one feels the ghostly visitant all the joy has gone from life the vision is clouded to look at anything you must see germans first oh horrible horrible it is and hourly it grows more horrible its very quietness takes on some clammy quality associated with graves movement and life go on all round people talk walk eat drink take the trams shop but all the while the germans are there the germans are in their hotels their houses their palaces their public buildings town hall post office palais de justice in their trams in their cafes in their restaurants at last i find a simile it is like being at home in one's beloved home with one's beloved family all around one and every room full of cockroaches chapter twenty four the cult of the brute repellent unforgettable was the spectacle of the germans strutting and posing on the steps of the beautiful palais de justice 
so ill did they fit the beauty of their background that all the artist in one writhed with pain like some horrible vandal attempt at decoration upon pure and flawless architecture these coarse brutish figures stood with legs apart their flat round caps upon their solemn yokel faces giving them the aspect of a body of convicts while behind them reared these noble pillars yellow and dreamlike suffering in horror but with chaste dignity the polluting nearness of the hun the more one studies hun physiognomy and physique the more predominant grow those first impressions of the cult of the brute brutish is the clear blue eye with the burning excited brain revealing itself in flashes such as one might see in the eye of a rhinoceros on the attack brutish is the head so round and close cropped resembling no other animal save german brutish are the ears flapping out so redly the thick necks and incredibly thick legs have the tenacious look of elephants and oh their little ways their little ways in the tribunal of commerce they put up clotheslines and hung their shirts and handkerchiefs there while a bucket stood in the middle of the beautiful tessellated floor and then in exquisite taste to give the belgians a treat this interior has been photographed and forced into an extraordinary little newspaper published in brussels printed in french but secretly controlled by the germans who splatter it with their photographs in every conceivable and inconceivable style and so we see them in their kitchen installed at the foot of the monument wearing aprons over their middle-aged tummies blucher boots and round flat caps a pretty picture that they posed themselves for it alone they did it and this is how they tipped up a big basket and let it lie in the foreground on its side two germans seized the table lifting it off the ground one man seated himself on a wooden bench with a tin of kerosene half a dozen others leaned up against the portable stoves with folded arms looking as if they were going to burst into moody and sankey hymns all food all bottles were hidden the dustbin was brought forward instead and then the photographer said goot and there they were it was the hunnish idea of a superb photograph of army cooks contrast it with tommy's how do you see tommy when a war photographer gets him his first thought is for an effect of cheerio he doesn't hide bottles and glasses he brings them out and lets you look at them he doesn't in the act of being photographed lift a table he lifts a teapot or a bottle if he has one handy give us tommy all the time yes all the time another photograph shows the huns in the auditoire of the cour de cassation more funny effects they brought forward all their knapsacks and piled them on a desk for decoration they themselves lie on the carpeted steps at full length but they don't lounge they can't no man can lounge who doesn't know what to do with his hands and germans never know what to do with theirs when i saw that picture showing the hun idea of how a photograph should be taken i felt a suffocation in my larynx then there was a gem called un coin de la cour de cassation this showed dried fish and sausages hanging on an easel cheeses on the floor and washing on the clothesline and opposite this on the other page was a photo of general lema in his now famous letters to king albert the most touching human documents that ever were written to a king sire after the honourable battles fought on the fourth fifth and sixth of august when the third army reinforced the fifth division with the fifteenth brigade i estimated that the forts of liege could no longer play an effective role of resistance nevertheless i kept the military government established to coordinate the defence as best i could and to exert a moral influence on the garrisons of the forts the merits of these resolutions subsequently received serious confirmation your majesty knows further that i installed myself at fort lancin from noon of august the sixth sire you will learn with sorrow that this stronghold has been exploded burying under its ruins most of the garrison perhaps eighty per cent if i have not been killed in this disaster it's because my escort composed as follows captain commander collard an infantry n c o who probably did not survive constable thevenin and my two orderlies vandenbosch and lecoq dragged me to a safe place 
or i would have been asphyxiated by gas powder i was taken into a ditch where i fell a german captain named grusson gave me something to drink but i was taken prisoner and then taken to liege in an ambulance i'm sure i have maintained the honour of our arms i have surrendered no fortress or stronghold deign to forgive me sire the careless appearance of this letter i am very physically damaged by the explosion of lonsin in germany where i am bound my thoughts will be what they always have been belgium and king i would have gladly given my life for better service but death does not want me g le Main. chapter twenty five death in life what is it i've been saying about gaiety how could one ever use such a word here in the heart of brussels one cannot recall even a memory of what it was like to be joyful i am in a city under german occupation and i see around me death in life and life in death i see men women and children with eyes that are looking into tombs oh those eyes those eyes ah here is the agony of belgium here in this fair white capital set like a snowflake on her hillside here is grief concentrated and dread accumulated and the days go by and the weeks come and pass and then months then months and still the agony endures the germans remain the belgians wake to fresh morrows with that weight that is more bitter and heavier than death flinging itself upon their weary shoulders the moment they return to consciousness yes waking in brussels is grim as waking on the morn of execution out of sleep with its mercy of dream and forgetfulness the bruxellois comes back each morning to a sense of brooding tragedy swiftly this deepens into realization the germans are here they are still here the day must be gone through the sad long day there is no escaping it the belgian must see the grey figures striding through his beloved streets shopping in his shops walking and motoring in his parks and squares he must meet the murderers in his churches in his cafes he must hear their laughter in his ears and their loud arrogant speech he must see them in possession of his post offices his banks his museums his libraries his theatres his palaces his hotels he must remain in ignorance of the world outside worst of all when his poor tortured thoughts turn to one thought of his deliverance he must confront a terror sharper than all the rest then he sees in clear vision the ghastly fate that may fall upon the unarmed brussels population the day the germans are driven out the whole beautiful city may be in flames the whole population murdered there is no one who can stop the germans if they decide to ruin brussels before evacuating it one can only trust in their common sense and their mercy and at thought of mercy the bruxellois gazes away down the flat dusty road away towards louvain the peasants are going backwards and forwards to louvain little carts filled with beshawled women and children keep trundling along the road a mud-splashed rickety wagonette is drawn up in front of a third-rate cafe louvain is marked on it in white chalk on a blackboard in the cafe window is a notice that the wagonette will start when full the day is desperately wet there is a canvas roof to the wagonette but the rain dashes through sideways and backwards and forwards under cover of the rain as it were i step into the wagonette and seat myself quietly among a group of peasants two more get in shortly after then off we start in silence all crouching together we drive through the city out through the northern gateway soon we are galloping along the drear flat country road that leads to the greatest tragedy of the war it is ten o'clock when we start at half past eleven we are in louvain on the way we meet only peasants and little shopkeepers going to and from brussels over the flat bare country through the grey atmosphere comes an impression of whiteness my heart beats suffocatingly as i climb out of the wagonette and stand in the narrow rue de la station looking along the tram line the heaps of debris nearly meet across the street the rain is falling in louvain it beats through the ruined spaces it does its best to wash out the blood-stains of those terrific days in august 
and the people oh the brave people they are actually making a pretence of life a few shops are opened a cafe opposite the ruined theatre is full of pale trembling old men sipping their beer or coffee louvain is just alive enough to whisper the word death but with that word it whispers also immortality in its ruin louvain seems to me to have taken on a beauty that could never have belonged to it in other days those great fair buildings with gaps in their sides speak now with a voice that the whole world listens to the germans have smashed and flattened them burnt and destroyed them but the glory of immortality that death alone can confer rests upon them now out of those ruins has sprung the strongest factor in the war louvain despoiled and desolate has had given into her keeping the greatest power at work against germany louvain in her waste and mourning has caused the world to pause and think she has made hearts bleed that were cold before she has opened the world's eyes to germany's brutality actually in africa louvain it was that decided a terribly critical situation because of louvain many many hesitating partisans of germany threw in their cause with the allies ah louvain take heart in your destruction you are indestructible you faced your day of carnage your civilians bravely opposed the enemy it was all written down in destiny's white book the priests that were shot in your streets the innocent women and children who were butchered they have all achieved great things for belgium and they will achieve still greater things yet louvain proud glorious louvain it is because of you that germany can never win your ruins stand for germany's destruction it is not you who are ruined it is germany i wander about i am utterly indifferent to-day if a german officer took it in his head to suspect me i would not care such is my state of mind wandering among the ruins of louvain i am surprised to find that in the actual matter of ruins louvain is less destroyed than i expected compared with Ayershot, the town has not been as ruthlessly destroyed Ayershot no longer exists louvain is still here among the ruined monuments houses and shops are occupied an attempt at business goes on the heaps of masonry in the streets are being cleared away with her interior torn out the old theatre still stands upright the train runs in and out among the ruins the university is like a beautiful skeleton with the wind and rain dashing through the interstices between her white frail bones where there are walls intact and even over the ruins the germans have pasted their proclamations veuve d for insulting an official was sentenced to ten years in prison jean d for opposing an official was shot and in flaunting placards the germans beg the citizens of louvain to understand that they will meet with nothing but kindness and consideration from das deutsche herr as long as they behave themselves i step into a little shop as a motor-car full of german officers dashes by how brave you are to keep on i say to the little old woman behind the counter it must be terribly sad and difficult if we had more salt she says we shouldn't mind but one must have salt and there is none left in louvain we go to brussels for it but it grows more and more difficult to obtain even there and food oh the english will never let us starve she says mon mari he says so and he knows he was in england forty years ago he was in the household of baron d the belgian ambassador in london would you like to see mon mari i went into the room behind the shop mon mari was sitting in a big chair by the window looking out over some rain-drenched purple cabbages he was a little old belgian shrivelled and trembling he had been shot in the thigh on that appalling august day when louvain attempted to defend herself against the murderers he was lame broken useless aged but his sense of humour survived it flamed up till i felt a red glow in that chilly room looking over the rain-wet cabbages and laughter warmed us all three among the ruins myself and the little old woman and mon mari yesterday he said an american consul was coming in my shop he was walking with a german colonel the american says how could you germans destroy a beautiful city like louvain and the alboche answered we didn't know it was beautiful 
and the old woman echoes ponderingly didn't know it was beautiful end of chapter twenty five recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty six of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty six the return from brussels from brussels to ninove from ninove to sotejean from sotejean to ghent from ghent to antwerp that was how i got back at the outskirts of brussels on a certain windy corner i stood waiting my chance of a vehicle going towards ghent the train lines were still cut and the only way of getting out of brussels was to drive unless one went on foot at the windy corner accompanied by jean and his two sisters i stood watching a wonderful drama there were people creeping in as well as creeping out peasants on foot women and children who had fled in terror and were now returning to their little homes it seemed to me as if the germans must purposely have left this corner unwatched unhindered probably in the hope of getting more and more to return little carts and big carts clattered up and came to a standstill alongside an old white inn and jean bargained and argued on my behalf for a seat there was one tiny cart drawn by a donkey with five young men in it the driver wanted six passengers and began appealing to me in flemish to come in i will drive you all the way to ghent if you like he said how much ten francs suddenly a hand pulled at my sleeve and a hoarse voice whispered in my ear no no madame you mustn't go with them don't you know who they are it was a rough-faced little peasant and his blue eyes were full of distress i felt startled and impressed and wondered if the five young men were murderers they are the newspaper sellers muttered the blue-eyed peasant under his breath if he had said they were madmen his tone could not have been more awestruck after a while i found a little cart with two seats facing each other two hard wooden seats one bony horse stood in the shafts but i liked the look of the three belgian women who were getting in and one of them had a wee baby that decided me i felt that the terrors of the long drive before me would be curiously lightened by that baby's presence its very tininess seemed to make things easier its little indifferent sleeping face soft and calm and fragrant among its white wool dainties seemed to give the lie to dread and terror seemed to hearten one swiftly and sweetly seemed to say look at me i'm only a month old but i'm not frightened of anything and now i must say good-bye to jean and good-bye to his two plump young sisters they are the dearest friends i have in the world or so it seems to me as i bid them good-bye bon chance madame they whisper i should like to have kissed jean but i kissed the sisters instead then feeling as if i were being cut in halves i climbed lonely and full of sinister dread into the little car and the driver cracked his whip shouting allons fritz to his bony horse and off we started a party of eight all told the three belgian women sat opposite me two middle-aged men were beside me and the driver and another man were on the front seat hour after hour we drove hour after hour there was no sun the land looked flat and melancholy under this grey sky and we were at our old game now have you seen the germans yes yes the germans are there pointing to the right and we would turn to the left tacking like a boat in the storm terrific firing was going on but the baby whose name the mother told me was solange slept profoundly the three women chattered like parrots and the driver shouted incessantly allons fritz allez comme and fritz throwing back his head plodded bravely on dragging his heavy load with a superb nonchalance that led him into cantering up the hills and breaking into gallops when he got on the flat road again hour after hour fritz cantered and galloped and trotted dragging eight people along as though they were so many pods december tenth nineteen fourteen madame creed on the way to london allow me to remind your excellent memory of me in fact on my way to london allow me to remind your excellent memory of me in fact remember your return from brussels in october in the cart were two gentlemen and three ladies one with a baby in her arms 
with two teachers i am one of the two women mrs stuffs i was hoping to see you in ghent but you were already departed can it be that here in london i ever would have that pleasure i'm here until the end of this week so be kind enough to tell me where and when we could meet here is my address ms stuffs verstegen fifty three maple street west good-bye i present to you my cordial greetings charlotte stuffs a teacher in brussels one bleak december day in london there came to me this letter and by it alone i know that fritz and the baby solange and the eight of us are no myth no figment of my imagination we really did all together drive all day long through the german infected country to east to west to north to south through fields and byways and strange little villages over hills and along valleys with the cannon always booming the baby always sleeping and old fritz always going merry and bright by noon we might have known each other a thousand years i had the baby on my knee the three men cracked walnuts for us all and every one talked at once strange talk the strangest in all the world so they killed the priest she hid for two days in the water closet she doesn't know what has happened to her five children they were stood in a row and every third one was fusi they found his body in the garden il est tout la fait ruiné then suddenly one of the ladies who knew a little english said with a friendly smile i have liked very much the english novel how do you call it something about a lamp every one reads it it is our favourite english book it is splendid we read it in french too and every now and then for hours she and i would try guessing the name of that something about a lamp book but we never got it it was weeks later when i remembered the lamplighter at last we crossed the border from brabant into flanders and galloping up a long hill we found ourselves in ninot it was in a terrific state of excitement here i saw the results of the fighting i had heard at Angion on the saturday the germans had pillaged and destroyed houses lay tumbled on the streets the peasants stood grouped in terror the air was full of the smell of burning at a house where we bought some apples we saw a sitting-room after the huns had finished it every bit of glass and china in the room was smashed tumblers wine glasses jugs plates cups saucers lay in heaps all over the floor all the pictures were cut from the frames all the chairs and tables were broken to bits the cushions were torn open the bookshelves toppled forward the books lay dripping wet on the grey carpet as if buckets of water had been poured over them jam tins sardine tins rubbish and filth were all over the carpet and bottles were everywhere it was a low degrading sight chapter twenty seven the english are coming i am back in antwerp and the unexpected has happened we are besieged the siege began on thursday the mental excitement of these last days passes all description and yet antwerp is calm outwardly and but for the crowds of peasants pouring into the city with their cows and their bundles one would hardly know that the germans were really attacking us at last the government has issued an order that any one who likes may leave antwerp but having once done so no one will be permitted to return and that quite decides us we will remain all day long the cannon are booming and pounding sometimes they sound so near that one imagines a shell must have burst in antwerp itself and sometimes they grow fainter they are obviously receding or so we tell ourselves hopefully we are always hopeful we are always telling each other that things are going better everyone is talking 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 everyone is asking what do you think have you heard any news everyone is saying but of course it will be all right the germans have been driven back five kilometres says one civilian have you heard the news the germans have been driven back six kilometres says another and again have you heard the news germans driven back seven kilometres and at last a curious mental condition sets in we lose interest in the cannon and we go about our business just as if those noises were not ringing in our ears even as we sit at dinner in our hotel there is one little notice posted up about the hotel that simply as it reads fills one with a new and more active terror than shell-fire il n'y a pas du this is because the german shells have smashed the waterworks at wavre st catherine and so in the meantime antwerp's hotels are flooded with carbolic and we drink only mineral waters and wait hopeful as ever 
for the great day when the bathrooms will be opened again these nights are stiflingly hot and the mosquitoes still linger indeed they are so bad sometimes that i put eucalyptus oil on my pillow to keep them away how strange that all this terrific firing should not have frightened them off i come to the conclusion that mosquitoes are deaf the curious thing is no one can tell by looking at antwerp that she is going through the greatest page in all her varied history her shops are open people sit at crowded cafes sipping their coffee or beer a magnificent calm prevails there is no sense of active danger the lights go out at seven instead of eight by ten o'clock the city is asleep save for the coming and going of clattering troops over the rough flagged streets and avenues grapes and pears and peaches are displayed in luxuriant profusion at extraordinarily low prices fish and meat are dearer but chickens are still very cheap the enfressois still take as much trouble over their cooking which is uncommonly good even for belgium and then on saturday with the sharpness and suddenness of lightning the terrible rumour goes round that antwerp is going to surrender yes surrender rather than run the risk of being destroyed like louvain and termont and Ayrshot. the legation has received orders that the government is about to be moved to ostend crowds of people begin to hurry out of antwerp in motor-cars until the city looks somewhat like london on a sunday afternoon half empty and full of bare spaces instead of crowded and animated as antwerp has been ever since the government moved here from brussels and then on sunday comes a change the news spreads like wildfire that the legations have had their orders countermanded early in the morning they are to wait further instructions something has happened the english are coming chapter twenty eight monday a golden laughing day is this fifth of october as i fly along in my car i soon sense a new current vivid and electric flowing along with the stream of belgian life oh the change in the sad hollow-eyed belgian officers and men they felt that help was coming at last all this time they had fought alone unaided there was no one who could come to them no one free to help them and the weeks passed into months and liege and louvain and brussels and ayrshot and namur and malines and termont have all fallen one by one and high hopes have been blighted and the enemy in its terrific strength has swept on and on held back continually by the ardour and valour of the little belgian army which is still indomitable at heart but tired very tired haggard hollow-eyed exhausted craving the rest they may not have these glorious heroes revive as if by magic under the knowledge that other troops are coming to help theirs in this gargantuan struggle for antwerp the yellow khaki seems to sweep along with the blue uniforms like sunlight but the gentle-faced slow-speaking english are humble and modest enough god knows it's the high explosive shells that we mine most says a belgian lieutenant to an english tommy perhaps we'll mine them too says tommy humbly we ain't seen them yet at the war office count chabot has given me a special permit to go to lierre out past morcel i notice a belgian lady standing among a crowd of soldiers she wears black her dress is elegant yet simple i admire her furs and i wonder what on earth she is doing here right out in the middle of the fortifications far from the city belgian ladies are seldom seen in these specified zones suddenly her eyes meet mine and she comes towards me drawn by the knowledge that we are both women she leans in at my car window and then she tells me her story and i learn why she looks so pale and worried just down the road a little further on in the region in which we may not pass is her villa which has been suddenly requisitioned by the english all in a hurry yesterday madame packed up and hurried away to antwerp to arrange for her stay there this morning she has returned to fetch her dogs but voila she reaches this point and is stopped the way is blocked she must not go on no one can pass without a special laissez passer which she hasn't got so here hour after hour since six o'clock in the morning she stands waiting pitifully for a chance to get back to her villa and take away her dogs that she fears may be starving a pauvre sheen she keeps exclaiming and now a motor-car approaches from the direction of lierre with an english officer sitting beside the chauffeur 
i tell him the story of the dogs and ask what can be done the officer does not reply he almost looks as if he has not heard his calm cool face shows little sign of anything at all he merely turns his car round and flashes away along the white tree-shadowed and cannon-lined road that he has just traversed ten minutes go by then another ten then back along the road flashes the grey car and there again is colonel farquharson cool calm and unperturbed and behind him in the car barking joyfully at the sight of their mistress are three big dogs mais comme les anglais sont gentils say the belgian soldiers all along the road out of the burning town of lierre that same day a canary and a grey congo parrot are tenderly handed over to my care by a couple of english tommies who have found them in a burning house the canary is in a little red cage and the tommies have managed to put in some lumps of sugar the poor little thing is starving says a tommy compassionately it'll be better with you ma'am i bring the birds back in my car to antwerp but the parrot is very frightened he will not eat he will not drink he looks as if he is going to die until i ask mr cherry curtain to come and see him and then voila the famous english naturalist bends over him talks pets him and in a few minutes coco is busy trimming cherry curtain's moustache with his little black beak and from that very moment the bird begins to recover as i write the parrot and canary sit here on my table the parrot perching on the canary's cage the boom of cannon is growing fainter and fainter as the germans appear to be pushed further and further back the canary is singing and the grey parrot is cracking nuts and i think of the man who rescued them and hope that all goes well with him who with death staring him in the face had time and thought to save the lives of a couple of birds his name he told me was sergeant thomas marshall of winston churchill's marines he said if you see my wife ever you can tell her you've met me ma'am end of chapter twenty eight recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapters twenty nine through thirty one of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter twenty nine tuesday it is tuesday now at seven o'clock in the morning old sad-eyed maria knocks at my door good news madame maline has been retaken that is cheering and old maria and myself like everyone else are eager to believe the best the grey day however is indescribably sombre from a high grassy terrace at the top of the hotel i look out across the city towards the points where the germans are attacking us great black clouds that yet are full of garish light float across the city and through the clouds one two three four aeroplanes can be seen black as birds and moving continually hither and thither while far below the old town lies with its towers and gilded gothic beauty and its dark red roofs and its wide river running to meet the sea i go down to the war office and see commandant chabot he looks pale and haggard his handsome grey eyes are full of infinite sadness Today it would be wiser madame that you don't go out of the city he says in his gentle chivalrous voice c'est trop dangereux i want to ask him a thousand questions i ask him nothing i go away back to the hotel one o'clock and we learn that the fighting outside is terribly hot two o'clock cars come flying in they tell us that shells are falling about five miles out on vue Dieu. three o'clock a man rushes in and says that all is over the last train leaves antwerp to-night the government is going it is our last chance to escape how far is holland asks someone about half an hour away he answers i listen dreamily holland sounds very near i wonder what i am going to do am i going to stay and see the germans enter but maybe they will never enter the unexpected will happen we shall be saved at the eleventh hour it is impossible that antwerp can fall they will be shelling the town before twenty-four hours says one young man and he calls for another drink when he has had it he says he wishes he hadn't they will never shell the town says a choleric old englishman and he adds in the best english manner it could never be permitted outside the day dies down 
the sound of cannon has entirely ceased one can hear nothing now nothing at all but the loud and shrill cries of the newsboys and women selling le matin d'anvers and le metropole in the streets a strange hushed silence hangs over the besieged city and through the silence the clocks strike six and almost immediately the maitre d'hôtel comes along and informs us that we ought to come in to dinner soon as to-day the lights must go out at nightfall but i go into the streets instead it seems to me that the population of antwerp has suddenly turned into peasants peasants everywhere in crowds in groups in isolated numbers bareheaded women hollow-cheeked men little girls and boys and all with bundles some pathetically small done up in white or blue cloths and some huge and grotesque under which the peasants stagger along through the streets that were fashionable streets only just now and now have turned into a sort of sad travesty of the streets of some distant village a curious rosy hue falls over the faces in the streets the shop windows glow like rubies the gold on the gothic buildings burns like crimson fire overhead a magnificent sunset is spreading its banners out over the deserted city then night falls the red fades antwerp turns grey and sombre but the memory of that rose in the west remains and in hope we wait we are still waiting knowing not what the morrow may bring forth chapter thirty wednesday last night the moon was so bright that my two pets rescued from the ruins of lierre woke up and began to talk or was it the big guns that woke them the canary and the great congo parrot it might have been for sometimes the city seemed to shake all over and as i lay in bed i wondered who was firing germans belgians english which about three o'clock between dozing and listening to the cannon i heard a new sound a strange sound something so awful that i almost felt my hair creep with horror it was a man crying in the room under mine through the blackness of the hour before dawn a cry came stealing mon fils mon fils out of the night it came that sudden terrific revelation of what is going on everywhere beneath the outward calm of this nation of heroes and one had not realized it because one had seen so few tears one had almost failed to understand in the outer calm of the belgians what agony went on beneath and now in the midnight the veil is torn aside and i see a human heart in extremis writhing with agony groaning as the wounded never groan stricken bleeding prostrate overwhelmed with the enormity of its sorrow mon fils mon fils since i heard that old man weeping i want to creep to the feet of christ and the mother of christ and implore their healing for these poor innocent broken hearts trodden under the brutal feet of another race of human beings at four unable to sleep i rose and dressed and went downstairs in the dim unswept palm court i saw a bearded man with two umbrellas walking feverishly up and down while the sleepy night porter leaned against a pillar yawning watching for the cab that the chasse had gone to look for it came at last and the bearded gentleman with a sigh stepped in and drove away into the dusky dawn a look of unutterable sadness seeming to cloak his face and form as he disappeared il est triste c'est monsieur là commented our voluble little flemish porter he is a minister of the government and he must leave antwerp he must depart for ostend his boat leaves at five o'clock this morning so the government is really moving out i think to myself mechanically a little boy runs in from the chill dawn-lit streets it is only half past four but a flemish paper has just come out at lotste news the boy throws it on the table where i sit writing to my sister in england who is anxious for my safety i struggle to find out what message lies between those queer flemish words the tustand de antwerp is sehr ernstig what does it mean sehr ernstig is it good is it bad i don't know the word i call to the night porter and he comes out and translates to me and as i glean the significance of the news i admire that peasant boy's calm la situation à anvers est grave he says the burgomaster announces to the population that the bombardment of antwerp and its environs is imminent 
it is understood of course translating literally that neither the threat nor the actual bombardment will have any effect on the strength of our resistance which will continue to the very last extremity so we know the worst now antwerp is not to hand herself over to the germans she is going to fight to the death well we are glad of it we know it is the only thing she could have done and now the hotel wakes right up and dozens of sleepy worn hollow-cheeked officers and soldiers in dirty boots come down the red carpeted stairs clamouring for their cafe au lait the morning is very cold and they shiver sometimes but they are better after the coffee and i watch them all go off smoking cigarettes poor souls poor souls after the coffee smoking cigarettes they hurry away to the day is past sunrise now and floods of golden light stream over the city where already great crowds are moving backwards and forwards cabs drive up continually to the great railway station opposite with piles of luggage and i think dreamily how very like they are to london four-wheelers taking the family away to the seaside and still the city remains marvellously calm in spite of the ever-increasing movements people are going away in hundreds and thousands but they are going quietly calmly processions of black-robed nuns file along the avenues under the fading trees long lines of belgian cyclists flash by in an opposite direction in their gay yellow and green uniforms the blue and red of the french and english banners never look brighter as the wind plays with them and the sunlight sparkles on them while the great black and red and gold belgian flags lend that curious note of sombre dignity to the crowded streets but not a word of regret from any one that is the belgian way belgians all to-day i kneel at your feet o oh god what those people are going through god what they are suffering and to suffer how can they bear it where do they get their heroism is it it must be from above chapter thirty one the city is shelled that day seated in wicker chairs in the palm court we held a council of war all the war correspondents who were left the question was whether the hotel terminus was not in too dangerous a position its extreme nearness to the great railway station made its shelling almost inevitable when the bombardment of the city began in earnest we argued a lot one suggested one hotel one another to be directly northward was clearly desirable as the shells would come from southward mr cherry curtain mr cleary and mr marshall decided on the queen's hotel somewhere near the quay their point was that it would be easier to get away from there mr robinson and mr phillips refused to change from the terminus mr fox mr lucian arthur jones and myself chose the wagner as being in the most northerly direction the farthest away from the forts and the nearest to the breda gate which led to holland in the moonlight after dinner taking my canary with me i moved to my new quarters accompanied to the doors by that little band of englishmen cherry curtain carrying my parrot it was then ten o'clock strange things were to happen before we met again precisely at eleven the first shell fell whiz it fled in a fury across the sky and burst somewhere in the direction of the cathedral as it exploded i shut my eyes clenched my hands and sank on the floor by my bedside saying to myself god i'm dead and i thought i was too the enormity of that sound sensation seemed to belong to a transition from this world to the next it scarcely seemed possible to pass through that noise and come out alive that was the first shell and others followed quickly the hotel was alive immediately sleep was impossible i crept down into the vestibule it was all dark save for one little light at the porter's door i got a chair drew it close to the light and sat down i had a notebook and pencil and to calm and control myself and not let my brain run riot i made notes of exactly what people said i sat there all night long every now and then the doors would burst open and men and women would rush in once it was two slim elegant ladies in black with white fox stoles who had run from their house because a shell had set fire to the house next door they came into the pitch black vestibule moving about by the little point of light made by their tiny electric torch 
they asked for a room there was none so they asked to sit in the dark empty restaurant and as i saw them disappear into that black room where many refugees were already gathered sleeping on chairs and floors and tables i could not help being amazed at the strangeness of it all the unlikeness of it all to life these two gently nurtured sisters with their gentle manners their white furs their electric light gliding noiselessly along the burning beshelled streets and asking for a room in the first hotel they came to without a word about terror and with expressions on their faces that utterly belied the looks of fright and terror that the stage has almost convinced us are the real thing swing goes the door and in comes a man who asks the porter a question is monsieur l here oui monsieur replies the porter where is he he is in bed go to him and tell him that a shell has just fallen on the bank of Anvers. tell him to rise and come out at once he is a bank official and he must come and help to save the papers before the bank is burned down tell him monsieur m the manager came for him swing and the bank manager has gone through the door again out into that black and red shrieking night swing again and three people hurry in three belgians father mother and a little fair-haired girlie whom they hold by each hand while the father cradles a big box of hard cash under one arm the shells are falling all around our home they say the porter points to the restaurant door merci bien and je vous remercie beaucoup murmur father and mother they vanish into the dark unlit restaurant with its white tablecloths making pale points athwart the stygian blackness of the huge room then an englishman comes down the stairs behind me flapping his burberry rainproof overcoat he is a war correspondent what a smell he says to the porter is gas escaping somewhere no sir says the porter pulling his black moustache he is very distrait and hardly gives the famous war correspondent a thought it is gas persists the war correspondent there must be a leakage somewhere he opens the door a horrible whiff of burning petroleum and smoke blows in and a belgian soldier enters also what's the smell asks the war correspondent the germans are dropping explosives on the city trying to set fire to it answers the belgian good lord i must have a look says the war correspondent he goes out two wounded officers come down the stairs behind me bill please porter how much we must be off now to the forts don't know the bill says the porter i'm new the other man ran away he didn't like shells you can pay some other time messieurs bien says the officers they swing their dark cloaks across their shoulders and pass out they come back no more no never any more then an old old man limps in on the arm of a young ever young sister of mercy he is deaf and dumb she says i found him and brought him here he will be killed in the streets her smile makes sunshine all over the blackness of that haunted hall the mercy of it the sweetness of it the holiness are something one can never forget as guiding the old man she leads him into the dark restaurant and tends him through the night then again the door swings open the petroleum tanks have been set on fire by the belgians themselves says a big man with a big moustache this is the end he is the proprietor himself and here up from the stairs behind us that lead down into the cellars comes his wife wrapped in furs henri i heard your voice i am going i cannot stand it i shall flee to holland with little marie put me into the motor-car my legs will not carry me i fear for the child so much a kiss and she and little marie flee away through the madness of the night towards the breda gate and the safety of some dutch village across the border every now and then i would open the swing doors and fly like mad on tiptoe to the corner of the avenue of commerce and there casting one swift glance right and left i would take in the awful panorama of scarlet flames they were leaping now over the marche aux souliers the street which corresponds with our strand while i watched i heard the shrieking rush of one shell after another any one of which might of course well have fallen where i stood but i knew they wouldn't i felt as safe and secure there in that shell-swept corner as if i had been a child again at home in silent sleepy far-away australia the fact is when you are in the midst of danger with shells bursting round you and the city on fire and the germans closing in on you and your friends and home 
many hundreds of miles away your brain works in an entirely different way from when you are living safely in your peaceful midlands quite unconsciously one's ego asserts itself in danger until it seems that one carries within one a world so important so limitless and immortal that it appears invincible before hurt or death this is an illusion of course but what a beautiful and merciful one when danger comes your way this illusion will begin to weave a sort of fairy haze around you making you feel that those shrieking shells can never fall on you seldom indeed while i was at the front did i hear any one say i'm afraid how deeply and compassionately considerate nature is to us all she has supplied us with a store of emotional glands and fitted us up with many a varying sensation of which curiosity is the liveliest and strongest then when it comes to a race between fear and curiosity in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred curiosity wins hands down in real danger our curiosity and our unconscious but deep-seated belief in the ego carry us right over the frightful terrors that we imagine we should feel were we thinking the thing out quietly in a safe land then we tremble and shiver then we remember the word scream then we understand the meaning of fear then we run in our thoughts into caves and cellars but when the real thing comes we put our heads out of the windows we run out into the streets we go towards danger and not away from it driven thither by the mighty emotion of curiosity which when all is said and done is one of the most delightful because the most electrifying of all human sensations is this brutal is it hard-hearted is it callous indifferent cruel no for it bears no relation to our feelings for other people it only relates to our own sensations about ourselves when a group of wounded belgians comes limping along you look into their hollow blackened faces you feel your heart break and all your soul seems to dissolve in one mighty longing to die for these people who have sacrificed their all for you and you run to them you help them all you can you experience a passionate desire to give them everything you have you turn out your pockets for them you search for something anything that will help them no you are not callous because you are curious quite the reverse in fact you are curious because you are alive because you dwell in this one earth and because you are created with the sense that you have a right to see and hear all the strange and wonderful things all the terrors as well as all the glories that go to make up human existence not to care not to want to see not to want to know that is the callousness beyond redemption end of chapter thirty one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapters thirty two through thirty five of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirty two thursday thursday is a queer day a day of no beginning and no ending it is haunted by such immense noise that it loses all likeness to what we know in ordinary life as a day the thing that comes in between two nights it is in fact nothing but one cataclysmal bang and shriek of shells and shrapnel the earth seems to break open from its centre every five minutes or so and my brain begins to formulate to itself a tremendous sense of height and space as well as of noise until i feel as though i am in touch with the highest skies as well as with the lowest earth because things that seem to belong essentially to earth are now happening in the skies the roof of the world is now enacting a role that is just as strange and just as surprising as if the roof of a theatre had suddenly begun to take part in a drama one looks above as often as one looks below or around one flinging themselves forward with thin whinging cries like millions of mosquitoes on the attack the shrapnel rushes perpetually overhead and the high explosive shells pour down upon the city deafening stupefying until at last by the very immensity of their noise they gradually lose their power to affect one even though they break all round 
instead of listening to the bombardment i find myself listening crossly to the creaking of our lift which makes noises exactly like those of the shrapnel outside in fact when i am in my bedroom and the lift is going up and down i really don't know which is lift and which is shrapnel seven o'clock on thursday morning the bombardment goes on fiercely but i forget about it here in the big bare smoky cafe because i cannot hear the lift a waiter brings me some coffee and i stand and drink it and look about me the cafe is surrounded with glass doors and through these doors i see thousands and thousands of people hurrying for dear life along the roads as time goes on their numbers increase until they are flowing by as steadily as some ceaseless black stream moving hollandwards men women children nuns priests motor-cars carriages cabs carts drays trolleys perambulators every species of human being and of vehicle goes hurrying past the windows and always the vehicles are laden to the very utmost with their freight of human life one's brain reels before the immensity of this thing that is happening here a city is being evacuated by a million inhabitants the city is in flames and shells are raining down on it yet the cook is making soup in the kitchen among the human beings struggling onwards towards the breda gate which will lead them to holland making strange little notes in the middle of the human beings i see every now and then some poor pathetic animal moving along in timid bewilderment a sheep a dog a donkey a cow a horse more cows perhaps than anything big simple wandering cows trudging along behind desolate little groups of peasants with all their little worldly belongings tied up in a big blue and white check handkerchief while crash over their heads goes on the cannonading from the forts and with each fresh shock the vast concourse of fleeing people starts and hurries forward it seems to me as though the end of the world will be very like to-day a huge gun carriage crowded with people is passing it is twenty feet long and drawn by two great bulky flemish horses sitting all along the middle with great wood stakes fixed along the edges to keep them from falling out are different families getting away into holland fathers mothers children two men go by with a clothes basket covered with a blanket dozens of beautiful dogs bereft of their collars in this final parting with their masters run wildly back and forth along the roads a boy with a bicycle is wheeling an old man on it three wounded blue and scarlet soldiers march along desolately carrying brown paper parcels belgian boy scouts in khaki with yellow handkerchiefs round their necks flash past on bicycles a man pushes a dog-cart with his three children and his wife in it while the yellow dog trots along underneath his tongue out a black-robed priest rides by mounted on a great chestnut mare with a scarlet saddle-cloth all the dramas of aeschylus pale into insignificance before this scene it is more than a procession of human beings it is a procession of broken hearts of torn bleeding souls and ruined homes of desolate lives of blighted hopes and grey grim despair grim grey despair in a thousand shapes and forms and ever it hurries along the roads ever it blocks the hotel windows casting its thick shadows as the sun rises in the heavens defying the black smoke palls that hang athwart the skies sometimes i find tears streaming down my cheeks and as they splash on my hands i look at them stupidly and wonder what they are and why they come for no one can think clearly now once it is the sight of a little young childlike nun guarding an old tottering white-bearded man who is dumb as well as deaf and who can only walk with short little halting steps is she really going to try and get him to holland i wonder chapter thirty three the endless day years seem to have passed yet it is still thursday morning ten o'clock the horror darkens we know the worst now antwerp is doomed nothing can save her poor beautiful stately city that has seemed to us all so utterly impregnable all these months the evacuation goes on desperately but the crowds fleeing northwards are diminishing visibly because some five hundred thousands have already gone 
the great avenues with their autumn yellow trees and white tall splendid houses grow bare and deserted over the city creeps a terrible look an aspect so poignant so pathetic that it reminds me of a dying soldier passing away in the flower of his youth the very walls of the high white houses the very flags of the stony grey streets seem to know that antwerp has fallen victim to a tragic fate her men women and children must desert her her homes must stand silent cold and lonely waiting for the enemy her great hotels must be emptied her shops and factories must put up their shutters all the bright gay cheerful optimistic life of this city that i have grown to love with an indescribable tenderness during the long weeks that i have spent within her fortified area is darkened now with despair of the ultimate arrival of the germans there is no longer any doubt whether they take the town on a surrender or by bombardment or by assault i put on my hat and gloves and go out into the streets oh god what a golden day unbearable is the glitter of this sunlight shining over the agony of a nation chapter thirty four i decide to stay for the moment the bombardment has ceased entirely these little pauses are almost quaint in their preciseness one can count on them quite confidently not to be broken by stray shells and in the pause i am rushing along the avenue of commerce trying to get round to the hotel where all my belongings are when i run into three englishmen with their arms full of bags and overcoats and umbrellas and for a moment or two we stand there at the corner opposite the gare centrale all talking together breathlessly it was only last night at seven o'clock that we all dined together at the terminus but since then a million years have rolled over us we have been snatched into one of history's most terrific pages and we all have a burning breathless saga of our own hanging on our lips crying to be told aloud before the world we all fling out disjointed remarks and i hear of the awful night in that quarter of the city how are you going to get away and you how are you going to get away the tall slight young man with the little dark moustache is mr jeffreys of the daily mail who has been staying at the hotel of europe with him is the popular mr perry robinson of the times the third is mr p phillips of the daily news i have just come from the etat majeure mr jeffreys tells me hurriedly there is not a ghost of a hope now every one has gone we must get away at once i am not going i say for suddenly the knowledge has come to me that i cannot leave the greatest of my dramas before the curtain rolls up in the last scene in vain they argue tell me i am mad i am not going so they say good-bye and leave me chapter thirty five the city surrenders antwerp has surrendered it is friday morning all hope is over the germans are coming in at half-past one well says mr lucian arthur jones at last at the end of a long discussion between him and mr frank fox and myself if you have really decided to stay i am going to give you this key it belongs to the house of some wealthy belgians who have fled to england there is plenty of food and stores of all kind in the house if need be you might take shelter there and he gave me the key and the address and i luckily for myself i remembered it afterwards with a queer little choke in my throat i stood on the hotel doorstep watching those two englishmen on their bicycles whirling away down the avenue of commerce in a moment they were swallowed up from my sight in the black pall of cloud and smoke that hung above the city dropping from the leaden skies like long black fringes and hovering over the streets like thick funeral veils so they were gone the die was cast i was alone now all alone in the fated city at first the thought was a little sickening but after a minute it gave me a certain amount of relief as i realized that i could go ahead with my plans without causing any one distress to feel that those two men had been worrying about my safety and were worrying still was a very wretched sensation they had enough to think of on their own account somehow or other they had now to get to a telegraph wire and send their newspapers in england the story of antwerp's fall and the task before them was herculean 
the nearest wires were in holland and they had nothing but their bicycles turning back into the big dim deserted restaurant i went to look for the old patron whose black eyes dilated in her sad old yellow face at the sight of me in my dark blue suit and white veil floating from my little black hat what madame but they told me the english have departed you have not gone with them listen madame i want you to help me i am writing a book about the war and to see the germans come into antwerp is something i ought not to miss i want to stay here mais c'est dangereux madame vous êtes anglaise well, i'm going to change that i'm going to be belgian i want you to let me pretend i'm a servant in your hotel i'll put on a cap and apron and i'll do anything you like then i'll be able to see things for myself it'll only be for a few hours i'll get away this afternoon in the motor but i must see the incoming of the germans first the old woman seemed too bewildered to protest and afterwards i doubted if she had really understood me from the way she acted later on just at that moment henri drove up in the motor and came to a standstill in front of the hotel the poor fellow looked more dead than alive his pie-coloured face was hollow his lips were dry his eyes standing out of his head he was so exhausted that he could scarcely step out of the car i am sorry i am late he groaned but it was impossible impossible you needn't worry about me henri i whispered to him reassuringly i'm not going to try to get out of antwerp for several hours in fact i am going to wait to see the germans come in henri showed no surprise there was no surprise left in him to show bon he said because to tell you the truth madame i wouldn't go out of the city again just now i couldn't do it getting to holland indeed he went on between gasps as he drank off one cup of coffee after another it's like trying to get through hell to get to paradise i've been seven hours driving about four miles there and back it was horrible it was unbelievable the roads are blocked so thick that there are no roads left a million people are out there struggling fighting and trying to get onwards lying down on the earth fainting dying and he suddenly sat down upon a chair and fell fast asleep the sharp crack crack of rifle fire woke him about five minutes later and we all rushed to the door to see what was happening oh nerve-racking sight across the grey square through the grey-black morning dogs were rushing their tongues out the gendarmes pursuing them were shooting them down to save them the worse horrors of starvation that might befall them if they were left alive in the deserted city at the mercy of the germans madame x a sad distinguished-looking woman a refugee from lierre whose house had been shelled and who was destined to play a strange part in my story later on now came over to us and implored henri to take her old mother in his car round to the hospital she is eighty-four ma pauvre mère we tried to take her to holland but it was impossible but now that the bombardment has ceased and the worst is over it seems wiser to remain in the hospital the mare will be surely safe as for us my husband and i truly we have lost our all there is nothing left to fear i offered to accompany the old lady to the hospital and presently we started off henri and i and the old wrinkled flemish woman and the buxom young flemish servant jeanette we drove along the avenue of commerce down the avenue de kaiser towards the hospital the town was dead not a soul was to be seen the marche aux souliers was all ablaze i saw the tavern royale lying on the ground next to it was the hotel of europe bomb shattered and terrific in its ruins i thought of mr jeffreys of the daily mail and shivered that had been his hotel the air reeked with petroleum and smoke at last we got to the hospital the doorstep was covered with blood and red wet blood was in drops and patches along the entrance as i went in an unforgettable sight met my eyes i found myself in a great dim ward with the yellow lurid skies looking in through its enormous windows and its beds full of wounded and dying soldiers and just as i entered a white-robed sister of mercy was bending over a bed giving the last unction to a dying man some brave petty belge who had shed his life-blood for his city alas in vain all the ordinary nurses had gone the sisters of mercy alone remained and suddenly it came to me like a strain of heavenly music that death held no terrors for these women life had no fears softly they moved about in their white robes 
their benign faces shining with the look of the cross in that supreme moment after the hell of shot and shell after the thousands of wounded and dead after the endless agonies of attack and repulse and attack and defeat and surrender something quite unexpected was here emerging the essence of the eternal feminine the woman supreme in her sheer womanhood and like a bright bird rising from the ashes the spirit of it went fluttering about that appalling ward the trained and untrained hospital nurses devoted as they were and splendid and useful beyond all words had perforce fled from the city either to accompany their escaping hospitals or beset by quite natural fears of the hun's brutality to their kind but the sisters of mercy had no fears the cross stood between them and anything that might come to them and that was written in their faces their shining gentle faces ah yes the priests and the half-forgotten sisters of mercy have indeed come back to their own in this greatest of all wars moving between the long lines of soldiers beds i paused at the side of a little bomb broken belgian boy whose dark eyes opened suddenly to meet mine i think he must have been wandering poor little child and had come back with a start to life and seeing a face at his bedside he thought perhaps that i was german in a hoarse voice he gasped out raising himself in terror je suis civile poor child poor child the fright in his voice was heartbreaking it said that if the alboches took him for a soldat they would shoot him or carry him away into germany i bent and kissed him je suis civile he was not more than six years old in another room of the hospital i found about forty children little children varying from six months to five years some gentle nuns were playing with them le pauvre petit said one of the sisters compassionately they've all been lost or left behind there's no one to claim them so we have brought them here to look after them and the baby gurgled and laughed and gave a sudden leap in the sweet nun's arms out of the hospital again over the blood-stained doorstep and back into the car there were a few devoted doctors and priests standing about in silence in the flower-wreathed passage entrance to the hospital they were waiting for the end waiting for the germans to come in i can see them still standing there in their white coats or long black cassocks staring down the passage a great hush hung over everything and through the hush we slid into the awful streets again with the houses lying on the ground before we had gone far we heard shouts and turning my head i discovered some wounded soldiers limping along a side road who were begging us to give them a lift towards the boat we filled the car so full that we all had to stand up except those who could not stand bandaged heads and faces were all around me while bandaged soldiers rode on the footboard clinging to whatever they could get hold of and then we moved towards the quay it was heartbreaking to have to deny the scores of limping broken men who shouted to us to stop but as soon as we had deposited one load we went back and picked up others and ran them back to the quay and that we did time after time a few of the men were our own tommies but most were belgians backwards and forwards we rushed backwards and forwards and now that dear henri's eyes were shining his sallow pie-coloured face was lit up he no longer looked tired and dull and heavy he was on fire with excitement and the car raced like mad backwards and forwards backwards and forwards venturing right out towards the forts and back again to the quay until at last reaction set in with henri and he was obliged to take the car back to the hotel where he fell in a crumpled heap in a corner of the restaurant as we came in the patron handed me a note while you were out she said looking at me sorrowfully monsieur fox and monsieur jones returned on their bicycles to look for you then i read mr fox's kind message we have managed to secure passages on a special military boat for flushing that leaves at half past eleven and of course we have got one for you we have come back for you but you are not here your car has arrived so you will be all right i hope you have seen the bombardment through bravo i was glad they had got away but for myself some absolutely irresistible force held me to antwerp and i now slipped quietly out of the hotel and started off on a solitary walk End of chapter 35 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine
Chapters thirty six through forty of A Woman's Experiences in the Great War by Louise Mack. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter thirty six A Solitary Walk. Surely, surely, this livid, copper tinted noon tide hanging over Antwerp was conceived in Hades as a presentation of the world's last day indescribably terrible in tone and form because of its unearthly qualities of smoke shrapnel petroleum fumes and broken dissipated clouds the darkened skies seemed of themselves to offer every element of tragedy while the city lying stretched out beneath in that agony of silence that lasted from twelve o'clock to half-past one was one vast study in blood fire ruined houses ruined pathways smoke appalling odours heartbreak and surrender the last steamer had gone from the port the last of the fleeing inhabitants had departed by the breda gate all that was left now was the empty city waiting for the entrance of the germans empty were the streets empty were the boats crowded desolately on the scheldt empty were those hundreds of deserted motor-cars heaped in great weird pathetic piles down at the water's edge as useless as though they were perambulators because there were no chauffeurs to drive them empty was the air of sound except for the howling of dogs that ran about in terror crying miserably for their owners who had been obliged to desert them through the emptiness of the air when the dogs were not howling resounded only a terrible ferocious silence that seemed to call up mocking memories of the noise the shells had been making incessantly ever since two nights ago it was an hour never to be forgotten an hour that could never never come again i kept saying that to myself as i continued my solitary walk solitary walk for the first time in a lifetime that bit of journalese took on a meaning so deep and elemental that it went right down to the very roots of the language the whole city was mine i seemed to be the only living being left i passed hundreds of tall white stately houses all shattered and locked and silent and deserted i went through one wide deadly street after another i looked up and down the great paralyzed quays i stared through the yellow avenues of trees i heard my own footsteps echoing echoing the ghosts of five hundred thousand people floated before my vision for weeks for months i had seen these five hundred thousand people laughing and talking in these very streets and yesterday and the day before i had seen them fleeing for their lives out of the city anywhere anywhere out of the reach of the shells and the germans and i wondered where they were now those five hundred thousand ghosts were they still struggling and tramping and falling along the roads to holland as i wondered i kept on seeing their faces in these their doorways and at these their windows i saw them seated at these their cafes along the side paths i heard their rich liquid antwerp voices speaking french with a soft swift rush or twanging away at flemish with the staccato insistence of flanders i felt them all around me in all the deserted streets at all the shuttered windows it was too colossal a thing to realize that the five hundred thousand of them were not in their city any longer that they were not hiding behind the silence and the shutters but were out in the open world beyond the city gates fighting their way to holland and freedom and now i wondered why i was here myself listening to my echoing footsteps through the hollow silences of the ville morte why had i not gone with them then as i walked through the dead city i knew why i was there it was because the gods had been keeping for me all these years the supreme gift of this solitary walk when i should share her death pangs with this city i so passionately loved that was the truth i had been unable to tear myself away if antwerp suffered i desired to suffer too i desired to go hand in hand with her in whatever happened when the germans came marching in many a time before had i loved a city loved her for her beauty her fairness her spirit her history her personal significance to me pietrasanta ravenna viviana poppi 
locarno verona florence venice rome sydney colombo arles london parma for one reason or another i have worshipped you all in your turn one represents beauty one work one love one sadness one joy one the escape from the ego one the winging of ambition one sheer aestheticism one liquid limpid gladness at discovering oneself alive but antwerp was the first and only city that i loved because she let me share her sufferings with her right through the valley of death right up to the moment when she breathed her last sigh as a city and passed into the possession of her conquerors suddenly through the terrific inconceivable lull hurtling with a million memories of noises i heard footsteps heavy dragging yet hurried and looking up a side street opposite the burning ruins of the chaussee de soliers i saw two belgian soldiers limping along making towards the breda gate both were wounded and the one who was less bad was helping the other they were hollow-cheeked hollow-eyed starved ghastly with a growth of black beard and the ravages of smoke and powder all over their poor faded blue uniforms and little scarlet and yellow caps they were dazed worn out finished famished nearly fainting but as they hurried past me the younger man flung out one breathless question est-ce que la ville est prise it seemed to be plucked from some page of homer its potency was so epic so immense that i felt as if i must remain there forever rooted to the spot where i had heard it it went thrilling through my being it struck me harder than any shell seeming to fell me for a moment to the ground then i rose permeated with a sense of living in the world's greatest drama and feeling not seeing art and life and death and literature inextricably and terribly yet gloriously mixed till one could not be told from the other for he who had given his life whose blood dropped red from him as he moved knew not what had happened to his city he was only a soldier his was to fight not to know est que la ville est prise it is months since then but i still hear that perishing soldier's voice breaking over his terrific query presently rousing myself i ran onwards and walked beside the men giving my arm to the younger one who took it mechanically without thanking me i liked that and altogether we hastened through the livid greyness along the avenue of commerce towards the breda gate in dead silence we laboured onwards it was still a solitary walk for neither of my companions said a word only sometimes without speaking one of them would turn his head and look backwards without stopping at the red flames reflected in the black sky to northward suddenly to our amazement we saw a cart coming down a side street containing a man and a little girl i ran like lightning towards it terrified lest it should pass but that man in the cart had a soul he had seen the bleeding soldiers he was stopping of himself he offered to take me too quick quick mes amis he said the germans are coming in at the other end even now the petite here was lost and thanks to the bon dieu i have just found her that is why i am so late as the soldiers crawled painfully into the little cart i whispered to the elder one do you know where your king is monsieur ah the flash in that hollow eye it was worth risking one's life to see it and to hear the love that leapt into the belgian's voice as he answered truly i know not exactly but wherever he is i do know this our king is on the battlefield oh oh beautiful speech on the battlefield where else would albert be indeed on the battlefield i put it beside the epic question together they lie there in my heart imperishable and more precious than any written poem chapter thirty seven enter les allemands it is now half past one and i am back at the hotel at least my watch says it is half past one but all the many great gold-faced clocks in antwerp have stopped the day before and their hands point mockingly to a dozen different times one knows that only some ghastly happening could have terrified them into such wild mistakes heartbreaking it is as well as appalling to see those distracted timepieces and their ignorance of the fatal hour half past one 
and the clocks point pathetically to eleven or eight or five inside the great dim restaurant a pretence of lunch is going on between the little handful of people left everybody sits at one table the chauffeur henri the refugees from lierre their maidservant jeanette the proprietor and his old sister and his two little grandchildren and their father the porter and a couple of very ugly old belgians who seem to belong to nobody in particular and have sprung from nobody knows where we have some stewed meat with potatoes a rough ill-cooked dish this is the first bad meal i have had in antwerp but what seems extraordinary to me is that there should be any meal at all as we sit round the table in the darkness of that lurid noontide the dead city outside looks in through the broken windows and there comes over us all a tension so great that nobody can utter a word we are all thinking the same thing we are thinking with our dull addled clouded brains that the germans will be here at any minute and then suddenly the waiter cries out in a loud voice from across the restaurant les allemands we all spring to our feet we stand for a moment petrified through the great uncurtained windows of the hotel we see one grey figure and then another walking along the side path up the avenue of commerce they have come says every one after a moment's hesitation monsieur claude the proprietor and his old sister move out into the street and mechanically i and all the others follow as if afraid to be left alone within chapter thirty eight my son and now through the livid sunless silences of the deserted city still reeking horribly of powder shrapnel smoke and burning petroleum the germans are coming down the avenues to enter into possession here they come a long grey line of foot soldiers and mounted men all with pink roses or carnations in their grey tunics suddenly a long lidded baker's cart dashes across the road at a desperate rate wheeled by a poor old belgian whose face is so wild that i whisper as she passes close to me is somebody ill in your cart without stopping without looking even her haggard eyes full of despair she mutters dead my son he was a soldat then she hurries on at a run now to find a spot where she can hide or bury her beloved before the germans are all over the city chapter thirty nine the reception a singular change now comes over the silent deserted city first a few stray belgians show on the side paths then more appear and more still and as the procession of the germans comes onwards through the town i discover little groups of men and women sprung out of the very earth it seems to me all along the avenue of commerce gathered in the heavy greyness on the side paths are little straggling groups of anversois as i look at them i suddenly experience a sensation of suffocation am i dreaming or are they really smiling those people smiling to the germans then to my horror i see two old men waving gaily to that long grey oncoming line of men and horses and then i see a woman flinging flowers to an officer who catches them and sticks them into his horse's bridle at that moment i realize i am in for some extraordinary experience something that brussels has not in the least prepared me for chapter forty the laughter of brutes along the avenue the grey uniforms are slowly marching headed by fair blue-eyed arrogant officers on splendid roan horses and the clang and clatter of them breaks up the silence with a dramatic sharpness the silence that has never been heard in antwerp since as they come onward the germans look from left to right i stand on the pavement watching drawn there by some irresistible force eagerly i search their faces looking now for the horrid marks of the brute triumphant gloating over his prey for the brute triumphant is not there to-day for these thousands of germans who march into antwerp on this historic friday are characterized by an aspect of dazed incredulity that almost amounts to fear they all wear pink roses or carnations in their coats 
or have pink flowers wreathed about their horses harness or round their gun carriages and provision motors and sometimes they burst into subdued singing but it is obvious that the enormous buildings of antwerp and its aspect of great wealth and solidarity fairly take away their breath and their eyes quite plainly say that they cannot understand how they come to be in possession of this great rich wonderful prize they look to left and right their blue eyes full of curiosity as i watch i think of bismarck's remark about london what a city to loot that same thought is in the eyes of all these thousands of germans as they come in to take possession of antwerp and they suddenly burst into song papachen and die wacht am rhein but never very cheerily or very loudly do they sing i fancy at that moment experiencing as they are that phase of naive and genuine amazement the germans are really less brute than usual and then just as i am thinking that i meet with my first personal experience of the meaning of german brute a young officer has espied a notice-board high above a cafe on the left a delighted grin overspreads his face and he quickly draws his companion's attention to it together the two gaze smiling at the home-like words wintergarten their blue eyes glued upon the board as they ride along the contrast between their gladness and that old belgian mother's agony suddenly strikes through my heart like a knife the pathos and tragedy of it all are too much for me to see this beloved city possessed by germans is too terrible yes standing there in the beautiful avenue of commerce i weep as if it were london itself that the germans were coming into for i have lived for long unforgettable weeks among the belgians at war and i have learned to love and respect them above all peoples and so i stand there in the avenue with tears rolling down my cheeks watching the passing of the grey uniforms with my heart all on fire for poor ruined belgium then looking up i see a young prussian officer laughing at me mockingly as he rides by he laughs and looks away that smart young grey-clad uhlan with roses in his coat then he looks back and laughs again and rides on still laughing mockingly at what he takes to be some poor little belgian weeping over the destruction of her city to me that is an act of brutality that small as it may seem counts for a barbarity as great as any murder germany for that brutal laugh no less than for your outrages you shall pay some day you shall surely pay End of chapter 40, recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapters 41 and 42 of A Woman's Experiences in the Great War by Louise Mack. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 41 Traitors and now i see people gathering round the germans as they come to a halt at the end of the avenue i see people stroking the horses heads and old men and young men smiling and bowing and a few minutes later inside the restaurant of my hotel i witness those extraordinary encounters between the germans and their spies i hear the clink of gold and see the passing of big german notes and i watch the flushed faces of antwerp men who are holding notebooks over the tables to the german officers and drinking beer with them to the accompaniment of loud riotous laughter that is the note struck in the first hour of a german entrance and that is the note all the time as far as the german anversois are concerned before very long i discover that there must have been hundreds of people hiding away inside those silent houses waiting for the germans to come in the horror of it makes me feel physically ill the procession comes to a standstill at last in front of a little green square by the athene and next moment a group of grey-clad officers with roses in their tunics are hurrying towards the hotel and begin parleying with m claude our proprietor i expect to see him icily resolute against receiving them but to my surprise he seems affable he smiles he waves his hand as he talks he is eager deferential and quite unmistakably friendly friendly even to the point of fawning 
turning he flings open his doors with a bow and in a few minutes the germans are crowding into his great restaurants cries of beer resounded on all sides outside on the walls of the theatre Framont, the huns are at it already with their endless proclamations note by reader at this point louise mack inserts a proclamation by the germans in three different languages german flemish and french translated by expatriate End of note. residence of antwerp the german army enters your city as victors none of your citizens shall be harmed and your property shall be protected if you abstain from hostility any insubordination however shall be punished according to martial law possibly resulting in the destruction of your beautiful city signed the commander of german troops chapter forty two what the waiting maid saw at this point i crept down stealthily into the kitchen and proceeded to disguise myself i put on first of all a big blue and red check apron then i pinned a black shawl over my shoulders i parted my hair in the middle and twisted it into a little tight knot at the back and i tied a blue and white handkerchief under my chin looking thoroughly hideous i slipped back into the restaurant where i occupied myself with washing and drying glasses behind the counter it was a splendid point of observation and no words can tell of the excitement i felt as i stooped over my work and took in every detail of what was going on in the restaurant but sometimes the glasses nearly fell from my fingers so agonizing were the sights i saw in that restaurant at antwerp on the afternoon of october ninth the fatal friday i saw old men and young men crowding round the germans they sat at the tables with them drinking laughing and showing their notebooks which the germans eagerly examined the air resounded with their loud riotous talk all shame was thrown aside now for months these spies must have lived in terror as they carried on their nefarious espionage within the walls of antwerp but now their terror was over the germans were in possession they had nothing to fear so they drank deeply and more deeply still trying to banish from their eyes that furtive look that marked them for the sneaks they were some of them were old greybeards some of them were chic young men i recognized several of them as people i had seen about in the streets of antwerp during these past two months and again and again burning tears gathered in my eyes as i realized how antwerp had been betrayed as i am turning this terrible truth over in my mind i get another violent shock i see three englishmen standing in the middle of the now densely crowded restaurant at first i imagine they are prisoners and a wave of sorrow flows over me for i know those three men they are the three english marines who called in at this hotel yesterday seeing that they were englishmen by their uniforms i called to them to keep back a savage dog that was trying to get at the cockatoo that i had rescued from lierre they told me they were with the rest of the english flying corps at the forts their english had been perfect never for a minute had i suspected them and now here they are still in their english uniforms and little black peaked english caps talking german with the germans and sitting at a little table drinking drinking and laughing boisterously as only germans can laugh when they hold their spying councils english marines indeed they have stolen our uniforms somehow and have probably betrayed many a secret within the next few hours i am forced to the conclusion that antwerp is one great nest of german spies and over and over again i recognize the faces of old men and young men whom i have seen passing as honest antwerp citizens all these months seated all by himself at a little table sits a belgian general who has been brought in prisoner in his sadness and dignity he makes an unforgettable picture his black beard is sunk forward on his chest his eyes are lowered his whole being seems to be wrapped in a profound melancholy that yet has something magnificent and distinguished about it when compared with the riotous elation of his conquerors nobody speaks to him he speaks to nobody with his dark blue cloak flung proudly across his shoulder he remains mute and motionless as a statue his dark eyes staring into space i wonder what his thoughts are as he sees before him 
unashamed and unafraid now that german occupation has begun these spies who have bartered their country for gold but whatever he thinks that lonely prisoner he makes no sign his dignity is inviolable his dark bearded face has all the poignancy and beauty of titian's ariosto in the national gallery in london he is a prisoner nobody looks at him nobody speaks to him nobody gives him anything to eat exhaustion is written on his face at last i can bear it no longer i pour out a cup of hot coffee and take a sandwich from the counter then i slip across the restaurant and put the coffee and the sandwich on the little table in front of him a look of flashing gratitude and surprise is in his dark sad eyes as they lift themselves for a moment but i dare not linger the flemish maid with the handkerchief across her head hurries back to her tumblers two little priests have been brought in as prisoners also but they chat cheerily with their captors who look down upon them smilingly showing their big white teeth in a way that i would not like if i were a prisoner none of the prisoners are handcuffed or surrounded they do not seem to be watched they are all left free so free indeed that it is difficult to realize the truth one movement towards the door and they would be shot down like dogs in occupying a town without resistance the germans make themselves as charming as possible obviously those are their orders from headquarters and germans always obey orders extraordinary indeed is the discipline that can turn the brutes of louvain and Ayrshot into the lamb-like beings that took possession of antwerp they asked for everything with marked courtesy even gentleness they paid for everything they got i heard some of the poorer soldiers expressing their surprise at the price of the antwerp beer it's too dear they said but they paid the price for it all the same they always waited patiently until they could be served they never grumbled they never tried to rush the people who were serving them in fact their system was to give no trouble and to create as good an impression as possible on the belgians from the first moment of their entrance the first moment being by far the most important psychologically as the terrified brains of the populace are then most receptive to their impressions of the hated army and anything that could be done to enhance and improve those impressions is more valuable than that at any other time almost the first thing the germans did was to find out the pianos it was not half an hour after they entered antwerp when strains of music were heard music that fell on the ear with a curious shock for no one had played the piano here since the belgian government moved into the fortified town they played beautifully those germans and every now and then they burst into song from the sitting-room in the hotel i heard them singing to the blue danube and the wacht am rhein seemed to come and go at intervals like a late motif to all their doings about four o'clock jeannette the flemish servant whispered to me that henri wanted to speak to me in the kitchen a great misfortune has happened madame said henri agitatedly the germans have seized my car i shall not be able to take you out of antwerp this afternoon but courage to-morrow i will find a cart or a fiacre to-day it is impossible to do anything there is not a vehicle of any kind to be had but to-morrow madame trust henri he will get you away never fear half an hour after the faithful fellow called to me again his pie-coloured face looked dark and miserable the germans have shut the gates all round the city and no one is allowed to go in and out without a german passport he said this was serious relying on my experience in brussels i had anticipated being able to get away even more easily from antwerp because of henri's motor-car but obviously for the moment i was checked as dusk fell and the lights were lit i retired into the kitchen and busied myself cutting bread and butter and still continuing my highly interesting observations on the table lay piles of sausage and presently in came two german officers an old grey-bearded general and a dashing young uhlan lieutenant we want three eggs each said the uhlan roughly addressing himself to me three eggs soft-boiled and some bread with butter with much butter i nodded but dared not answer and the red-faced young lieutenant thinking i did not understand ground his heel angrily and muttered gott when his eyes fell on the sausage and his expression changed as if by magic wurst he ejaculated to the general here their sausage is it was quite funny to see the way these two gallant soldiers 
bent over the sausage their eyes beaming with greedy joy and in ten minutes every german was crying out for sausage and the town was being ransacked in all directions in search of more end of chapter forty two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty three of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter forty three saturday the saddest thing in antwerp is the howling of the dogs thousands have been left shut in the houses when their owners fled and all day and night these poor creatures utter piercing desolate cries that grow louder and more piercing as time goes on it is saturday morning october tenth strange things have happened when i went to my door just now i found it locked from the outside i have tried the other door that is locked too what does it mean i wonder here i am in a little room about twelve feet by six with one window looking on to the back wall of one of the antwerp theatres i can hear the sounds of fierce cannonading going on in the distance but the noise within the hotel close at hand is so loud as to deaden the sounds of battle for the germans are running up and down the corridors perpetually shouting singing stamping and the pianos are going too nobody comes near me i knock at both the doors but gently for i am afraid to draw attention to myself nobody answers the old woman and the two little children have left the room on my right the old man has left the room on my left i am all alone in this little den i dress as well as i can but the room is just a tiny sitting-room there are no facilities for making one's toilette i have to do without washing my face instead i rub it with creme florine and the amount of black that comes off is appalling then i lie down at full length on my mattress and wonder what is going to happen next hour after hour goes by in a corner of the room i discover an english weekly history of the war and lying there on my mattress i read many strange stories that seem somehow to mock a little at these real happenings then voices just outside in the corridor reach me out there two old belgians are talking it is the english who don't want to surrender the fortresses says one they are discussing the fighting which still goes on fiercely in the forts around the city my head aches i am hungry and those big guns are making what the kaiser would call world noises strange thoughts come over me attacking me like samson agonistes deadly swarm of hornets armed in a terrific conflict it doesn't seem to matter much which side is victorious all hatred of the conquerors dies away in fact the conquerors themselves may seem like deliverers since peace comes in with their entrance and i am weak and weary enough at this moment to wish les anglais would give it up let the forts be rendered and let the cannon cease anything for peace for an end of slaughter an end of terror an end of this cruel soul-racking thunder terrible thoughts deadly thoughts do they come to the soldiers thoughts like these heaven help the poor fellows if they do they are more deadly than death for they attack only the immortal part of one leaving the mortal to save itself while they blight and corrode the spirit i am weary i have not slept for five nights and i feel as if i shall never sleep again i dare say that's partly why i have been weak enough to wish for an end of noise it's five o'clock and darkness has set in nobody has been near me i'm still here locked up in this little room i roam about like a caged animal i look from the window the blank back wall of the antwerp theatre meets my eye but a corner of the hotel looks in also and i can see three tiers of windows so i hastily move away in all those rooms there are germans quartered now what if they glanced down here and discovered me i pull the curtains over the window and move back into the room this is saturday afternoon october tenth and all of a sudden a queer thought comes over me october tenth is my birthday i lie down on the mattress again and my thoughts begin dreamily to revolve round an extraordinary psychic mystery that i became conscious of when i was little more than a baby in far away australia i became conscious at the age of four that i heard in my imagination 
the sounds of cannon and i became certain too that those cannon were going to be real cannon some day yes all my life ever since i could think i have heard heavy firing in my ears and have known i was going to be very close to battle some far-off day or other have other people been born with the same belief i wonder i should like so much to know gradually a vast area of speculative psychology opens out before me and like one walking in a world of dreams i lose myself in its dim distances seeking for some light clear opening wherein i can discover the secret of this extraordinary psychic or physiological mystery that has hidden itself for a lifetime in my being i say hidden itself yet though it has kept itself dark and concealed it has always been teasing my subconsciousness with vague queer hints of its presence until at last i have grown used to it and have even arranged a fairly comfortable explanation of its existence between my soul and myself i have told myself that it is something i can never never understand and that it is all the explanation i have ever been able to give to myself of the presence of this uninvited guest who has dwelt for a lifetime in the secret chambers of my intuitions who has hidden there veiled and mysterious never showing a simple feature to betray itself eye lips brow always remaining unseen unknown uninvited unintelligible yet always potent always softly disturbing one's belief in one's ordinary everyday life with that dull roar of cannon which seemed to visualize in my brain with an image of blinding sunlight lying there on the bare mattress on this drear october day which goes down to history as the day on which germany set up her governor in antwerp i begin to wonder if my subliminal consciousness has been trying all these years to warn me that danger would come to me some day to the sound of battle and am i in that danger now is this the moment perhaps that the secret silent guest has tried to show me lay lurking in a wait for me ready to make me fulfil my destiny in some dark and terrible way no i can't believe it i can't see it like that i don't believe that that is what the roar of cannon has been trying to say to me all my life i can't sense danger i won't no i mean i can't my reason assures me there isn't any danger that is going to catch me no matter how it may threaten and then the hornet flies to the attack it says people who are haunted with premonitions nearly always disregard them until too late so occupied am i with these dreams and philosophings that i lie there in the darkness forgetful of time and hunger until i hear voices in the next room and there is the old woman opening my door and the two little yellow-haired children staring in at me curiously the old woman gives me some grapes out of a basket under her bed and a glass of water pauvre enfant she says i am sorry i could bring you no food but the germans are up and down the stairs all day long and i dare not risk them asking me who is that for but why are you so afraid i ask last night you were so nice to me what has happened come tell me the truth alors madame i will tell you you recollect that german who leaned over the counter for such a long time when you were washing glasses yes my lips felt suddenly dry as wood alors madame he said to me that fellow she never speaks who did he mean alors madame he meant you this then i think to myself is what happens to one when one is really frightened the lips turn dry as chips and all because a german has noticed me it is absurd i force a smile perhaps you imagine this i said no because he said to me to-day where is that mädchen who never spoke what did you say she is deaf i told him she does not hear when any one speaks to her so that is why you locked me up c'est ça madame it was my brother who wished it he is very afraid and now madame good night i must put the little girls to bed well i think this is ridiculous i said how long am i to stay here she shook her head and began to unfasten little fair-haired maria's black serge frock pushing her out of my room as she did so with the evident intention of locking me in again but just then someone knocked at the outer door it was madame x who came stealing in drawing the bolt noiselessly behind her i looked in her weary face with its white hair and beautiful blue eyes and saw gentleness and sympathy there and sincerity 
she said mon mari has been talking in the restaurant with a friend of his a danish doctor a red cross doctor madame you understand and oh he is so sorry for you madame and he thinks he can help you to escape he wants to come up and see you for a moment i advise you to see him will you bring him up i said immediately the old patron went on undressing the little girls getting them hurriedly into bed and telling them to be quiet they kept shouting out questions to me and whenever they did so their grandmother would smack them silence les alboches will hear you but they were terribly naughty little girls whenever i spoke they repeated my words in loud mocking voices their sharp little ears told them of my foreign accent and they plucked at every strange note in my voice and repeated it loud and shrill but the grandmother smacked them into silence and pulled the bedclothes up over their faces then a gentle tap and madame x and the danish doctor came stealing in ah how piercing and pathetic was the look i cast on that tall stranger i saw a young fair-haired man in grey clothes with blue eyes and an honest english look quiet kind sincere wearing the red cross badge on his arm i looked and looked then i told myself he was to be trusted in english he said i heard there was an english lady here who wants to get away from antwerp i interrupted sharply please don't speak english the germans are always going up and down the corridor they may hear he smiled at my fears but immediately changed into french to reassure me no no madame you mustn't be alarmed the germans are too busy with themselves to think of anything else just now and i want to help you your queen alexandra is a dane she is of my country and she has kept the bonds very close and strong between denmark and england yes if only for the sake of queen alexandra i want to help you now and i think i can do so if you will pass as my sister i can get a pass for you from the danish consul and that will enable you to leave antwerp in safety may i see your papers i asked him now and i am sure you are sincere but you understand that i would like to see your papers certainly and he brought out his papers of nationality and i saw that he was undoubtedly a dane working under the red cross for the belgians when i had examined his papers i let him examine mine and now i must ask you one thing more he said i must ask for your passport i want to show it to my consul in order to convince him that you are really of british nationality will you give me your passport i am afraid that without it my consul may object to do this thing for me that was an agonized moment i had been told a hundred times by a hundred different people that the one thing one should never do never 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 not under any circumstances was to part with one's passport and here was this gentle dane pleading for mine promising me escape if i would give it i looked up at him as he stood there tall and grave i was not quite sure of him and why because he had spoken english and i still thought that was a dangerous thing to do no i was not quite sure i stood there breathless stupefied trying to think madame x watched me in silence i knew that i must make up my mind one way or the other well i shall trust you i said slowly i put my passport into his hands his face lit up and i watching in that agony of doubt told myself suddenly that he was genuine that was real gladness in his eyes ah madame i do thank you so for trusting me his voice was moved and vibrant he bent and kissed my hand then he put the passport in his pocket to-morrow at three o'clock i will come here for you trust me absolutely i will arrange for a peasant's car or a fiacre and i will myself accompany you to the dutch borders have courage you will soon be in safety ten minutes after he had gone m claude burst into the room his face was black as night and working with rage what is this you have done he cried in a hoarse voice he is speaking with the germans in the restaurant horrible words it seems to me that as long as i live i shall hear them in my ears it is not true i cried it can't be true he is talking to the germans in the restaurant he repeated his rage was undisguised he flung on the table a little packet of english papers that i had given him to hide for me take these i have nothing to do with you you are my sister's affair i have nothing to do with you at all i rushed to him i seized him by the arm but he flung me off and left the room 
in and out of my brain his words went beating in and out in and out the thing was simple clear the dane had gone down to betray me and he had all the evidence in his hands oh fool that i had been i had brought this on myself it was my own unaccountable folly that had led me into this trap at any moment now the germans would come for me all was over i was lost they had my passport in their possession i could deny nothing the game was up i got up and looked at myself in the glass the habit of a lifetime asserted itself for all women look at themselves in the glass frequently and at unexpected times i saw a strange white face gazing at me in the mirror it is all up with you now are you ready for the end prepare yourself get your nerves in order you cannot hope to escape it is either imprisonment or death for you what do you think of that and then at that moment kindly mother nature took possession of the situation and sleep rushed upon me unawares i fell on the mattress and knew no more till a soft knocking at my door awoke me and i saw it was morning a light was filtering in dimly through the window blind i jumped up i was fully dressed having fallen asleep in my clothes madame whispered a voice open the door to suite n'est-ce pas it was the old woman's voice i pulled away the barricading chair and let her in over her shoulder i saw a man it was no german this it was dear pie-coloured henri in a grey suit with a white and black handkerchief swathed round his neck behind him were the two little girls quick quick breathes the old woman you must go madame you must go at once my brother is frightened he refuses to have you here any longer he is terrified out of his life lest the germans should discover that he has been allowing an english woman to hide in his house she threw an apron on me and hurriedly tied it behind me then she brought out a big black shawl and flung it round my shoulders then she picked up the blue and white check handkerchief lying on the table and nodded to me to tie it over my head you must go at once you must leave everything behind you you must not take anything we will see about your things afterwards you must pass as henri's wife there take his arm and you henri take one of the little girls by the hand and you madame you take the other there courage madame oh my poor child i am sorry for you she kissed me and pushed me out at the same time next moment hanging on to henri's arm i found myself outside in the corridor walking towards the staircase courage whispered henri in my ear suddenly i ceased to be myself i became a peasant i was henri's wife these little girls were mine i leaned on henri i clutched my little girl's fingers close i felt utterly unafraid i thought as a peasant i absolutely precipitated myself into the woman i was supposed to be and in that new condition of personality i walked down the wide staircase with my husband and my children passing dozens of german officers who were running up and down the stairs continually i got a touch of their system they moved aside to let us pass the poor little pie-coloured peasant his anxious wife the two solemn children with flowing hair the hall below was crowded with germans i saw their fair florid faces their grim lips and blazing eyes but i was a peasant now a little belgian peasant reality had left me completely fear was fled the sight of the sunshine and the touch of the fresh air on my face as we reached the street set all my nerves acting again in their old satisfactory manner courage madame whispered henri don't call me madame call me louisa i whispered back where are we going to a friend we turned the corner and crossed the street and i saw at once that antwerp as antwerp has entirely ceased to exist everywhere there were germans they were seated in the cafes flying past in motor-cars driving through the streets and avenues just as in brussels looking as if they had lived there forever voici madame muttered henri louisa i whispered supplicatingly End of chapter forty three recording by expatriate in bangor maine Chapters 44 and 45 of A Woman's Experiences in the Great War by Louise Mack. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 44 Can I Trust Them? 
we entered a cafe i shrank and clutched his arm the place was full of germans but they were common soldiers these not officers they were drinking beer and coffee at the little tables take no notice of them whispered henri you are all right trust me we walked through the restaurant henri and i arm in arm and the little girls clinging to our hands they really played their parts amazingly those little girls i have found my wife from brussels announced henri in a loud voice to the old proprietor behind the counter how are things in brussels madame queried an old belgian in the cafe but i made no answer i affected not to hear i went with henri on through the little hall at the far end of the cafe next moment i found myself in a big clean kitchen and a tall stout woman her black eyes swimming in tears was leaning towards me her arms open oh poor madame she said she clasped me to her breast between her tears and her choking voice she whispered i told henri to bring you here you are safe with me we are from luxembourg we fled from home at the beginning of the war rather than see our state swarming with prussians as it is now we luxembourgers hate germans with a hate that passes all other hate on earth and i have three children who are all in england now i sent them there a week ago i sold my jewels my all to let them go i know my children are safe in england and you madame you are safe with me don't call me madame call me louisa and call me ada she said so au revoir said henri i shall come round later with your things he seized the little girls and with a nod and courage louisa he disappeared oh the kindness of that broken-hearted luxembourg woman her poor heart was bleeding for her children and she kept on weeping and asking me a thousand questions about england while she made coffee for me and spread a white cloth over the kitchen table what would happen to her little ones would the english be kind to them would they be safe in england and over and over again she repeated the same sad little story of how she had sent them away her three beloveds georges claire and little ada with the long fair curls sent them away out of danger and had never heard a word from them since the day she kissed them and bade them good-bye at the crowded train the whole of that day i remained in the kitchen there at the back of the cafe i could hear the germans coming in and out they were blowing their own trumpets all the time telling always of their victories ada's little old husband would walk up and down whistling the cheeriest pipe of a whistle i have ever heard it did me good to listen to him it brought before one in the midst of all this terror and ruin an image of birds at six o'clock that day when dusk began to gather ada shut up the cafe put out the lights and she and her old husband and i sat together in the kitchen round the fire presently in came henri with my little bag accompanied by madame x and her big husband and two enormous yellow dogs they told me that the danish doctor came back at three o'clock asked for me and was told i had gone to holland if it were not for the danish doctor i should feel quite safe i said was he angry he was very surprised did he give you back my passport no did he get the passport from his consul he said so did he want to know how i got away he said he hoped you were safe did he believe you i don't know do you think he believed you i don't know did he look as if he believed you he looked surprised and angry a little annoyed not pleased perhaps and very surprised yes very surprised i don't believe that he believed you perhaps not perhaps he will try and find me but he is no spy answered henri if he had wanted to betray you he would have done it last night c'est ça agreed the others what did you know about him i asked what made you send him up to me francois surely you wouldn't have told him about me unless you knew he was trustworthy c'est ça agreed big fat sad-eyed francois i have known him for some time i never doubted him i am sure he is to be trusted he has worked very hard among our wounded but why did he speak with the germans in the restaurant he is a dane he can speak as he chooses then you don't think he was speaking of me no madame c'est évident n'est-ce pas you have left the hotel in safety perhaps he will ask monsieur claude where i am monsieur claude will tell him he knows nothing about you has never seen you never heard of you perhaps he will ask monsieur claude's sister we must tell her not to tell him where you are what 
i started violently do you mean to say that you haven't warned her already not to tell him where i've really gone to but of course she will not tell him she is devoted to you madame call me louisa louisa she might tell him to get rid of him says ada slowly c'est ça agree the others thoughtfully and at that all the terror of last night returns to me it returns like a memory but it is troublous all the same and then opening my bag to inspect its contents i suddenly see a big strange key what is this and then remembrance rushes over me it is the key that mr lucian arthur jones gave me the key of the furnished house in antwerp a house fully furnished and fully stored with food and no occupants and no germans in a flash i decided to get into that house as quickly as possible it was the best possible place of hiding it was so good indeed that it seemed like a fairy tale that i should have the key in my possession and then with another flash i decided that i could never face going into that house alone my nerves would refuse me i had asked a good deal of them lately and they had responded magnificently but they turned against living alone in an empty house in antwerp quite definitely and positively they turned against that casting a swift glance about me i took in that group of faces round the kitchen fire who were they these people francois and lenore henri ada and the little old grey moustached man whistling like a bird who were they why were they here among the germans why had they not fled with the million fugitives was it possible they were spies for i knew now beyond all doubting that there were indeed such things as spies though the english mind finds it almost impossible to believe in the reality of something so dedicated to the gentle art of making melodrama until three days ago i had never seen these people in my life i knew absolutely nothing about them perhaps they were even now carefully drawing the net around me perhaps i was already a prisoner in the germans hands and yet they were all i had in the way of acquaintances they were all i had to trust in could i trust them i looked at them again it was strange and rather wonderful to have nothing on earth to help one but one's own judgment then ada's voice reached me voici louisa she is saying see the photograph of my georges and she bends over me with a little old locket and inside i see a small boy's fair brave little face and ada's tears splash on my hand i sent them away because i feared the alboches might harm them she breaks out uncontrollably for mon mari and myself we have no fear and we had not money for ourselves to go but my georges and my claire and my petite ada i could not bear the thought that the alboches might hurt them oh mes petites mes petites they wept so they did not want to go let us stay here with you mamma but i made them go i sold my bijou my all to get money enough for them to go to england oh the english will be good to them won't they louisa tell me the english will be good to my petites sometimes in england since when i have heard some querulous suburban english heart voicing itself grandiloquently out of the plethora of its charity giving as a bit fed up with the refugees i think of myself with a passionate sincerity and fanatic belief in england's goodness and justice assuring that weeping mother that her georges and claire and little ada with the long hair curls would be cared for by the english the tender generous grateful english as though they were their own little ones even better perhaps even better ada's tears they wash away my fears my heart melts to her and i tell her straight away about the house in the avenue l but how splendid she cries exuberantly quelle chance louisa quelle chance cries lenore to-morrow morning we shall all take you there declares henri their surprise their delight allay my last lingering doubts but mind i urge them feverishly you must never let the danish doctor know that address that night i sleep in a feather bed in a room at the top of dear ada's house or try to sleep alas it is only trying my windows look on a long narrow street a dead street full of empty houses and from these houses come stealing with louder and louder insistence the sounds of those imprisoned dogs howling within the barred doors of the empty houses their cries are terrible they are starving now and perishing of thirst 
they yelp and whine and wail they bark and shriek and plead they sob they moan they send forth blood-curdling cries in dozens in hundreds from every street from every quarter these massed wails go up into the night lending a new horror to the dark and through it all the germans sleep they make no attempt either to destroy the poor tortured brutes or to give them food and water they are to be left there to die hour after hour goes by i bury my head under a pillow but i cannot shut out those awful sounds they penetrate through everything sometimes they are death agonies the dogs are giving up they can suffer no longer they understand at last that mankind their friend who has had all their faith and love has deserted them and then with fresh bursts of howling they seem afresh to make him listen to make him realize this dark and terrible thing that has come to them this racking thirst and hunger that he has been so careful to provide against before even as though they were his children his own little ones not his dogs and they howl and cry the dead city listens and gives no sign and they shiver and shriek and wail but in vain in vain it is the most awful night of my life chapter forty five a safe shelter next morning at ten o'clock lenore and i and the ever faithful henri carrying my parrot if you please and ada strolled with affected nonchalance through the antwerp streets where a pale gold sun was shining on the ruins germans were everywhere some were buying postcards some sausages motor-cars dashed in and out full of grey or blue uniforms fair grave sardonic faces were to be seen now where only a few brief days ago there had been naught but belgians brave eyes and lively tender physiognomy our little party was silent depressed i wore a handkerchief over my head tied beneath my chin a big black apron and a white shawl and i kept my arm inside henri's voici madame he exclaimed suddenly voila les anglais et les anglaises gasped ada under her breath we were just then crossing the avenue de kaiser that once gay bright belgian avenue where i had so often walked with alice my dear little liegeoise now fled alas i knew not where a procession was passing between the two lines of fading acacias a huge wagon some mounted germans two women oh mon dieu says ada lying on sacks in the open wagon are wounded english officers their eyes shut and trudging on foot behind the wagon with an indescribable steadfastness and courage is an english nurse in her blue uniform and a tall thin erect english lady with grey hair and a sweet face under a wide black hat they are taking them to germany whispers henri in my ear mon dieu mon dieu moans ada under her breath oh le pauvre anglaise it was all i could do to keep from flying towards them an awful longing came over me to speak to them to sympathize to do something anything to help them there alone among the germans it was the call of one's race of one's blood of one's country but it was madness i must stand still to speak to them might mean bad things for all of us and even as i thought of that the group vanished round the corner towards the station as we walked along we examined the city ah how shocking was the change people are wont to say of antwerp that it was very little damaged but in truth it suffered horribly far beyond what any one who has not seen it can believe the burning streets were still on fire the water supply was still cut off the burning had continued ever since the bombardment i looked at the hotel st antoine and shivered a few days ago sir frederick greville and lady greville of the british embassy had been installed in that hotel and countless belgian ministers the germans had tried hard to shell it but their shells had fallen across the road instead all the opposite side of the street lay flat on the ground smouldering and smoking in heaps of spread out burning ruins at last we reached the house for which i had the key from the outside it was dignified handsome thoroughly belgian standing in a street of many ruined houses trembling i put the key into the lock turned it and pushed open the door then i gasped open sesame indeed for there stretching before me was a magnificent hall 
richly carpeted with broad low marble stairs leading upwards on either side to strangely constructed open apartments lined with rare books and china and silver we crept in and shut the door behind us moving about the luxurious rooms and corridors with bated breath on tiptoe we explored no fairy tale could reveal greater wonders here was a superb mansion stocked for six months siege in the cellars were huge cases of white wines and red wines and mineral waters galore in the pantries we found hundreds of tins of sardines salmon herrings beef mutton asparagus corn and huge bags of flour boxes of biscuits boxes of salt sugar pepper porridge jams potatoes at the back was a garden full of great trees and grass and flowers with white roses on the rose-bush agreeable as was the sight there was yet something infinitely touching in this beautiful silent home deserted by its owners who secure in the impregnability of antwerp had provided themselves for a six month siege and then at the last moment their hopes crushed had fled leaving furniture clothes food wines everything just for dear life's sake tender-hearted ada wept continually as she moved about oh the poor thing she sighed every now and then and forgetting herself and her own grief her angel heart would overflow with compassion for these people whom she had never seen never heard of until now for the first time for days i felt safe and when lenore madame x and her husband promised to come and stay there with me and bring jeanette and the old grandmere from the hospital i was greatly relieved in fact if it had not been for the danish doctor i should have been quite happy they all came in that afternoon and henri too and how grateful they were to get into that nest we quickly decided to use only the kitchen and lenore and her husband showed such a respect for the beauties of the house that i knew i had done right in bringing the poor refugees here through the barred kitchen windows from behind the window curtains we watched the endless rush of the german machinery occasionally germans would come and knock at the door and lenore would go and answer it when they found the house was occupied they immediately went away so i had the satisfaction of knowing that i was saving that house from the huns the haunted noontide silence of my solitary walk seemed like a dream now noise without end went on all day long the germans were rushing their machineries through the chaussee de malines or rue la mariniere or along the avenue de kaiser at some of the monsters that went grinding along one stared gasping realizing for the first time what le petit belge had been up against when they had pitted courage and honour and love of liberty against machinery like that three days afterwards along the road from lierre two big guns moved on locomotives toward Irishot, suggesting by their vastness that immense mountain peaks were journeying across the landscape i felt physically ill when i saw the size of them a hundred and fifty portable kitchens ensconced in motor-cars also passed through the town explaining practically why all the germans looked so remarkably well fed motorcycles fitted with wireless telegraphy motor loads of boats in sections air sheds in sections and trams in sections dashed by eternally the swift rush of motor cars seemed never to end yet busy as the germans were and feverishly concentrated on their new activities they still found time to carry out their system as applied to their endeavours to win the belgian people's confidence in their kindness and justice as conquerors they paid for everything they bought food lodging drink everything they asked for things gently even humbly they never grumbled if they were kept waiting they patted the children's heads over and over again i heard them saying the same thing to anybody who would listen we love you belgians we know how brave you are we only wanted to go through belgium we would never have heard it and we would have paid you for any damage we did we don't hate the french either they are bon soldats the french but the english and here a positive hiss of hatred would come into their guttural voices the english are false to every one it was they who made the war it is all their fault whatever has happened we didn't want this war we did all we could to stop it but the english again the hiss of hatred 
ringing like cold steel through the word wanted to fight us they were jealous of us and they used you poor brave belgians as an excuse that was always the beginning of their litany then they would follow the chant of their victories and now we are going to calais we shall start the bombardment of england from there with our big guns before long we shall all be in london and then would come the final strain which was often true as a matter of fact in addition to being wily i've left my good home behind me and my dear good wife and away there in the vaterland i have seven children awaiting my return so you can imagine if i and men like me wanted this war it was generally seven children sometimes it was more but it was never less the system was perfect even about as small a thing as that End of chapter 55 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapters 46 and 47 of A Woman's Experiences in the Great War by Louise Mack This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 46 The Flight into Holland for five wild incredible days i remained in antwerp watching the german occupation and then at last i found my opportunity to escape over the borders into holland there came the great day when francois managed to borrow a motor-car and took me out through the breda gate to Putte in holland good-bye to ada good-bye to henri good-bye to lenore jeannette and la grande mere i knew now that madame x could be trusted to the death she had proved it in an unmistakable way in my bag i had her belgian passport and her german one also i was passing now as francois's wife the photograph of lenore stamped on the passport was sufficiently like myself to enable me to pass the german sentinels and lenore dear sweet lovable lenore had coached me diligently in the pronunciation of her queer flemish name which was not lenore of course as for my own english passport monsieur x went several times to the young danish doctor asking for it on my behalf the dane refused to give it up how do i know said he that you will restore it to the lady finally monsieur x suggested that he should leave it for me at the american consulate eventually long after it came to me in london from the american consulate with a note from the dane asking them to see that i got it safely when i think of it now i feel sad to have so mistrusted that friendly dane what did he think i wonder to find me suddenly flown perhaps he will read this some day and understand and forgive ah how mournful how heartbreaking was the almost incredible change that had taken place in the free happy country of former days and this ruined desolate land of to-day as we flashed along towards holland we passed endless burnt-out villages and farms magnificent old chateaux shelled to the ground churches lying tumbled forward upon their graveyards tombstones uprooted and graves riven open a cold wind blew the sky was grey and sad in all the melancholy and chill there was one thought and one alone that made these sights endurable it was that the poor victims of these horrors were being cared for and comforted in england's and holland's big warm hearts i could scarcely believe my eyes when i saw on the dutch borders those sweet green dutch pine woods of puta stretching away under the peaceful golden evening skies trees trees were there really such things left in the world it seemed impossible that any beauty could be still in existence and i gazed at the woods with ravenous eyes drinking in their beauty and peace like a perishing man slaking his thirst in clear cold water then suddenly out of the depths of those dim dutch woods i discerned white faces peering and presently i became aware that the woods were alive with human beings white gaunt faces looked out from behind the tree trunks faces of little frightened children peeping peering wondering faces of sad hopeless men gazing stonily faces of hollow-eyed women who had turned grey with anguish when that cruel hail of shells began to burst upon their little homes in antwerp drawing them in their terror out into the unknown 
right through the woods of puta ran the road to the city of berg op Zom, and along this road i saw a huge military car come flying manned by half a dozen dutch officers and laden with thousands of loaves of bread instantly out of the woods out of their secret lairs the poor homeless fugitives rushed forward gathering round the car holding out their hands in a passion of supplication and whispering hoarsely du pain du pain bread bread it was like a scene from dante the white faces the outstretched arms the sunset above the wood and the red campfires between the trees chapter forty seven friendly holland yesterday i was in holland today i am in england but still in my ears i can hear the ring of scathing indignation in the voices of all those innumerable dutch when i put point-blank to them the question that has been causing such unrest in great britain lately are the dutch helping germany from every sort and condition of dutchmen i received an emphatic never the people of holland would never permit it and in holland the people have an enormous voice nothing could have been more emphatic or more convincing than that reply but i pressed the point further is it not true then that the dutch allowed german troops to pass through holland the answer i received was startling we have heard that story and we cannot understand how the allies could believe it we have traced the story my informant went on to its origin and we have discovered that the report was circulated by the germans themselves i pressed my interrogation further still would it be correct then to say that the attitude of holland towards england is distinctly and unmistakably friendly among all sections of the community in holland my informant one of the best known of dutch advocates paused a moment before replying then seriously and deliberately he made the following statement in the upper circles of dutch society that is to say in court circles and in the military set that is included in this classification there has been it is true a somewhat sentimental partiality for germany and the germans this preference originated obviously from prince henry's nationality and from queen wilhelmina's somewhat passive acceptance of her husband's likes and dislikes but the situation has lately changed a new emotion has seized upon holland and one of the first to be affected by this new emotion was prince henry himself when the million belgian refugees bleeding starving desperate hunted flung themselves over the dutch border in the agony of their flight we dutch and prince henry among us saw for ourselves for the first time the awful horror of the german invasion and so the prince has showed himself sympathetic towards the allies he has devoted himself to the belgian cause was the reply day after day he has taken long journeys to all the dutch cities and villages where the refugees are congregated he has visited the hospitals everywhere he has made endless gifts in the hospitals by his geniality and simplicity he completely overcame the quite natural shrinking of the wounded belgian soldiers from a visitor who bore the hated name of german i knew it was true too because i myself had seen prince henry going in and out of the hospitals at bergen op Zoom, his face bearing an expression of deep commiseration but what about england i went on hurriedly how do you feel to us we are your friends came the answer what puzzles us is how england could ever doubt or misunderstand us on that point psychologically we feel ourselves more akin to england than to any other country we like the english ways which greatly resemble our own just as much as we like english manners and customs we dislike the manners and customs of germany that we should fight against england is absolutely unthinkable in fact it would mean one thing only in holland a revolution over and over again these opinions were presented to me by leading dutchmen a director of a big dutch line of steamers was even more emphatic concerning holland's attitude to england and we are he said suffering from the war in holland suffering badly we estimate our losses at sixty per cent of our ordinary trade and commerce he pointed out to me a paragraph in a dutch paper if the export prohibition by britain of wool worsted etc it said is maintained the manufactures of woolen stuffs here will within not a very long period perhaps five to six weeks have to be closed for lack of raw material a proposition of the big manufacturers to have the prohibition raised 
on condition that nothing should be delivered to germany is being submitted to the british government we hope that england will arrive at a favourable decision you know i said tentatively that rumour persists in attributing to holland a readiness to do business with germany let me be quite frank about that said the director thoughtfully it is true that some people have surreptitiously been doing business with germany but in every community you will find that sort of people but our government has now awakened to the treachery and we shall hear no more of such transactions in the future and is it true that you are trying to change your national flag because the germans have been misusing it it is quite true we are trying to adopt the ancient standard of holland the orange instead of the red white and blue of today as an earnest of the genuine sympathy felt by the dutch as a whole towards the belgian sufferers i may describe in a few words what i saw in holland out of the black horrors of antwerp out of the hell of bombs and shells these million people came fleeing for their lives into dutch territory penniless footsore bleeding broken with terror and grief dying in hundreds by the way the inhabitants of antwerp and its villages crushed blindly onwards till they reached the dutch frontiers where they flung themselves a million people on the pity and mercy of holland not knowing the least how they would be treated and what did holland do with a magnificent simplicity she opened her arms as no nation in the history of the world has ever opened its arms yet to strangers and she took the whole of those million stricken creatures to her heart the dutch at bergen op zoom where the majority of the refugees were gathered gave up every available building to these people they filled all their churches with straw to make beds for them they opened all their theatres their schools their hospitals their factories and their private homes and without a murmur indeed with a tenderness and gentleness beyond all description they took upon their shoulders the burden of these million victims of germany's brutality it is our duty they say quietly and sick and poor alike pour out their offerings graciously without ceasing in the grand place of bergen op zoom stand long lines of soup boilers over charcoal fires behind the line of soup boilers are stacks of bones hundreds of bags of rice and salt mountains of celery and onions all piled on the flags of the market-place while to add to the liveliness and picturesqueness of the scene dutch soldiers in dark blue and yellow uniforms ride slowly round the square on glossy brown horses keeping the thousands of refugees out of the way of the endless stream of motor-cars lining the grand place on its four sides all packed to the brim with bread meat milk and cheese inside the town hall the portrait of queen wilhelmina in her scarlet and ermine robes looks down on the strangest scene holland has seen for many a day the floors of the hotel de la vie are covered with thousands of big red dutch cheeses twenty six thousand kilos of long loaves of brown bread are packed up almost to the ceiling looking exactly like enormous wood stacks sacks of flour sides of pork and bacon cases of preserved meat and conserved milk hundreds of cans of milk piles of blankets piles of clothing are here also all to be given away the town of bergen op zoom is full of heartbreaking pictures to-day but to me the most pathetic of all is the writing on the walls it is a tremendous tribute to the good-heartedness of the dutch that they do not mind their scrupulously clean houses defaced for the moment in this way scribbled in white chalk all over the walls shutters and fences windows tree trunks and pavements are the addresses of the frenzied refugees trying to get in touch with their lost relations on the trees too little bits of paper are pinned covered with addresses and messages such as the family moncher can be found in the church of st joseph under the grand altar or anna descartes with pierre and marie and grandmother are in the school of music the sisters martel and grandmother are in the church of the holy martyrs la famille de main are in the fifth tent of the encampment on the artillery ground monsieur and madame ardige and their seven children are in the comedy theatre so closely are the walls and shutters and the windows and trees scribbled over by now that the million addresses are most of them becoming indistinguishable while i was in holland i came across an interesting couple whom i speedily classified in my own mind one was a dark young man he had a peculiar accent 
he told me he was an englishman from northampton perhaps he was he said the reason he wasn't fighting for his country was because he was too fat perhaps he was the other young man said he was american perhaps he was he had red hair and an american accent he had lived in germany a great deal in his childhood all went well until the red-haired man made the following curious slip when i was describing the way the germans in antwerp fled towards the sausage he said how they will roar when i tell them that in berlin swiftly he corrected himself in new york i mean he said but a couple of hours later the englishman left suddenly for london and the american left for antwerp as i had happened to mention that i had left my baggage in antwerp i could quite imagine it being overhauled by the germans there at the instigation of the red-haired young gentleman with a pronounced american accent a rough estimate of the cost to the dutch government of maintaining the refugees works out at something like eighty five thousand pounds a week this of course is quite irrespective of the boundless private hospitality which is being dispensed with the utmost generosity on every hand in rotterdam harlem flushing bergen op Zoom, maastricht rosendal delft and innumerable other towns and villages some of the military families on their meagre pay must find the call on them a severe strain but one never hears of complaints on this score and in nine cases out of ten they refuse absolutely to accept payment for board and lodging though many of the refugees are eager to pay for their food and shelter we can't make money out of them is what the dutch say a new reading this of the famous couplet of a century ago in matters of this kind the fault of the dutch was giving too little and asking too much End of chapter 47, recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapters 48 through 50 of A Woman's Experiences in the Great War by Louise Mack. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 48 French Cooking in Wartime there is no more belgium to go to so i am in france now but war correspondents are not wanted here they are driven out wherever discovered i shall not stay long all my time is taken up in running about getting papers my bag is getting out of shape it bulges with the laissez passes and safe conducts that one has to fight so hard to get however to be among french-speaking people again is a great joy and today in dunkirk it has refreshed and consoled me greatly to see madame pierre cooking the old frenchwoman moved about her tiny kitchen her infinitesimally tiny kitchen and i watched her from my point of observation seated on a tiny chair at a tiny table squeezed up into a tiny corner it really was the smallest kitchen i'd ever seen no you couldn't have swung a cat in it you really couldn't and no one but a thrifty french housewife could have contrived to get that wee round table and little chair into that tiny angle yet i felt very cosy and comfortable there and the old grey-haired french mother preparing supper for her household and for any soldier who might be passing by seemed perfectly satisfied with her cramped surroundings and kept begging me graciously to remain where i was drinking the hot tea she had just made for me while my boots that were always wet out there dried under her big charcoal stove and always she smiled away and i smiled too who could help it she and her kitchen were the most charming study imaginable every now and then her fine old brown thin wrinkled hand would reach over my head for a pot or a brush or a pan from the wall behind or the shelf above me while the other hand would stir or shake something over the wee gas ring or the charcoal stove for so small was the kitchen that by stretching she could reach at the same time to the wall on either side then she began to pick over a pile of rough-looking green stuff very much like that that we in england should contemptuously call weeds pick 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 a diamond merchant with his jewels could not have been more careful more delicate more watchful and as i thought that it suddenly came over me that to this old careful thrifty frenchwoman those weedy greens were not weeds at all but were really as precious as diamonds for she was a frenchwoman clever and disciplined in the art of thrift and they represented the most important thing in all the world to-day food food means life 
food means victory food means the end of the war and peace you could read all that in her black intelligent eyes then i began to sit up and watch her more closely still when she had picked off all those little hard leaves she cracked up the bare harsh stalks into pieces an inch long and flung them all leaves and stalks into a saucepan of boiling water which she presently pushed aside to let simmer away gently for ten minutes or so meanwhile she is carefully peeling a hard-boiled egg taking the shell off in two pieces and shredding up the white on a little white saucer never losing a crumb of it even an egg why waste an egg like that but indeed she is not going to waste it she is using the yolk to make mayonnaise sauce and the white is for decoration later on with all her thrift she must have things pretty her cheap dishes must have an air of finish and artistic touch and she knows and acts up to the fact that the yellow and white egg is not wasted but returns a hundred per cent because it is going to make her supper look a hundred times more important than it really is now she takes the greens from the saucepan drains them and puts them into a little frying pan on the big stove and she peppers and salts them and turns them about and leaves them with a little smile she always has that little smile for everything and i think that goes into the flavor somehow and now she pours the water the greens were boiled in into that big soup pot on the big stove and gives the soup a friendly stir just to show that she hasn't forgotten it she opens the cupboard and brings out every little or big bit of bread left over from lunch and breakfast and she shapes them a little with her sharp old knife and she hurries them all into the big pot putting the lid down quickly so that even the steam doesn't get out and get wasted now she takes the greens off the fire and puts them into a dear little round white china dish and leaves them to get cold she opens her cupboard again and brings out a piece of cold veal cutlet and a piece of cold steak left over from luncheon yesterday and today also what is she going to do with these she's going to make them our special dish for supper she begins to shred them up with her old sharp blade shreds them up finely not mincing not chopping but shredding the particles apart and into them she shreds a little cold ham and onion and then she flavors it well with salt and pepper then she piles this all on a dish and covers it with golden mayonnaise and criss-crosses it with long red wires of beetroot the greens are cold now and she dresses them she oils them and vinegars them and pats and arranges them and decorates them with the white of the chopped egg and thin little slices of tomato voila the salad she says with her flash of a smile salad for five people a beautiful tasty green melting delicious salad that might have been made of young asparagus tips and what did it cost one farthing plus the labor and care and affection and time that the old woman put into the making of it plus in other words her thrift now she must empty my teapot does she turn it upside down over a bucket of rubbish as they do in england leaving the tea leaves to go to the dustman when he calls on friday she would think that an absolutely wicked thing to do if she had ever heard of such proceedings but she has not she drains every drop of tea into a jug puts a lid on it and places it away in her safe then she empties the tea leaves into a yellow earthenware basin and puts a plate over them and puts them up on a shelf i begin to say to myself with quite an excited feeling shall i ever see her throw anything away potatoes next ah now there'll be peelings and those she'll have to throw away not a bit of it there are only the very thinnest filmiest scrapings of dark down off this old dear's potatoes and suddenly i think of poor dear england where our potato skins are so thick that a tradition has grown from them and the maids throw them over their shoulders and see what letter they make on the floor and that will be the first letter of his name laughing i tell of this tradition to my old frenchwoman and what do you think she answers the skin must be very thick not to break she says solemnly but then you english are all so rich are we or are we simply what is it that bluntly put we are lazy after the fall of antwerp when a million people had fled into holland i saw ladies in furs and jewels holding up beseeching imploring hands to the kindly but bewildered dutch folk asking for bread just bread it was a terrible sight but shall we too be begging for bread some day shall we too be longing for the pieces we threw away who knows 
finally we sat down to an exquisite supper first there was cru au pot the nicest soup in the world said a king of france and full of nourishment then there was a small slice each of tender juicy boiled beef out of the big soup pot never betraying for a minute that that beautiful soup had been made from it with that beef went the potatoes sautéed in butter and sprinkled with chopped green and after that came the chicken mayonnaise and salad of asparagus tips otherwise cold scraps and weeds there are five of us to supper in that little room behind the milliner's shop an invalided belgian officer a little woman from Malines looking after her wounded husband in hospital here mademoiselle alice the daughter who keeps the millinery shop in the front room the old mother a high lace collar on now and her grey hair curled and coiffured and myself the mother waits on us slipping in and out like a cat and we eat till there is nothing left to want and nothing left to eat and then we have coffee such coffee which reminds me that i quite forgot to say i caught the old lady putting the shells of the hard-boiled egg into the coffee pot and that is french cooking in war time chapter forty nine the fight in the air next morning sunday about half past ten i was walking joyfully on that long beautiful beach at dunkirk with all the winds in the world in my face and a golden sun shining dazzlingly over the blue skies into the deep blue sea fields beneath the rain had ceased the peace of god was drifting down like a dove's wing over the tortured world from the city of dunkirk a mile beyond the plage the chimes of sabbath bells stole out soothingly and little black-robed frenchwomen passed with prayer-books and eyes down bent it was sunday morning and for the first time in this new year religion and spring were met in the golden beauty of a day that was wind-swept and sun-lit simultaneously and that swept away like magic the sad depression of endless grey monotonous days of rain and mud and then all suddenly a change came sweeping over the golden beach and the turquoise skies overhead and all the fair glory of the glittering morning turned with a crash into tragedy crash crash bewildered not understanding i heard one deafening intonation after another fling itself fiercely from the cannons that guard the port and city of dunkirk then followed the shouts of fishermen soldiers nurses and the motley handful of people who happened to be on the beach just then everybody began shouting and everybody began running and pointing towards the sky and then i saw the commencement of the most extraordinary sight this war has witnessed an english aeroplane was chasing a german taube that had suddenly appeared above the coastline the german was doing his best to make a rush for dunkirk and the englishman was doing his best to stop him as i watched i held my breath the english aeroplane came on fiercely and mounted with a swift rush till it gained a place in the bright blue skies above the little insect-like taube it seemed that the english aviator must now get the better of his foe but suddenly with an incredible swiftness the german doubled and giving up his attempt to get across the city fled eastwards like a mad thing with the englishman after him but now one saw that the german machine responded more quickly and had far the better of it as regards pace leaving the pursuing englishman soon far behind it and rushing away across the skies at a really incredible rate but while this little thrilling by-play was engaging the attention of every one far greater things were getting in train another taube was sneaking unobserved among the clouds and was rapidly gaining a place high up above dunkirk and now it lets fall a bomb that drops down down into the town beneath immediately with a sound like the splitting of a million worlds everything and every one opens fire french english belgians and all the whole earth seems to have gone mad up into the sky they are all firing up into the brilliant golden sunlight at that little black swiftly moving creature that spits out venomously every two or three minutes black bombs that go slitting through the air with a faint screech till they touch the earth and shed death and destruction all around and now what's this all along the shore slipping and sailing along across the sky comes into sight an endless succession of taubes 
they glitter like silver in the sunlight defying all the efforts of the french artillery they sail along with a calm insouciance that nearly drives me mad crash 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 bang 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 the cannon and the rifles are at them now with a fury that defies all words the firing comes from all directions they are firing inland and they are firing out to sea at last i run into a house with some french soldiers who are clenching their hands with rage at that tauba's behaviour one two three four five six seven eight nine ten everyone is counting eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen voila another cry the french soldiers every minute they utter groans of rage and disgust the glittering cavalcade sails serenely onward until the whole skyline from right to left above the beach is dotted with those sparkling creatures now outlined against the deep plentiful blue of the sky and now gliding and hiding beneath some vast soft drift of feathery grey-white cloud it is a sight never to be forgotten its beauty is so vivid so thrilling that it is difficult to realize that this lovely spectacle of a race across the sky is no game no race no exhibition but represents the ultimate end of all the races and prizes and exhibitions and attempts to fly here is the whole art of flying in a tabloid as it were with all its significance at last in evidence the silver aeroplanes over the sea keep guard all the time moving along very very slowly and very high up until the taube has dropped its last bomb over the city then they glide away across the sea in the direction of england i walked back to the city what a change since i came through it an hour or so before i looked at the hotel de ville and shuddered all the windows were smashed and just at the side in a tiny green square was the great hole that showed where the bomb had fallen harmlessly all the afternoon the audacious taube remained rushing about high above dunkirk but later that afternoon as i was in a train en route for Fum, fate threw in my way the chance to see a glorious vindication the train was brought suddenly to a standstill we all jumped up and looked out it was getting dusk but against the red in the sky two black things were visible one dropped a bomb intended for the railway station a little further on by that we knew it was german but we had little time to think the other aeroplane rushed onwards firing was heard and down came the german followed by the frenchman they alighted almost side by side we could see quite plainly men getting out and rushing towards each other a few minutes later some peasants came rushing to tell us that the two germans from the taube both lay dead on the edge of that sandy field to westward then our train went on chapter fifty the war bride the train went on it was dark quite dark when i got out of it at last and looked about me blinking this was right at the front in flanders and a long cavalcade of french soldiers were alighting also two handsome elderly turcos with splendid eyes black beards and strange hard warrior-like faces passed looking immensely distinguished as they mounted their arab horses and rode off into the night swathed in their white head-dresses with their flowing picturesque cloaks spread out over their horses tails their swords clanking at their sides and their blazing eyes full of queer bold pride then to my great surprise i see coming out of the station two ladies wrapped in furs a young lady and an old one delightful i think to myself as i come up with them i hear them inquiring of a sentinel the way to the hotel of the noble rose and with the swift friendliness of wartime i stop and ask them if i may walk along with them je suis anglais i add with much pleasure they cry simultaneously we are just arrived from folkestone the younger one explains in pretty broken english as we grope our way along the pitch-black cobbled road ah but what a journey but her voice bubbles as she speaks and though i cannot see her face i suddenly become aware that for some reason or other this girl is filled with quite extraordinary happiness picking our way along the road in the dark with the cannons growling away fiercely some six miles off she tells me her little history she is a little brussels bride in search of her soldier bridegroom 
and she has by dint of persistent never-ceasing coaxing persuaded her old mother to set out from brussels all this long long way through antwerp to holland then to flushing then to folkestone then to calais then to dunkirk and finally here to the front where her soldier bridegroom will be found he is here he has been wounded he is better he has always said no no you must not come and now at last he had said come and here she is she is so pretty so simple so girlish and sweet and the mother is such a perfect old duck of a mother that i fall in love with them both presently we find ourselves in the quaint old flemish inn with oil lamps and dark beams the stout grey moustached landlord hastens forward have you a message for madame louis the bride gasps out her question oui oui madame the landlord answers heartily there is a message for you you are to wait here that is the message bien her eyes flame with joy so we order coffee and sit at a little table chattering away but i confess that all i want is to watch that young girl's pale dark face rays of light keep illuminating it making it almost divinely beautiful and it seems to me i have never come so close before to another human being's joy and then a soldier walks in he comes towards her she springs to her feet he utters a word he is telling her her husband is out in the passage very wonderful is the way that girl gets across the big smoky flemish cafe i declare she scarcely touches the ground it is as near flying as any one human could come then she is through the door and we see no more ah but we can imagine it we two the old mother and i and we look at each other and her eyes are wet and so are mine and we smile but very mistily very shakily at the thought of those two in the little narrow passage outside clasped in each other's arms they come in presently they sit with us now the dear things sit hand in hand and their young faces are almost too sacred to look at so dazzling is the joy written in both his and hers they are bathed in smiles that keep breaking over their lips and eyes like sun-kissed breakers on a summer strand and everything they say ends in a broken laugh and then we go into dinner and they make me dine with them and they order red wine and make me have some and i cease to be a stranger i become an old friend intermingling with that glorious happiness which seems to be mine as well as theirs because they are lovers and love all the world the old mother whispers to me softly when she got a chance he will be so pleased when he knows there's a little one coming oh wonderful little one i whisper back she understands and nods between tears and smiles again while the two divine ones sit gazing at the paradise in each other's eyes and through it all all the time goes on the hungry growl of cannons and just a few miles out continue all the time those wild and passionate struggles for life and death between the allies and germans which soon god in his mercy forbid may fling this smiling fair-headed boy out into the sad dark glory of death on the battlefield leaving his little one fatherless ah but with what a heritage and then all suddenly i think to myself who would not be glad and proud to come to life under such epic happenings such glorious heroic beginnings with all that is commonplace and worldly left out and all that is stirring and deep and vital put in never in the history of the world have there been as many marriages as now everywhere girls and men are marrying no longer do they hesitate and ponder and hang back instead they rush towards each other eagerly confidentially right into each other's arms into each other's lives till death us do part say those thousands of brave young voices indeed it seems to me that never in the history of this old old world was love as wonderful as now each bride is a heroine and oh the hero that every bridegroom is they snatch at happiness they discover now in one swift instant what philosophers have spent years in teaching that life is fleeting and they are afraid to lose one of the golden moments which may so soon come to an end for ever but that is not all there is something else behind it all something no less beautiful though less personal there is the intention of the race to survive consciously sometimes but more often unconsciously our men and our women are mating for the sake of the generation that will follow the children who will rise up and call them blessed 
the brave strong wonderful children begotten of brave sweet women who joyously took all risks and splendid heroic men with hearts soft with love and pity for the women they left behind but with iron determination stealing their souls to fight to the death for their country how superb will be the coming generation begotten under such glorious circumstances with nothing missing from their magnificent heritage love patriotism courage devotion sacrifice death and glory a week after that meeting at the front i was in dunkirk when i ran into the old duck of a mother waiting outside the big grey church towards dusk but now she is sorrowful poor dear a cloud has come over her bright generous face with its affectionate black eyes and tender lips he has been ordered to the trenches near ypres she whispers sadly and your daughter i gasp out hush here she comes my angel with the heart of a lion she has been in the church to pray for him she would go alone of our three faces it is still the girl wife's that is the brightest she has changed of course she is no longer staring with dazzled eyes into her own bliss but the illumination of great love is there still made doubly beautiful now by the knowledge that her beloved is out across those flat sand dunes under shell-fire and the time has come for her to be noble as a soldier's bride must be for the sake of her husband's honour and his little one unborn though he fall on the battlefield she says to me softly with that sweet brave smile on her quivering lips he leaves me with a child to live after him his child and of the three of us it is she the youngest and most sorely tried who looks to have the greatest hold on life present and eternal End of chapter fifty recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifty one of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifty one a lucky meeting to meet someone you know at the front is an experiment in psychology deeply interesting amusing sometimes and often strangely illuminative indeed you never really know people till you meet them under the sound of guns it is at furn that i meet accidentally a very eminent journalist and a very well-known author suddenly up drives a funny old car with all its windows broken clatter clatter over the age-old cobbled streets of furn and the car comes to a stop before the ancient little flemish inn out jump four men hastening like schoolboys up the steps they come bursting breezily into the room where i have just finished luncheon i look they look we all look one of them with a bright smile comes forward how do you do says he he is the chauffeur if you please the chauffeur in the big golden brown overcoat with a golden brown hood over his head he looks like a monk till you see his face then he is all brightness and sharpness and alertness for in truth he is england's most famous war photographer this young man in the cowl with the hatchet profile and dancing green eyes and we last saw each other in the agony of the bombardment of antwerp and then i look over his shoulder and see another face i can scarcely believe my eyes here at the world's end as near the front as any one can get driving about in that old car with the broken windows is our eminent journalist in baggy grey knee-breeches and laced-up boots having a look round says the journalist simply seeing things for myself a bit how splendid well to tell you the truth i can't keep away i've been out before but never so near as this the sordidness and suffering of it all makes me feel i simply can't stay quietly over there in london i want to see for myself how things are going then dropping the subject of himself swiftly but easily the journalist begins courteously to ask questions what am i doing here where have i come from where am i going well at the present moment i answer i'm trying to get to la panne i want to see the queen of the belgians waiting for the king and walking there on the yellow dreamy sands by the north sea but the tram isn't running any longer and the roads are bad to-day very bad indeed all in an instant the journalistic instinct is alive in him and crying i watch fascinated i can see him seeing that picture of pictures the sweet queen walking on the lonely winter sands 
waiting for her hero to come back from the battlefields just over there let us take you in our car what are we doing where were we going anyway it doesn't matter we'll take the car to la panne and after luncheon off we go every now and then i turn the corner of my eye on the man beside me as he sits there hunched up in a heavy coat with a big cigar between his babyish lips talking talking and what is so glorious about it all is that this isn't the journalist talking it is the idealist the practical dreamer who by sheer belief in his ideals has won his way to the top of his profession i see a face that is one of the most curiously fascinating in europe a veiled face but with its veil for ever shifting for ever lifting for ever letting you get a glimpse of the man behind power and will are sunk deep within the outer veil and when you look at him at first you say to yourself what a nice big boy of a man for those lips are almost babyish in their curves the lips of a man who would drink the cold pure water of life in preference to his colour vintages the lips of an idealist who but an idealist could keep a childish mouth through the intense worldliness of the battle for life as this man has fought it right from the very beginning over the broad thoughtful brow flops a lock of brown hair every now and then his eyes are grey with blue in them when you look at them they look straight at you but it is not a piercing glance it seems like a glance from far away all kinds of swift flashing thoughts and impulses go sweeping over those eyes and what they don't see is really not worth seeing though when i come to think of it i cannot recall catching them looking at anything as far as faces go this is a fine face decidedly a fine arresting face sympathetic likable and the strong well-made physique of a frame looks as if it could carry great physical burdens though more exercise would probably do it good above and beyond everything he looks young this man young with a youth that will never desert him as though he holds within himself the secrets of ever-recurring spring on we fly we are right inside the belgian lines now the belgian soldiers are all around us brave wonderful petty belges they always speak of themselves like that the belgian army le petit belges perhaps the fact that they have proved themselves heroes of an immortality that every race will love and bow down to in ages to come makes these blue-coated men thus lightly refer to themselves with that inimitable flash of the belgian smile as little belgians for never before was the belgian army greater than it is to-day with its numbers depleted its territory wrested from it its homes ruined its loved ones scattered far and wide in strange lands like john brown's army it still goes fighting on though many of its uniforms battered and stained with the blood and mud and powder of one campaign after another are so ragged as to be almost in pieces we are no longer chic a belgian captain says it with a grin as he chats to us at a halt where we show our passes he flaps his hands in his pockets of his ragged overcoat and smiles in a way it is true their uniforms are ragged stained burnt torn too big too little full of a hundred pitiful little discrepancies that peep out under those brand new overcoats that some of them are lucky enough to have obtained they have been fighting since the beginning of the war they have left bits of their purple-blue tunics at liege namur charleroi ayrshot termont antwerp they have lost home territory family friends but they are fighting harder than ever and so gloriously uplifted are they by the immortal honour they have wrested from destiny that they can look at their ragged trousers with a grin and love them and their torn burnt blackened tunics even as a conqueror loves the emblems of his glory that will never pale upon the pages of history a soldier loosens a bandage with his teeth and breaks into a song it is so gay so naive so insouciant so truly and deliciously belge that i catch it ere it fades that mocking song addressed to the kaiser asking in horror who are these ragged beings note by reader here louise mack inserts the french lyrics to the comic soldier's song the belgian to the german translation by reader the belgian to the german they do not have your beautiful tunic and they do not have your beautiful air but courage is magnificent if they do not have your beautiful tunic to your cockiness they thumb their nose even in the middle of their greatest defeat 
if they do not have your beautiful tunic and they do not have your beautiful air what those poor fellows want most says the journalist as we flash onwards is boots they want one hundred thousand boots the belgian army you can give a friend all sorts of things but he hardly likes it if you venture to give him boots and yet they want them these poor splendid belgians they want them and they must have them we must give them to them somehow lots of them have no boots at all i heard that the belgians were getting boots from america the author puts in suddenly the journalist turns his head with a jerk what do you mean he asks sharply do you mean that they have ordered them from america or that america's giving them i believe what my informant a sick officer in the belgian army whom i visited this morning told me was that the americans were giving the boots are you sure it's giving the journalist persists we english ought to see to that last night i had an interview with the belgian minister of war and i tried to get on this subject of boots but somehow i felt it was intrusive of me i don't know it's a delicate thing it wants handling yet they must have the boots and i fancy they will get them the heroes of belgium i think they will get their hundred thousand boots then a whiff of the sea reaches us and the grey waves of the north sea stretch out before us over the edge of the endless yellow sands where bronze-faced turcos are galloping their beautiful horses up and down we are in la panne the journalist sits still in his corner of the car not fussing not questioning leaving it all to me this is my show it is i who have come here to see the gracious queen on the sands all the part he plays in it is to bring me so the journalist and the author and the others remain in the car that is infinitely considerate exquisitely so indeed for no writer on earth would care to go looking around with the jupiter of journalists at her elbow rush rush we are on our way back now the cold wind of wet flat flanders strikes at us as we fly along it hits us in the face and on the back it flicks us by the ear and by the throat the window behind us is open the window to right and the window to left are open too all the windows are open because as i said before they are all broken in fact there are no windows they've all been smashed out of existence there are only holes we were under shell fire this morning observes the journalist contentedly then truthfully he adds i don't like shrapnel any woman who reads this will know how i felt in my pride when a malicious wind whisked my fur right off my shoulders and flung it through the back window far on the road behind if it hadn't been sable i would have let it go out of sheer humiliation but instead after a moment's fierce struggle remembering all the wardrobe i had already lost in antwerp i whispered gustily my stole is blown right out of the window how did i hope the journalist would not be cross for we were racing back then against time without lights and it was highly important to get off these crowded roads with the soldiers coming and going coming and going before night fell cross indeed i needn't have worried absence of fuss was as i decided later the most salient point about this man in fact his whole desire seemed to make himself into an entire non-entity he never asserted himself he never interfered he never made any suggestions he just sat quiet and calm in his corner of the car puffing away at his big cigar another curious thing about him was the way in which this man used to bossing organizing suggesting commanding fell into his part which was by force of circumstances a very minor one he was incognito he was not the eminent journalist at all he was just an eager man out looking at a war he was there in a manner of speaking on sufferance for in war time civilians are not wanted at the front and nobody recognized this more acutely than the man with the cigar between his lips and the short grey knee-breeches showing sturdy legs in their dark grey stockings and thick laced-up boots the impression he gave me was of understanding absolutely the whole situation and of a curiously technical comprehension of the wee little tiny part that he could be allowed to play where are you staying in dunkirk he asked in a room over a milliner's shop the town's full i couldn't get in anywhere else then will you dine with us to-night at half-past seven at the hotel des arcades i should love to and we ran into dunkirk and the lights flashed around me in that extraordinary whirl of officers and men moving up and down the cobbled streets struck at us afresh 
and we saw the sombre khaki of englishmen and the blue and red of the belgian and the varied uniforms and scarlet trousers of the piu piu and the absolute indescribable life and thrill in crowding of dunkirk in these days when the armies of three nations moved surging up and down the narrow streets at seven thirty i went up the wide staircase of the hotel des arcades in the grand place of dunkirk quite a beautiful and splendid hotel though innumerable taubes had sailed over it threatening to deface it with their ugly little bombs but luckily without success so far very luckily indeed considering that every day at lunch or dinner some poor worn-out belgian officer came in there to get a meal precisely half-past seven and there hastening towards me was our host he had not dressed as we say in england he had merely exchanged the short grey norfolk knickerbockers for long trousers and the morning coat for a short dark blue serge his eyes were sparkling there's a belgian here whom i want you to meet he said in his boyish manner that admirably concealed the power of this man that one was forever forgetting in his presence only to remember it all the more acutely when one thought of him afterwards it's the chief of the belgian medical department he's quite a wonderful man and we went in to dinner the journalist arranged the table it was rather an awkward one numerically and i was interested to see how he would come out of the problematic affair of four men and one woman but with one swift wave of his hand he assigned us to our places he sat on one side of the table with the head of the belgian medical corps at his right i sat opposite to him and the author sat on my left and the other man who had something to do with boy scouts on his left and there we all were and a more delightful dinner could not be imagined for in a way it was exciting through the very fact of being eaten in a city that the germans only the day before had pelted with twenty bombs personalities come more clearly into evidence at dinner than at any other time and so i was interested to see how the journalist played his part of host what would he be like there are so many different kinds of hosts would he be the all-seeing all-reaching all-divining kind the kind that knows all you want and ought to want and sees that you get it the kind that says always the right thing at the right moment and keeps his party alive with his sally of wit and gaiety and bonhomie and makes everyone feel that they are having the time of their lives no one quickly discovered that the journalist was not at all that kind of host at dinner where some men become bright and gay and inconsequential this man became serious the food part of the affair bored him watching him and studying him with that inner eye that makes the bliss of solitude one saw that he didn't care a bit about food and still less about wine it wouldn't have mattered to him how bad the dinner was he wouldn't know he couldn't think about it for he was something more than your bon viveur and your social animal this man with his wide grey eyes and the flopping lock on his broad forehead he was the dreamer of dreams as well as the journalist and at dinner he dreamed oh yes indeed he dreamed tremendously it was all the same to him whether or not he ate pate de foie gras or a fowl boue or sausage he was wrapped in his discussion with a belgian doctor on his right anaesthetics and antiseptics that's what they are talking about so hard and suddenly out comes a piece of paper the journalist wants to send a telegram to england i'm going to try and get dr x to come out here he's a very clever chap he can go into the thing thoroughly it's important it must be gone into and there on the white cloth scribbled on the back of a menu he writes out his telegram but then says the journalist reflectively if i sign that the censor will hold it up for three days the head of the belgian medical department smiles he knows what that telegram would mean to the belgian army let me sign it he says in a gentle voice let me sign it and send it my telegrams are not censored and your english doctor will meet us at calais tomorrow, and all will be well with your magnificent idea just then the author on the left appears a trifle uneasy he holds up an empty burgundy bottle towards the light a dead end he announces distinctly but our host in his abstraction does not hear the author picks up the other bottle holds it to the light screws up one eye at it and places it lengthwise on the table that's a dead one too he says just then with great good luck he manages to catch the journalist's grey eye that's a dead one too he repeats loudly how exciting to see whether the author in his quite natural desire to have a little more wine 
will succeed in penetrating his host's dreaminess and absorption in the anaesthetics of the belgian army and then all of a sudden the journalist wakes up would you like some more wine he inquires these are both dead ends asserts the author courageously we'll have some more says the journalist and more burgundy comes but to the eminent journalist it is non-existent for his mind is still filled with a hundred thousand things the belgian army wants the iodine they need and the anaesthetics and nothing else exists for him at that moment but to do what he can for the nation that has laid down its life for england burgundy indeed and yet one feels glad that the author eventually gets his extra bottle he has done something for england too he has given us laughter when our days were very black and our soldiers love his yarns end of chapter fifty one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapters fifty two and fifty three of a woman's experiences in the great war by louise mack this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifty two the ravening wolf how hard it must be for the soldiers to remember that there ever was summer how far off how unreal are those burning breathless days that saw the fighting round namur termon antwerp here in flanders in december august and september seem to belong to centuries gone by ah oh, how cold it is the wind howls up and down this long white snow-covered road and away on either side as far as the eyes can see stretches wide flat flanders country white and glistening with the red sun sinking westward and the pale little silvery moon smiling her pale little smile through the black bare woods in this little old flemish village from somewhere across the snow the thunder and fury of terrific fighting makes sleep impossible for more than five minutes at a time then suddenly something wakes me and i know at once even before i am quite awake that it is not shell-fire this time what is it i sit up in bed and feel for the matches but before i can strike one i hear again that extraordinary and very horrible sound i lie quite still and now a strange thing has happened in a flash my thoughts have gone back over years and years and years and it is twenty-eight years ago and i have crossed thousands and thousands of loping leagues of sea and am in australia in the burning heat of midsummer i am a schoolgirl spending my christmas holidays in the australian bush it is night i am a nervous little highly strung creature a noise wakes me i shriek and wake the household when they come dashing in i sob out pitifully there's a wolf outside the window i heard it howling it's only a dingo darling says a woman's tender voice consolingly it's only a native dog trying to find water it can't get in here anyway i remember too that i was on the ground floor then and i am on the ground floor now and i find myself wishing i could hear that comforting voice again telling me this is only a dingo this horrible howling thing outside there in the night i creep out of bed and tiptoe to the window quite plainly in the silvery moonlight i see standing in the wide open space in front of this little flemish inn a thin gaunt animal with its tongue lolling out i see the froth on the tongue and the yellow white of its fangs glistening in the winter moonlight i ask myself what is it and i ask too why should i feel so frightened for i am frightened from behind the white muslin curtains i gaze at that apparition absolutely petrified it seems to me that i shall never 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 be able to move again when i find myself knocking at the caspiar's door and next minute the old proprietor of the inn and his wife are peeping through my window mon dieu it is a wolf old caspiar frames the word with his lips rather than utter them you must shoot it frames his wife old caspiar gets down his gun but it falls from his hands i can't shoot any more he groans i've lost my nerve he begins to cry poor old man he has lost a son eleven nephews and four grandsons in this war as well as his nerve poor old chap and he remembers the siege of paris he remembers only too well that terrible far-off unreal dream-like time that has suddenly leapt up out of the dim far past into the present 
shedding its airs of unreality and clothing itself in all the glaring horrors of to-day until again the past is the present and the present is the past and both are inextricably and cruelly mixed for frenchmen of caspiar's age and memories a touch on my arm and i start violently madame it is poor old madame caspiar whispering to me you are english you are brave n'est-ce pas can you shoot the wolf i am staggered at the idea shoot oh i'd miss it i daren't try it i've never even handled a gun i stammer out i see myself revealed now as the coward that i am then i shall shoot it says old madame caspiar in a trembling voice she picks up the gun when i was a girl i was a very good shot she speaks loudly as if to reassure herself old caspiar suddenly jumps up you're mad therese you are foolish you can't even see to read the newspapers you he takes the gun from her she begins to cry now i shall go and call the others she says weeping be quiet he says crossly you'll frighten the beast away if you make a noise like that he crosses the room and peers out again it's eating something he says mon dieu it's got choo-choo choo-choo is was rather the caspiar's pet rabbit you shall pay for that mutters old caspiar gently opening the window he fires not since eighteen sixty have i seen a wolf says caspiar looking down at the dead beast then they used to run in out of the forest when i was an apprentice in my uncle's inn we were always frightened of them and now even after the germans we are frightened of them still i am more frightened of wolves than i am of germans confesses madame caspiar in a whisper we stand there in the breaking dawn looking at the dead wolf and wondering fearfully if there are not more of its kind creeping in from the snow-filled plains beyond other figures join us two red cross french doctors a wounded english colonel la grandmere madame caspiar's mother and a belgian priest all come issuing gradually from the low portals of the inn into the yard then in the chill dawn with the glare of the snowfields in our eyes we discuss the matter in low voices it is touching to find that each one is thinking of his own country's soldiers and the menace that packs of hungry wolves may mean to them english belgian french especially to wounded men it's the sound of the guns that brings them out says a french doctor learnedly this wolf has probably travelled hundreds of miles and of course there are more oui oui c'est ça certainly there will be more c'est ça c'est ça agrees the priest such a huge beast too says the colonel he is probably comparing it with a fox i find myself mentally agreeing with madame caspiar that germans are really preferable to wolves the long white snow-covered road that leads back to the world seems endlessly long as i stare out of the inn windows realizing that sooner or later i must traverse that long white lonely road across the plains before i can get to safety in the nearest town are there more wolves in there slinking ever nearer to the cities that is what every one seems to believe now we see them in scores and hundreds prowling with hot breath in search of wounded soldiers or any one they can get we are all undoubtedly depressed then a provision motor comes down that road and out of it jumps a little old white moustached man in a heavy sheepskin overcoat and red woolen gloves carrying something wrapped in a shawl he comes clattering into the inn his small black eyes are swimming with tears mon dieu he says gulping some coffee and rum give me a little hot milk madame my poor monkey is near dying a tiny black piteous face looks out of the shawl and huskily the man with the red gloves explains that he has been for weeks trying to get his travelling circus out of the danger zone the army commandeered my horses we had great difficulty in moving about we wanted to get to paris all my poor animals have been terrified by the noises of the big guns especially the monkeys they've all died except this one you poor little beast says the colonel bending down he has seen men die in thousands this gaunt englishman with his eye in a sling but his voice is infinitely compassionate as he looks with one eye at the little shivering creature and murmurs again you poor little brute yesterday adds the man with the red gloves my trick wolf escaped she was a beauty and so clever when the war began i used to dress her up as a french soldier red trousers red cap and all i suppose you haven't seen a wolf monsieur running about these parts nobody answers for a bit we are all stunned but the old fellow brightens up when he hears that his wolf ate the rabbit 
ah but she was a clever wolf he cries excitedly very likely the reason why she ate your choo-choo was because she has played the part of a french soldier french soldiers always steal the rabbits chapter fifty three back to london i am on my way back to london grateful and glad to be once more on our side of the channel five days exclaims a young soldier in the train he flings back his head draws a deep breath and remains staring like an imbecile at the roof of the railway carriage for quite two minutes then he shakes himself draws another deep breath and says again still staring at the roof five days the train has started now out into the night we have left folkestone well behind we have pulled down all the blinds because a proclamation commands us to do so and we are softly yet swiftly rushing through the cool sweet-smelling english country back towards good old victoria station where all continental trains must now make their arrivals and departures have you been wounded sir asked an old lady in a queer black astrakhan cap and with a big nose wounded rather right on top of the head he ducks his fair head to show us i didn't know it when it happened i didn't feel anything at all i only knew there was something wet blood i suppose then they sent me to the hospital at st lazare and i had a ripping cornish nurse but lord what a fool i was i actually signed on that i wanted to go back why did i do that i don't know i didn't want to go back want to go back good lord think of it but i went back and the next thing was mon even now i can't believe it that march the germans were at us all the time it didn't seem possible we could do it buck up men only another six kilometres an officer would say then it would be only another seven kilometres keep going men sometimes we went to sleep marching and woke up and found ourselves still marching always we were shifting and relieving it was a wonderful business it seemed as if we were done for it seemed as if we couldn't go on but we did good lord we did it somehow the english generally seemed to do it some of us had no boots left some of us had no feet but we did it the old lady with the black astrakhan cap nods vigorously and the germans wouldn't acknowledge that victory of ours she says i didn't see it in any of their papers it is rather lovely to hear the dear creature alluding to mont as our victory but indeed she's right mont is in truth our glory and our pride but it is still more startling to find she knows secret things about the german newspapers and we all look at her sharply i've just come from germany the old lady explains just come from dresden where i've been living for fifteen years oh dear i did have a time getting away but i had to leave they made me dresden is being turned into a fortified town and a basis for operations we all now listen to her the soldiers three as well whenever we heard a noise in dresden everyone said it's the russians coming so you see how frightened they are of the russians they are scared to death they've almost forgotten their hatred for england they talk of nothing now but the russians their terror is really pathetic considering all the boasting they've been doing up to now they made a law that no one was to put his head out of the window under pain of death beast says the wounded one there's only military music in dresden now all the theatres and concert rooms are shut and of course from now there will be nothing but military doings in dresden yes i lived there for fifteen years i tried to stay on i had many english friends as well as germans and the english all agreed to taboo all english people who adopted a pro-german tone some did but not many my greatest friends my dearest friends were germans but the situation grew impossible for us all we were not alienated personally but we all knew that there would come between us something too deep and strong to be defied or denied even for great affection's sake so i cut the cables and left when the order was given that dresden was henceforth to be a fortified town besides it was dangerous for me to remain i was english and they hissed at me sometimes when i went out it was through the american consul's assistance that i was enabled to get away i saw such horrid pictures of the english in all the shops it made my blood boil i saw one picture of the englishman with three legs to run away with beast says the wounded one wait till i travel in germany and oh dear goes on the old lady i was so frightened that i should forget and put my head out without thinking as i sat in the train coming away from dresden i said to myself all the time you must not look out of the window or you'll have your head shot off 
that was because they feared the russian spies might try to drop explosives out of the trains on to their bridges beasts says the wounded one again it is really remarkable what a variety of expressions this fair-haired young english gentleman manages to put in a word he belongs to a good family and at the beginning of the war he cleared out without a word to any one and enlisted in the ranks now he is coming home on five days leave covered with glory and a big scar to get his commission he is a splendid type all he thinks about is his country and killing germans he is a gorgeous and magnificent type for here he is in perfect comradeship with his pal tommy in the corner and the irishman next to him evidently to him they are more than gentlemen they are men who've been with him through mont and the battle of the aisne and the battle of ypres and he loves them for what they are and they love him for what he is and they're a splendid trio the soldiers three when i get into germany says tommy i mean to lay hands on all i can get i'm going to loot off them germans like they looted off them poor belgians surely you wouldn't be like the crown prince says the old lady and we all wake up to the fact then that she's really a delightful old lady for only a delightful old lady could put the case as neatly as that sure all i care about says the big quiet irishman in the corner is to sleep and sleep and sleep on a bed says the wounded one good lord think of it tonight i'll sleep in a bed i'll roll over and over to make sure i'm there think of it sheets blankets we don't even get a blanket in the trenches we might get too comfortable and go to sleep what about the little oil stoves the newspapers say you're having says the old lady we've seen none of them assert the soldiers three devil a one of them adds the irishman i've eat things i never eat before says tommy suddenly in his simple way that is so curiously telling i've eat raw turnips out of the fields they're all eatin raw turnips over there and i've eat sweets i've eat pounds of chocolates if i could get them and i've never eat them before in my life since i was a kid oh chocolates says the wounded one ecstatically but chocolate in the sheet thick wide heavy chocolate there's nothing on earth like it i wrote home and put all over my letters chocolate 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 they sent me out tons of it but i never got it it went astray somewhere or other but they're very good to us says tommy earnestly we don't want for nothing you couldn't be better treated than what we are what do you like most to receive asked the old lady chocolate they all answer simultaneously the other night at ypres says tommy with his usual unexpectedness a german came out of his trenches he shouted german waiter want to come back to the english please take me prisoner we didn't want no german waiters we can't be bothered taking the beggars prisoners we let go at em instead they eat like savages puts in the irishman i've seen them shovelling their food in with one hand and pushing it down with the other tis my opinion the germans have got no throats the germans have lots to eat asserts tommy whenever we capture them we always find them well stocked brown bread they always have brown bread and bully beef and raisins beasts says the wounded one again but good lord they're jack johnson's when i think of them now i can't believe it at all they're like fifty shells a minute sometimes sometimes in the middle of all the inferno i'd think i was dead or in hell i often thought that them guns cost them a lot says tommy it cost two hundred fifty pounds each loading we used to be laying there in the trenches and to pass the time while they was firing at us we'd count out how much it was costing them that's seventeen shillings six pence that bit of shrapnel we'd say and there goes another five pounds they waste their shells something terrible too there's thirty-five pound notes gone for nothing we'd reckon up sometimes when thirty shells had exploded in nothing but mud then the wounded one tells us a funny story i was getting messages in one day when this came through the turks are wearing fez and neutral trousers we couldn't make head or tail of the neutral trousers so we pressed for an explanation it came the turks are wearing fez breeches of neutrality and while we are laughing the train runs into victoria station and the soldiers three leap joyously out into the rain-wet london night then dear familiar words break on our ears in a woman's voice any luggage mum says the woman porter and we know that old england is carrying on as usual End of chapter 53 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine End of A Woman's Experiences in the Great War by Louise Mack